The President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this Parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Clerk. President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, we will move on. I have received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Treasury Laws Amendment COVID-19 Economic Response No. 2 Bill 2021 for concurrence. Senator Rustin. Proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Often act to provide an economic response and deal with other matters relating to the coronavirus and for related purposes. Senator Rustin. I seek leave to move a motion to exempt this bill from the bill's cut-off order. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Rustin. I move that the provisions of paragraphs 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to this bill. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Rustin. I table a statement of reasons justifying the need for this bill to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statement incorporated in Hansard. Is the leave granted? It is. Senator Rustin. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? It is. We will proceed to debate. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. Labor will support the Treasury Laws Amendment COVID-19 Economic Response Bill uh, No. 2, 2021. But let's be in no doubt about why we're having to deal with this bill now, why millions of Australians across New South Wales and Queensland are subject to lockdowns, and why we're sitting in the parliament with uh, particularly strict restrictions. And it's the failure of this government, and in particular the Prime Minister, to do their job. Two jobs specifically, get the vaccine rollout right in a speedy and effective way, and to fix the national quarantine system. These failures are costing Australians every day. The economy is bleeding hundreds of millions of dollars a day, billions of dollars each week, all thanks to the Prime Minister's failures. This is the stark price that has been paid by workers and businesses, particularly small businesses, for the Prime Minister's incompetence. And it's not only been incompetence, it's been dangerous complacency and a complete failure to take responsibility. How many times did the Prime Minister say it wasn't a race and that it wasn't a competition? 
What about when the government designated aged care workers in the phase 1A category but still haven't been fully vaccinated? And then when we saw for months the Prime Minister failing to take responsibilities for these failures, it was the fault of the Europeans, then it was the Targi's fault, then he grudgingly apologised and even then at first, it was about apologising for not meeting the marks they had hoped to achieve. Finally, we had the Prime Minister saying he takes responsibility for the early setbacks in the vaccination program. And now we see the Prime Minister invoking Olympic-level rhetoric, gold medal runs, a triple gold, apparently. It's all well and good to invoke the spirit of inspiration that we've been seeing on our television screens for the last few days. But it's something else to be running a race where we've been deliberately been left at the starting blocks or swimming with weights around our legs, thanks to the incompetence and complacency and a failure to take responsibility. And where do we find ourselves right now? Based on the latest data, as of the 2nd of August, just under 12.6 million vaccine doses had been administered. 19.7 per cent of the eligible population, Australians aged 16 and over, fully vaccinated. Or put another way, 15.8 per cent of the total population. If we're running a race based on these statistics, we're falling way behind. We're close to last in the OECD, and it's no exception when it came to the vaccine rollout. Now we hope that we can get to the targets that have been outlined by the government through the work done by the Doherty Institute. Based on the information that we've seen, we should have the supply required to get us to 80 per cent target by the end of the year. And as the National Plan to Transition Australia's national COVID-19 response points out, there should be measures to encourage uptake through incentives as part of Phase B. Labor agrees, and it's why we've called on the government to provide a payment of $300 for every fully vaccinated Australian that would provide a further incentive to get two vaccine doses and deliver a much-needed stimulus for businesses and workers at the end of this year. Unfortunately, as is the government's approach, they will refuse to take up any useful or good ideas that they didn't come up with out of sheer political arrogance. And I've seen the Prime Minister in, in, a, in the last day uh, talk about or lecture or seek to lecture on fiscal responsibility. Uh, and, and the need to be cautious with our spending. Well, I would say in response uh, to those comments, uh, I don't think the Prime Minister is in any position to lecture anybody about fiscal responsibility, considering he is the architect of the slush funds and the rorts that we have seen embedded in this budget. Uh, not just since he's been Prime Minister, but when he became Treasurer, he cottoned on pretty quickly how to hide money in the budget, billions of dollars, unallocated, that he could use to buy elections, to buy seats. Uh, this, is, this is the legacy of this Prime Minister. So we won't be taking any lectures about fiscal responsibility from a group that spends $660 million targeting car parks to particular electorates they want to win, including four in the Treasurer's own electorate. I mean, they, these are the two uh, holders of the purse strings, and th this is what they're doing. Uh, and they're doing it with their eyes open, knowing exactly how they're spending taxpayer funds. Now, we would argue rewarding people for doing the right thing, incentivising those who might be weighing up getting vaccinated, is a very good use of public funds, much better than rorting through spreadsheets, rorting through maps, rorting through car parks, uh, rorting through um, you know, sports grants, whatever you want to choose. That's how this government has spent millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. So we won't be taking lectures about that. How about we use public funds for the public good? There's an idea. Uh, and that's exactly what Labor's idea about incentivising, because it is urgent that we get people vaccinated as soon as possible. It's clear from the Doherty Institute modelling and indeed from the economic impact analysis released by Treasury yesterday, who put the cost of um, the vaccination or lack of or our slowness in getting vac vaccinated. Uh, based on lack of supply, I would say, 
uh, in dollar terms. And you know what Treasury have found is that on a 50 per cent vaccination rates, and based on the assumptions outlined in this paper, the direct economic cost of minimising cases and case, keeping the cases low is estimated to be about $570 million a week per week. At 60 per cent, it's around $430 million per week. Once we get to 70 per cent, the costs come down considerably, as do the restrictions placed on people. And at 80 per cent, it's still costing around $140 million per week, according to Treasury. So these are the figures. And these show you the cost, the economic cost, and it doesn't include the fiscal cost, the economic cost of the stroll out, of where we are now. And the figures we have today is just under 20 per cent, I think, of people eligible population who are vaccinated. I mean, by the time we get to 50 per cent, it's still costing $570 million per week to manage this pandemic. So it is urgent. It is important that we incentivise and try to get to these targets as quickly as possible within the supply constraints that have been foisted across this on this country by the Prime Minister's failure to secure enough vaccine deals and enough vaccines um, last year when those negotiations were underway and where many other countries saw the urgency and the need to have a number of vaccine deals and Australia took a very different approach and that is why we are where we are today. Coupled with those failures on vaccines, we have on quarantine where we've seen 27 leaks from hotel quarantine leading to the mass disruption we see and have, are seeing across the country. Despite the government knowing and being given advice by the Halton Review last year that fit-for-purpose quarantine facilities should be considered to reduce the risk of leaks from hotel quarantine. As we found out at the COVID committee last week, some work is now being done, but only uh, since July on additional quarantine facilities. That finance, it, is, it is hard to believe that finance was only asked by the government to look into other sites for federal quarantine facilities two months ago. So where we're at is they've done some early feasibility work, but we all know with projects like this you need detailed feasibility work and design work. And whilst the government is reluctant to give us a date, I think what we could take from evidence before the committee uh, last week is that it, it is months and months and months away from having any solution or any increased capacity on uh, federal or national quarantine facilities. We also learned that the Prime Minister, who's been telling us that we've moved from 850 to 2,000 uh, spots at Howard Springs is also untrue, that we haven't got close to that, that last week the numbers were in the order of 1,200 uh, people at Howard Springs. So even the extra capacity that the Prime Minister promised hasn't been reached at the facility that is operational. The government has been simply too slow to act, and this bill is a con consequence of that. The bill before us contains five measures. Schedule 1 of the bill makes amendments to allow the government to make payments to entities impacted by lockdowns during a period of 1 July 2021 to 31 December 2022. Schedule 2 of the bill allows the disclosure of tax information to be provided to the Australian government agencies to facilitate COVID-19 business support programs. Schedule 3 of the bill will make payments received by businesses under certain COVID-19 business support programs tax-free. Schedule 4 of the bill introduces a temporary mechanism that existed last year that allows ministers to change arrangements for meeting information and documentary requirements under Commonwealth legislation, including requirements to give information and produce witness and produce witness and sign documents. This measure will be in place till the 31st of December. Schedule 5 of the bill would make the COVID-19 payment um, tax-free, covering up what appears to be a slip from the Prime Minister when he said these payments were tax-free when guidance online 
um, on the Treasury, ATO and Services Australia had originally said they were. So Labor does support this bill. Again, we would say that the Commonwealth came late to the table uh, in terms of providing some economic support and um, the engagement. They were really forced, I think, by the state governments uh, to step up to the table. Uh, and you know, the treatment, I think, that was was the differential treatment that was provided to Victoria and then to New South Wales and then when should the payments kick in and who should be responsible for what just shows how dysfunctional uh, this Prime Minister's leadership of National Cabinet is. Uh, he can't reach agreement with, it seems, with a group of First Ministers at all. Unless pressured, he stubbornly refuses to engage and it's only when everyone else can see that the Commonwealth should be stepping up, should be providing support, that the lockdown we're have, having now are directly as a result of the failures of this Prime Minister to manage the vaccine procurement and rollout strategy in the interests of the country and the failure to accept responsibility for quarantine. Uh, quite unbelievably uninterested and without a sense of urgency about managing the risk of people returning to this country, and we have 38,000 Australians still overseas, more than 32,000 of whom want to return immediately, hundreds of unaccompanied minors overseas unable to return because this government has failed to accept that they have responsibility for quarantine, that they have responsibility for Australian citizens who need to return to this country. Uh, and their failures, the, the leaks from hotel quarantine, the fact that our community's uh, vaccination levels are so low has led to the situation we're in today where we are so vulnerable to the impact of the pandemic that these strict lockdowns have had to be put in place. And when it comes to the support that the government's now providing, I think they did it reluctantly. They only did it when they realised how serious um, the lockdowns were going to be, uh, but overall we support the, um, the economic response as it's outlined in this bill. We think the government should keep an open mind about whether they need to do more or how they respond to the situation as it evolves, um, and we've always said that. Target the assistance to the circum economic circumstances of the time. That is still our message. It's been our message from the beginning of the pandemic right throughout, and this remains the case. The government should work with other uh, state governments collegiately. They shouldn't treat them differently. They shouldn't be stubborn. They shouldn't refuse uh, support at the first hurdle and then only accept the need to step up uh, when things get really dire. We need to provide businesses and individuals with certainty that as we move through uh, the vaccination stage of this pandemic, that people will be uh, looked after, they will be supported, um, that we all stand together, and that um, you know, certainty, I think, can be provided about economic response. We shouldn't be having businesses wondering when they're going to get help, who they're going to get help from. Uh, the Commonwealth should take a leadership role on this. Uh, we support this bill, but let's make no mistake, the fact that we're here, that we're debating this bill, is because of the significant failures of this government in relation to vaccine and quarantine. Uh, Senator Gallagher, have you got a second reading amendment that you wanted to move? Uh, yes, and I'll move my second reading amendment. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Madam Deputy President. Senator McKim. Thank you, Deputy President. The Greens will be supporting this legislation, as I expect all members of the Senate will do. And it's fair to say that this parliament has been nothing but cooperative in facilitating the payment of income support to businesses and to people during this pandemic. As a result of that cooperation and the willingness of this parliament to see a wages guarantee established to help prevent total and utter economic calamity and the impacts that that would have on so many people, we have seen the government set up JobKeeper in a way that allowed it to be rorted by so many big corporations. Now We don't have the definitive figures yet, but data provided by the Parliamentary Budget Office shows that for more than 365,000 recipients of JobKeeper, accounting 
for about 40 per cent of workers covered under the scheme, their turnover didn't end up falling below threshold levels in the first three months of the scheme. This means that at least one. Uh, this means that at least. $12.5 billion in JobKeeper payments went to businesses and other entities that didn't actually need it. The final number will likely be higher because these figures are only in relation to the first phase of JobKeeper. JobKeeper became, for some corporations, profit maker and bonus payer. The government saw it happening and the government did nothing to stop it, and the government has done nothing to rectify it since. The government seems entirely comfortable with the biggest stimulus program in our country's history being rorted to the hilt by big corporations. You'd be forgiven for thinking the government designed it that way, because if nothing else we know full well that this government looks after its mates, the billionaires and the big corporations. And those people, the billionaires and those companies, the big corporations, other people and companies that won out of JobKeeper more than anyone did. The bill before us today is very similar to the bill that established the first JobKeeper. This bill like its predecessor, is effectively a shell that gives the Treasurer extremely wide scope to make rules for payments to entities affected by the pandemic. Now, the Greens accepted the argument for the JobKeeper bill to be structured in such a way, given the speed with which Parliament needed to respond to what was then an unheralded set of circumstances. But here we now stand, 17 months into the pandemic, and we have, or should have, a much better understanding of what we're facing, and the government should be much better prepared. But instead, they are serving up to us another blank canvas for the Treasurer. The government should not any longer be making it up as it goes along. The government by now should have put in place an off-the-shelf payment program for the rolling series of lockdowns that they themselves predicted that we would be facing. Not so long ago, the Treasurer was crowing about the March quarter economic data, no doubt with an early election in his mind. But instead of counting his chickens before they hatched, he should have been putting his mind to what the country actually needed which was certainty and clarity as to what kind of support would be provided in what circumstances when the inevitable happened. Now, given that this parliament is once again presented with a bill with such wide scope for the development of COVID support payments, the Greens have circulated an amendment that seeks to prevent a rerun of the JobKeeper rorts. The Greens' second reading amendment on sheet 1359 is a straightforward proposition, and, acting, uh, and Deputy President, I move the second reading amendment on sheet 1359, standing in my name. This amendment says to the Treasurer, don't give any more money to the big corporations that are profitable or that pay executives bonuses. Or, if you do give them the money, make them pay it back. This is what the government should have originally done with JobKeeper, and this is what the parliament should ensure that they do with the next round of payments. I encourage the Senate to support this amendment and send a clear message back to the House that this latest round of support payments is not to boost company profits and is not for the payment of large executive bonuses. A final note on the JobKeeper rorts. This parliament has a chance to rectify the situation, to ensure that the billions of dollars in public money 
that ended up boosting the profits of big corporations and lining the pockets of their executives is paid back. I've tabled a bill on behalf of the Australian Greens, the Ending JobKeeper Profiteering Bill in the Senate, and that bill is currently under inquiry. That bill proposes withholding tax input credits equal to the value of JobKeeper payments made to large companies that ended up being profitable or paid executive bonuses. It would also establish a public register of large companies that received JobKeeper, uh, very similar to what Senator Patrick is proposing in his amendment to this bill. I hope to bring that bill before the Senate before the end of this year. Over the next three or four months, we should get a much clearer picture of just how much JobKeeper was used to boost company profits and pay executive bonuses. And I predict that Australians will continue to be shocked and dismayed by just how extensive the rorting was. And I expect that the public anger at what happened will continue to grow. I also, before I conclude, want to note that according to the announcements made already by this government regarding the payments facilitated by this bill, once again those in receipt of standing income support payments, job seeker, youth allowance, disability support pension and carer payments are once again being ignored by this government. The lockdown support payments already announced do nothing to ensure that those who were already relying on income support payment, who were already struggling before this latest wave of lockdowns, have enough money to live in dignity and to live above the poverty line. If history is any guide, it's those that were struggling the most before the pandemic hit and before the latest lockdowns who will find it hardest to make a good life for themselves in the aftermath of the economic shock. That this government continues to treat their fellow Australians with such disrespect and disdain just confirms that they're not here to look after all Australians. They are here to look after their mates who run the big corporations and who are the billionaires who have profiteered so spectacularly and built their wealth to such obscene levels during this pandemic. Senator McKim, I'll just advise you that um Senator Gallagher has already moved a second reading amendment, so at this point yours is foreshadowed. Uh, Senator Brockman. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I too rise to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment, COVID-19 Economic Response Number 2, Bill 2021. Uh, and I want to begin just with a quick look at the general Australian economy, because when this government faced the onset of the pandemic last year, uh, we knew very quickly that we had two challenges. We had the challenges of ensuring the health and well-being of all Australians and the second and equally important challenge of ensuring that our economy was protected as much as possible during what was a huge economic shock and that it could recover strongly from that shock, the greatest economic shock since the Great Depression, we must always remember, uh, that we must put the economy in a position where it could recover from that shock. And the Australian economy has done so in a way that is quite remarkable and certainly uh, not matched by any other advanced economy to date. Uh, in doing so, and I've said in this place a number of times, that your GDP numbers, your, your headline numbers aren't important unto themselves. They're important because they what, what they mean for real people's lives. They're important because what they mean for real families, uh, real people going about their day-to-day -day lives in the Australian economy. And we've seen, to that end, that unemployment has now recovered 
the jobs lost during the pandemic, and the unemployment rate has fallen to 4.9 per cent in June, below its pre-pandemic levels. Now, um, of course, we will see some movement up and down in unemployment rate. We always do. But the numbers show that the response of this government to the shock of the pandemic has been extraordinarily effective in doing what we set out to do, uh, in, make, in making sure Australian businesses, Australian workers uh, could continue, could plan for the future, could protect jobs and could have enough business certainty, enough business confidence to invest in the future rather than worrying about how they were going to make uh, their wages bill for the next month. So in terms of jobs, we've seen a million jobs created since May 2020, with employment surpassing its pre-pandemic levels with 160,000 more Australians in work. 56 per cent of those jobs have gone to women, while a third have gone to young people aged between 15 and 24. The unemployment rate has decreased in eight consecutive months, uh, as I said, falling to 4.9 per cent in June. Despite, despite in this period the end of the JobKeeper program in March, uh, this is the lowest unemployment rate in seven years, and youth unemployment fell to its lowest rate in 12 years. The ABS, in fact, stated that the end of the JobKeeper wage subsidy did not have any discernible impact on employment between March and April. The ratio of unemployed people to vacancies is now at its lowest level in over a decade, and uh, un 800, oh, sorry, 180,000 people have come off unemployment benefits since the end of JobKeeper. Now, obviously, these are all very good numbers in any circumstances, but to have these results, to have these people in work, to have 180,000 people come off unemployment benefits, to have 160,000 more Australians in work than pre-pandemic is quite an extraordinary outcome for the Australian economy. And I congratulate all those people out there who have, who have managed to take up a new job in this period. All those businesses who, had offered, who have offered those jobs, again, that shows that businesses have confidence in the future. And I just want to turn to, to what business has been doing during this period, because it is important to note. Since the uh, uh, October budget, investments in new machinery and equipment have increased at the fastest rate since March 2003. 8.5 per cent in the December quarter, 10.3 per cent in the March quarter, uh, 70, to be an, a total of 7.2 per cent higher over the year. Uh, again, this is helping to drive that business confidence that means that they will take a risk, they will employ new people, they will grow their business at a time when we've got to remember 18 months ago. And I have heard this story repeated over and over and over again throughout the small businesses of Australia, the small and medium-sized businesses of Australia. People were literally sitting in their offices thinking about how they were going to walk out onto the shop floor and tell their 30 staff, their 15 staff, their 10 staff, their 2 staff that they no longer had a job. And then details of the JobKeeper program came through. And I can tell you that all those people breathe more than just a sigh of relief. Uh, it changed lives, it changed the economy, it changed people's approach to uh, the, the, the circumstances they were in, and it boosted confidence uh, to an extraordinary degree where businesses were willing to invest. Uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics measures the CAPEC expectations for 2021 were upgraded again uh, from an expected fall of 4.7% in 1920 um, to an increase of 9.7% in 2021-22. According to the NAB Business Survey, both business confidence and conditions increased to record levels just prior to the most recent outbreak. Business conditions rose to a fresh record high in May, 
while business confidence also remains around record levels. Now, obviously, the lockdowns have an impact on that, and we don't deny that as a government, and we need to have an economic response to that as a government, and that's what we'll do. And we understand very much that Australians facing lockdowns are asking questions about their incomes and about the weeks ahead, as well as the pathway back to a normal life. And that is why, for Australians facing lockdowns, we are directly del delivering financial support to individuals and businesses impacted uh, by the lockdowns through Services Australia. We are sharing the costs with state government, delivering much needed support to small and medium sized businesses. Uh, people who have lost more than 20 hours of work, of work in the previous week can claim $750. People who have lost between eight hours or a full day's of work to up to 20 hours can claim $450. This is the same level of support we provided with JobKeeper last year. Um, this is obviously in addition to all the other benefits they can get at this time. It is important that we do act as a government to respond to the situation we find ourselves in and provide to support to those Australians who need it. However, we must also very clearly recognise the difference between the situation last year and the situation this year. JobKeeper was the JobKeeper last year was a national program based on business decline in turnover. Uh, it was rolled out across the nation, not on a case-by-case -case basis based on lockdowns in particular states. The support being paid to individuals in lockdown right now can be delivered quickly to those who need it, even as quickly as 40 minutes after application. COVID disaster payments is effectively uh, JobKeeper, delivering the same level of support to individuals as JobKeeper. Um, as the Treasurer highlighted, the disaster payment is supporting those who are unable to work who wouldn't be eligible for JobKeeper if it were in operation. Um, so there's a, a, a very good case for the changes that we have made to the systems of support uh, in the economy, and obviously they are going to receive support in this place. Um, but I do think it's important uh, in my last couple of minutes just to note again the importance of giving businesses that confidence to invest in their people, in their economies, in the local economies that they support, uh, and to allow them and their employees to continue, even in these continually strange times uh, that we live. Obviously, we all hope that the lockdowns can end as soon as possible, and uh, we all hope that we uh, have a return to a much more normal economy in the very uh, near future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Brockman. We have Senator Mariel Smith remotely. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Before I begin my remarks on the Treasury Laws Amendment Bill 2021, I want to start by acknowledging the millions of Australians who are currently in lockdown around our country and the millions more who have only just been released from a lockdown in their state. Now, we know that the Delta variant makes lockdowns a necessary tool in our arsenal against COVID-19, but the necessity of these lockdowns doesn't make them any easier for those living them. Indeed, there are huge costs for Australians living in lockdown. The economic cost of lost hours of work, of lost business, the social cost of the disconnection to friends, family and loved ones, the health cost and especially the mental health cost and to the wellbeing and mental wellness of too many Australians. Australian families in lockdown are doing it incredibly tough around our country, just as they've done it incredibly tough in South Australia recently and in Victoria recently. So I want those Australians to know that when we're here talking today about the economic cost of lockdown, we haven't forgotten the other ways in which this pandemic is hurting you, the other costs it is bearing down on you socially, in terms of your health, in terms of your wellbeing. And I want to say to South Australians in my state, I am as desperate as you are to see Australia return to business as usual as quickly and as safely as possible. 
This bill today goes to the immediate economic impacts of the lockdown and it provides the administrative support arrangements necessary to ensure that the Commonwealth can deliver support to those Australians who need it the most. This support is desperately needed. It was desperately needed in South Australia and I know it's desperately needed by individuals around our country who are also experiencing lockdown. That's why Labor will be supporting the bill because we know that it's our responsibility to support Australians when they need our help the most. Acting Deputy President, we're 18 months into this pandemic and in too many ways, it feels like we're right back in 2020. Australians across the country tuning in each morning to their Premier's press conferences with bated breath, wondering what the numbers will mean in their state. Their Prime, the Prime Minister, morning press conferences and saying a lot, but helping little. Our parliament operating remotely, just as we are today. Businesses struggling to understand and implement the rules. Shops open, shops closed, masks on, masks off. In the last month alone, we've seen half the country put into snap lockdowns in response to outbreaks of the Delta variant. In New South Wales, we've had weeks of it, weeks to go, not necessarily a clear end in sight. We've got uncertainty about what the future holds in Queensland. And of course, all of us live with uncertainty every day about when the next outbreak might occur, what that might mean, whether we're back in lockdown, whether we're back in those conditions, locking down, shutting up shop, stopping work. And let's be clear, until the government gets the vaccine rollout right, until the government gets a handle on quarantine, which is their responsibility, until they get that right, Lockdowns with the Delta variant will be a way of life. People's lives disrupted, hours lost at work, businesses closed, suffering through no fault of their own, stock thrown out, staff stood down, rents to pay, with reduced income, reduced support, reduced viability, confusion and fear. Kids at home forced to do home learning, we're yet to know the impact of being away from school for so many of these children, particularly, particularly vulnerable kids, kids with poorer internet connections, kids who suffer more than others when things like this happen. And of course, their parents struggling to work full time at home, homeschool their kids under great fear, under great uncertainty about what the future holds. Initial estimates suggested that the most recent South Australian lockdown could come with a $200 million hit to our local economy. That is horrendous. Economic impact of this in my state is horrendous. It's horrendous at the broader scale in terms of the impact on our state, and it's horrendous at the micro scale of the small businesses pouring milk down the drain because they're not serving coffees this weekend, standing staff down, not knowing how to stock their fridge for the weekend trade ahead not knowing whether staff are going to be needed or necessary, whether they can survive doing things like takeaway, whether they can open their doors, how to keep their staff safe if they do open their doors. Wages lost from the pockets of workers, of employees whose employers have been forced to stand, down, stand them down. And for those employees, those workers in casual work and in insecure work, these challenges are even greater. Those workers who live paycheck to paycheck, who find it hard to wait even a week for a disaster payment to kick in. For them, losing just a few hours of work can mean the difference between paying their rent, between paying their grocery bill, their electricity bill, feeding their family. For these workers, this is especially tough. These workers who have no choice to work at home, who when their business shuts, when their employer shuts, are stood down with no means of supporting themselves and their families. We have seen Australians over and over put in this position of lockdown, this position of vulnerability, this position of fear. It's unacceptable. It is a necessary tool, yes, in our arsenal, these lockdowns against the Delta variant. But we shouldn't be here. Our ticket out of this is better quarantine. Our ticket out of this is a better effective vaccine rollout. And on these two fronts, these two fronts of Commonwealth responsibility, We've seen failure after failure from the Commonwealth Government. So whilst we welcome this bill, we welcome the measures within it, we welcome the ability for the Commonwealth to provide this level of financial support. We need to actually get the policy levers 
which would ensure we don't have these lockdowns, we're not in this position over and over again, right? Because if we do that, if we do that, we give that certainty and that security to Australians, we protect them, we keep them safe. But that is the key role of the Commonwealth Government here. That is what they should be delivering. And that is what they've failed to do over and over again. Now, this bill, it, it enables government to make those policy decisions to provide for that financial support. And we welcome that. We do welcome that. I note that the payments are tax free, although the government seemed to be in a bit of kerfuffle and confusion about whether that was the case and whether it would be so. But we welcome that. We welcome that it means more support into the hands of Australians, into the hands of Australian families who need it. But the fact remains, until the Commonwealth gets those two policy levers right, those two policy levers that we know they're responsible for, vaccinations, hotel quarantine, proper quarantine facilities to replace hotel quarantine, which would keep Australians safer from these variants entering Australia, that we are going to be continuing to live with Band-Aid solutions, solutions which fix the impact of these failures rather than address the heart of the failures, which is what the Commonwealth needs to be doing. Now, I want to see us through this as quickly as possible. I don't want to be here talking about economic and financial support because the fact that we have to means those costs have already been borne by Australians. That difficulty, that challenge, that heartache has already been borne by South Australians. I don't want to be here discussing this. So we can support it. But the best thing we can do in this place and in this chamber is actually get to the heart of the problem, the heart of the reason why we're here. And that is fixing these policy failures of the Commonwealth. This vaccine rollout is, is failing. It's failing to get the take up it needs. We're failing with issues of supply and we're failing with issues of communication, which have left Australians feeling anxious and uncertain. We need Australians to get vaccinated. Vaccination is the key out of this mess. Vaccination is the key to getting back to a life which is more normal, a life able to live alongside COVID. But the Commonwealth has failed in it. They've failed in the rollout, they've failed in supply, they've failed in the messaging. Is it any wonder, is it any wonder that Australians have felt the way they do about this rollout? And for young Australians as well, I want to mention them today because they have suffered tremendously at the heart of these lockdowns and throughout this pandemic in so many different ways. They've borne the brunt of the economic impacts of COVID. Their jobs are among the most insecure and often the first to be axed. Their super accounts were the lowest before they were forced to raid them during the pandemic last year because that's what government policy forced them to do. It's their future which is affected in terms of the fiscal implications of this and the burden they have to bear going forward. For every missed target, disappearing horizon or unmet deadline, young Australians face the prospect of their workplaces being closed, of them missing out, of them suffering in terms of their economic wellbeing, their social wellbeing, their mental health. Overwhelmingly, young Australians have suffered very, very hard at the hands of this pandemic and they've been forgotten, looked over by too many in government. It's not acceptable for those young Australians. It's not acceptable. They've borne the brunt of this pandemic, they've borne the brunt of the economic impact and they will continue to bear the brunt of it going forward. This lockdown in South Australia recently was incredibly hard and I want to acknowledge every South Australian who found it challenging, who found it tough. The mums and dads homeschooling their kids, trying to work at home, do the best they can. It's a tough, it's a tough situation. Of course, there's also families, there's also workers in our community who didn't have the choice to work from home, who when they were stood down because of the lockdown, they didn't have a choice to go to work and do their job there. Their job can only happen when the business they work for is open. And of course, our essential workers who did go to work, who did go to work every day, working in our supermarkets, driving our buses, putting their health on the line to make sure that our community, our economy can continue running and functioning. To these workers, we owe an enormous debt, an enormous debt of gratitude. They had to go to work each day, knowing the risks, 
knowing the potential impacts. They have done a tremendous job. Some of our employees working in these essential sectors have been the most undervalued in our society. Well, I hope if anything changes from this pandemic, it's that we value them properly now. Our supermarket workers, our childcare workers, our public transport workers, our cleaners, who have carried so much of the burden of this pandemic, and yet in so many ways who continue to be underpaid and undervalued. In closing, Labor, of course, supports this legislation. We support measures being taken to limit and ease the economic burden on Australian citizens because of these lockdowns. Of course, we support that. But let us not just support Australians with these sorts of solutions. Let's support them with policy, which actually goes to the heart of the failures, which mean lockdowns are essential in the first place. Failed vaccination rollout, failed quarantine. If we fix these two things, if we fix these two things, if the Commonwealth gets this right, admits and acknowledges their failures, and just does better, just gets this right, then perhaps, perhaps we don't need to be sitting here discussing these measures. Perhaps we can get back to business as usual in Australia. Perhaps we can start to see an end to the incredibly, incredibly burdensome economic, social, human costs this pandemic is having on South Australians and Australians more broadly. That's what I want to see. That's what I'm fighting for in here. So whilst we welcome, we welcome these measures, we acknowledge these measures, let's actually see from the government, please, an earnest attempt to fix the failures they are responsible for, which would mean we don't require these measures in the first place. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to uh, speak on this bill, and I'll start by uh, indicating up front that I will uh, be supporting this bill. Uh, uh, the measures uh, in this bill are, in fact, uh, needed. I think uh, everyone accepts that. Now, the bill was provided to me in confidence on Monday, and I thank the government for getting it to uh, to my office early. Uh, it is often difficult, particularly in the crossbench, to to deal with all the legislation approaching for the week. Um, it was tabled in the House yesterday and it's being dealt uh, with in the Senate today. It's not followed the normal process um, because it's uh, urgently needed to assist those in lockdown in Sydney. Now, it's interesting, the explanatory memorandum, I was looking through it, I think that's, uh, there's, there's a line in here that uh, shocked me when I saw it actually. Uh, uh, page to the explanatory memorandum says compliance cost impact. An exemption from regulation impact statement requirements was granted by the Prime Minister as there were urgent and unforeseen events. I, I find that actually quite, um, uh, qu quite unbelievable. That's, uh, this is uh, uh, the sort of text you might think would win some literary award um, uh, because it's certainly uh, fiction. Um, I, I accept the need is urgent. There are people in Sydney that need help. I don't accept that the bill needed to be urgent uh, because uh, this was foreseen. There must have been advice to the effect that we would need further assistance as we had to deal with various strains of the pandemic. Or, if there was, uh, if there, there was advice that said something different, well, we need to really look long and hard at this advice. But the problem is we can't see any of it. We can't see any advice because any uh, advice that's related to health of Australians during this pandemic is sprinkled with National Cabinet sec uh, secrecy dust, uh, completely unnecessarily. Now, I'm pleased to inform the chamber that tomorrow at 2.45 New South Wales time, Justice White will hand down his decision in my matters uh, challenging whether the National Cabinet is a cabinet. So I'm, uh, I'm waiting to see what happens there. Um, I think that will be interesting because hopefully that will open up the information that flows through to parliamentarians, uh, to experts, to uh, professionals in the medical field, 
and to the public so that they can critique advice, so that they can analyse the advice for themselves. I'm hopeful um, that I'll get an outcome that will support that, uh, uh, that, that future course. And this is the problem. Transparency is a good thing. When, trans when transparency exists, people are required to perform their absolute best. And it's in the absence of transparency we see all sorts of things go wrong, as has happened uh, in this pandemic, as has happened in relation to uh, vaccine, uh, uh, in relation to quarantine, as has uh, happened in, related, in relation to the uh, vaccine rollout. Even this morning, um, you know, I've, I've revealed the, uh, the, the, the fact that the COVID vaccine, of which I received, of the COVID vaccine certificate, which I received um, uh, just uh, last week, as I got my second AstraZeneca uh, jab, um, is easily forged. And look, that's something. As we were developing a vaccine that may well, or almost certainly, in fact, inevitably, will be connected to health measures, uh, should have been thought about. I'm pleased to say I have talked to um, Minister Reynolds and uh, and opened a dialogue. And I, I do appreciate uh, you uh, allowing me to approach you on that. Um, but um, again, if we'd seen what was happening behind the scenes. Uh, some of these comments could have been made a little bit earlier and we could have had uh, perhaps uh, better outcomes or, or, or outcomes that, uh, were, uh, that worked a bit sooner. Uh, and indeed, we don't waste money by repeating things. Now that leads me to the amendment uh, that I'm uh, going to move uh, during the committee stage, um, and that is uh, an amendment that focuses on transparency. It was uh, mentioned by Senator McKim in his uh, second reading speech. Um, I'll just give you a bit of, a hi a bit of uh, history around this amendment. My, my amendment seeks to provide transparency in relation to large companies that get public funding throughout um, this pandemic, and that goes back through JobKeeper. And I'll just explain to you what happened in New Zealand in relation to their wage subsidy program. New Zealand uh, spent approximately $12 billion on, on uh, COVID-19 direct wage, wage subsidies, and they received $637 million back from companies who said, look, we thought we might have needed it, but actually we didn't. Now, that's actually 5.5 per cent of what was paid out was actually returned. Here in Australia, We've spent approximately 89 billion, close to 90 billion dollars in COVID-19 direct wage subsidies, and we've only received 225 million dollars back. Now that's 0.25 per cent repayments. And the difference between Australia and New Zealand uh, is. Uh, not in any strict regime uh, in, the, in, the, in legislation that uh, attempts to minimise uh, cor corruption or fraud. Uh, you know, they also approached it with a view to let's help first. Um, but what they have done is published on a website, and uh, it's very easy to find, and I encourage uh, senators to go and do this. They've published on a website the name of employers who receive a subsidy, a subsidy payment and how much they get paid. Now, if uh, they fully repay the money, they're taken off the list. If they partially repay some money, that is reduced from the amount that is shown on uh, the, the uh, total of subsidy they received. Now, it's not name and shame. It's about uh, saying, if you're in receipt of public funding as a company, there's a reasonable uh, expectation from the public side that that's uh, information that ought to be known. It's not private company information per se, because it's about the amount of money, taxpayers' money, is given to the company. And uh, we understand that many of these companies needed that money. 
Many, many companies may well need uh, money that is being delivered under this particular program, under this particular bill. So, quite successfully, in New Zealand, they have managed to get greater returns from people who didn't require the money just by being transparent, just by letting people see where taxpayers' money went. And that's, in effect, what my amendment uh, seeks to do. My amendment seeks to um, uh, have companies, larger companies, who, receive, uh, who received JobKeeper as a starting point, simply um, have, uh, having their names published on an ATO website that says, this is the name of the entity, this is the number of in individuals from whom the entity received a JobKeeper payment, uh, each period for which the entity received a JobKeeper payment, the total amount uh, of JobKeeper received by, um, by the entity, and whether or not they have voluntarily paid back any money. Pretty simple, not intrusive. It's a transparency measure that's designed, uh, in the case of JobKeeper, to uh, have companies um, look and say, you know what, it's now out there publicly that we receive this money. Uh, can we properly justify it? No, maybe we should pay it back. Or yes, we can justify that, and we thank you very much, taxpayer. And that's the aim of uh, what my amendment uh, seeks to do. It doesn't just seek to do it, however, in relation to JobKeeper. It also seeks to do it moving forward for any uh, payments made to larger companies uh, to enable them uh, or enable the public to see what is being spent with whom and to encourage uh, a system of honesty, integrity uh, that uh, makes sure that taxpayers' money under this, uh, under this new bill is actually spent properly and in accordance with the intended aim of the payments. Uh, I'll only speak briefly of it again during the committee stage, uh, but I would uh, encourage senators to support my amendment. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Canavan. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, uh, look, it's, uh, it's an honour to, to rise to support this bill and uh, uh, to do, in doing so to continue the government's efforts to provide support to people through these very difficult times. Uh, and very costly times for our nation as well. We have provided well over $300 billion of assistance across the Australian economy uh, since early last year. The government's always been willing to respond uh, as necessary to people's needs during that time, but we also must recognise the enormous cost that's come uh, to our, our, our nation's balance sheet, our nation's wealth, uh, and uh, that will limit the options that are our future generations of Australians have because they will be burdened with a much bigger debt than they expected uh, just 18 months ago. In fact, our debt now approaching $1 trillion is the highest it's been as a share of our economy since the end of World War II, and we face a lot of threats and challenges as a nation beyond just the coronavirus, and we must make sure we do all we can to maintain our fiscal strength in responding or in helping especially future uh, generations of Australians to respond to those challenges. I want to start, though, by responding to some of the um, points made in this debate, particularly those opposite. Some have suggested that somehow, if uh, all we need to do is get the vaccination rate up, and then it'll be back to business as usual. You know, the sun will come up, uh, lockdowns will end, uh, there'll be no more coronavirus. It'll be dead. It'll be gone. Well, that's um, not what the modelling shows yesterday. And it is time, it is past time as a nation that we in this place, of all people, be upfront with the Australian people, that we get rid of the fantasy and fairy tales that we are continually trying to put the Australian people to sleep with, that we actually front up to them with the facts and the reality of this terrible virus, of this terrible pandemic, and what might happen in the next few years in this country, regardless, regardless of what we do or how many people get vaccinated in the months ahead. And that is revealed yesterday in the modelling. It's revealed perhaps the most revealing figure in the modelling, where even in, even in an environment where 80 per cent of Australians get vaccinated, 
and that's the, the target to get to the phase four of the plan. So if 80 per cent of Australians get vaccinated, under this Doherty Institute modelling, within 180 days of hitting that 80 per cent target and reverting to some baseline restrictions and still testing and tracing, and I'll come back to that, but within 180 days of hitting that 80 per cent target, 40,000 vaccinated Australians will become infectious, symptomatically infectious, in fact, with the coronavirus. So far, in the first 18 months of this pandemic, 34,800, I think, or it might be 300, just over 34,000 Australians have been infected with coronavirus. So even when 80 per cent of Australians are vaccinated, within six months, more Australians who are vaccinated will pick up a symptomatic version of the coronavirus and it has happened in the first 18 months of this pandemic. We need to face up to that. It's more than that. That's just the vaccinated people. That's people who are vaccinated because you can have this thing called break breakthrough infections. I am pro-vaccination. I am planning to get mine. I encourage everyone to do the same. But again, we've got to be upfront with the Australian people that the evidence is that people still can and do quite commonly overseas pick up uh, a coronavirus infection despite being vaccinated. It does, of course, greatly reduce their risk of death or hospitalisation. But on top of the 40,000 people who uh, would unfortunately get the coronavirus, even with the vaccination, another 238,991, so let's call it 240,000 odd Australians, 240,000 Australians will, that are unvaccinated will also become infectious with the coronavirus within six months. So let's be upfront with the Australian people that even at an 80 per cent vaccination rate, within six months we are looking at 280,000 coronavirus infections, well, well above seven times what we've experienced in the first 18 months of this pandemic. That's with 80 per cent vaccination. That is the reality and the truth of the situation we're facing. And, and that 280,000 uh, infections, 280,000 coronavirus infections, is still in a world where we would have a two square metre rule. It's still in a world, according to this modelling, where we would have only 70 per cent capacity at sporting stadiums. We wouldn't go back to full crowds in this world and we'd have 280,000 coronavirus infections. It is still in a world where we'd have testing, tracing, isolation and quarantine. So if you went to a place, someone, someone you were unfortunate enough to be in a place where one of these 280,000 infections occurred, you'd then have to isolate for 14 days as well. It's not returning to normal, even with those figures, even with that vaccination rate. And it is high time we recognise that fact. Now, it is also, of course, the case that if we pick up infections, people will go to hospital, people will unfortunately die, and we need to be upfront with people about that. The government cannot save every life. The government cannot get rid of one of the two certainties in life, which is death. Possibly we could get rid of taxes. We could possibly do that, but I don't think we will. That certainty will still be there too for people. That will be there. So under this modelling, with 80 per cent, 80 per cent. Um, uh, uh, vaccination rate across Australia, within 180 days, um, around 2,000 Australians will be admitted to uh, ICU uh, wards, and there will be over 1,000 1, people uh, who die, including 439 people who are vaccinated will unfortunately die according to this modelling. Again, the vaccinations aren't perfect. I'm pro-vaccine, but we cannot keep telling people the fantasy uh, that we can solve all of these problems, because if we don't be upfront with the Australian people, we will not be, ever be able to get out of this and will continue these very cruel lockdowns which are causing enormous costs on our economy and particularly on people. And I'm against the lockdowns, and I think the evidence we've seen this week has shown why that should be the case. Part of that reason is part of these lockdowns just kick the can down the road, as those figures show. As those figures show, we will eventually, even with vaccination, still end up in an environment with infections, with deaths, with fatalities. We, cannot, we are not comparing here a cost today for perfection tomorrow. That is an un unattainable promise that should not be made to the Australian people. We are facing the situation of either, any road is a difficult one for us to, to venture along. The key thing, though, is what, 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 what road, which road, which path can lead uh, to the lowest amount of cost across all Australians 
not just focused on one thing in terms of the coronavirus. There is, um, there is daily press conferences where we focus on how many cases there are, uh, um, whether or not someone has tragically died from the coronavirus overnight. And unfortunately, it's a common tendency uh, for people to manage what is measured. We're measuring the coronavirus very minutely at the moment, so we are obsessed with managing that. There are no press conferences, though, about the number of small businesses that have gone to the wall last night in Australia. There are no, no press conferences which uh, tell us all how many marriages have broken up last night because of the stress of people being in lockdown. There are no, there are no press conferences telling us how many people have lost their job and are at their wit's end uh, overnight because of these lockdowns. And because we're not measuring those costs, they're being ignored and not being factored into proper decision making. And unfortunately, the decisions to lock down, made by uh, our people here, ourselves and, and in, in other parliaments at state levels, all of us and all of the advisers and public servants who are, who are informing us on these decisions, all of us, none of us bear a cost of the lockdown in any true sense. We still get paid. We still have a job. Uh, uh, we can still pay our mortgage and keep our houses. We are in what's called the laptop class. I can work off a laptop. In fact, I'll share a little secret. I kind of like lockdowns. I'm sorry, I, I don't like the fact that we have to do them. But for me, I can stay at home with my family. Uh, I, I don't have to travel. I don't have to go to boring meetings or functions. It's fantastic. But there are a whole lot of people out there in this country who it's not good. Lockdowns is no fun. They lose their jobs. They lose their business. Where is the voice for them in this parliament, in this place? Who is giving them uh, the dignity of standing up for the costs that are being imposed on these lockdowns by people who don't have to bear the costs themselves, who don't have to take a pay cut, who don't have to just, uh, stay awake at night thinking how they're going to pay their mortgage, who don't have to stay awake at night thinking how they're going to make their payroll for their employees? Where are the people advocating for them? Because there are an enormous, there are millions of Australians now facing that situation, and they are being ignored by us by continuing these lockdowns, which are far too costly. Now we deserve a proper assessment of the costs of this approach. I do welcome the figures that were released by the government yesterday, but they didn't amount to a costing of lockdowns. They were a costing of the four-phase plan a costing of different vaccination levels and what they meant. And the conclusions are clear. High vaccination rates are good and what we should be aiming for. They will lower the costs of any strategy, of any particular response to the coronavirus, will be better and less costly the more people we can uh, get vaccinated. And that should be our goal, absolutely. But these, <laughs> the modelling yesterday assumed, assumed that we would impose lockdowns at certain levels of coronavirus spread. So it did not actually assess uh, whether or not a lockdown strategy was less costly, even just in economic terms, let alone the mental health and other issues I've spoken about, it did not assess whether that is less costly than an approach which was more focused on testing, tracing, isolation, quarantine, and, and reasonable restrictions and measures that fall short of putting everybody out of work or everybody not in the laptop class, class out of work at least. We deserve that. We deserve that. We deserve to do that for the millions of Australians who do not have the same flexibility that uh, we do in this place. We should be providing them that information to be upfront with them about how much this is costing them and whether it is, in fact, the right decision for all. Uh, there is limited figures out there about um, what, this, uh, what, this, uh, what these lockdowns are costing, but on some you can make a pretty uh, clear estimation of their massive costs. There was some modelling by a different organisation, the Burnett Institute, another respected group of virologists. Uh, they said this week that the New South Wales lockdowns had avoided 4,000 coronavirus cases. And, and I have no reason to dispute their figures, so 4,000 coronavirus cases um, avoided. At that stage, the uh, a New South Wales lockdown had gone on for 35 days. AMP estimate that the lockdowns are costing $150 million a day 
that probably seems like an underestimate, especially given the extra support we're providing now. But regardless, let's take that $150 million a day. So we are, we are so, uh, at the 35-day mark. The lockdowns had cost $5.3 billion to avoid 4,000 coronavirus cases. Simple mathematics shows that that means that we're spending $1.3 million to avoid each and every coronavirus case. $1.3 million for each case. Not a fatality, not an admission to an ICU ward, for each case. That's just the economic costs. That doesn't include the impact on people's marriages, on their small businesses, on their long-term uh, health. Uh, this is way out of whack. And perhaps the reason we haven't got proper costings of what this costs or what we are costing uh, our, our, our economy, our society, our communities uh, uh, right now is because the figures would be eye-watering and indefensible. Because it's indefensible to spend that amount of money to avoid one coronavirus case. We do not apply that in any other public policy issue. 20,000 Australians a year die from smoking. 5,000 die from, uh, from alcohol. Around 1,000 die on our roads. We do not ban these things. We live with them. We realise we can't avoid every risk, but we let people get on with their lives and make their own decisions about that balance. And what would be best, sooner rather than later, is if we do restore the principle of personal responsibility and people making their own judgments about risk. Those of us that are lucky enough to work from home, we can still choose to do that. If we got rid of lockdowns, you could still do that. I could work from home on my laptop. I, couldn't, I didn't have to be here this week. I, I, I could avoid or limit my, my, my trips outside. You could do that. But imposing that lifestyle on people that don't have the same flexibility of you, as you is immoral and, 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 and it is, is extremely painful to those Australians who are suffering right now under a self-imposed, government-enforced, policed and army now backed lockdown of their lives. We have to restore some balance to this debate and be upfront with the Australian people about what the future holds. And the future holds whatever we choose, whatever vaccination rates we, we go for, uh, coronavirus spread. And we must learn to live with this virus. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, like other Labor speakers, um, I will, of course, be supporting this bill because Labor certainly um, supports the government's uh, plans, albeit belated plans, uh, to get money in the hands of people who are suffering right now from Scott Morrison's lockdown, the Prime Minister's lockdown. Um, we know that there are millions of people across Australia hurting very badly as a result of the Prime Minister's failures, which have led to this lock these lockdowns. Uh, and I'll have a little bit more to say about that over the course of my contribution. The mere fact that we need this bill is evidence of the Prime Minister's failures. As we have often said and will continue to say, this year, the Prime Minister had two jobs, to fix the vaccine rollout and to build purpose-built quarantine stations around our country so we could stop relying on hotel quarantine, um, a leaky system which at, so far has seen 27 leaks uh, of COVID-19 from it, uh, with no doubt more to come over the months, if not years, that we will have to wait for this government and this Prime Minister to finally build the quarantine facilities that were recommended by their own expert last year. Uh, it is terribly sad for millions of Australians that the Prime Minister has so grossly failed to perform those two jobs that he had. And the results can be seen all around us. There are currently 10 million Australians in lockdown across Greater Sydney, South East Queensland, and I note today it has been confirmed there is a COVID positive case in Cairns, so we'll have to keep an eye on what happens there. And in recent days there has been a COVID positive case in central Queensland as well. Uh, as yet, that has not led to an outbreak, and we can only hope that that remains the case. But these are the consequences of the Prime Minister's failure to do his job. 
We remember over and over again this Prime Minister saying that vaccination was not a race. It's not a race. It's not a competition. Uh, and you can certainly see that that was the attitude this Prime Minister had when you look at the league table for how Australia compares to other countries, the worst in the developed world. If this was a race, under Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister's leadership, we wouldn't have even started. We wouldn't be out of the starting blocks. We'd, we are being lapped over and over again, not just by highly developed countries around the world that we like to compare ourselves to, but by quite disadvantaged countries in the world who are so far ahead of us in vaccination rates that it's not even funny. So the fact that we have 10 million Australians in lockdown right now is direct evidence of this Prime Minister's failures to do his job. The fact that we now have jobs being lost again, businesses closing again, businesses going bankrupt again as a result of lockdowns is directly attributable to this Prime Minister's failure to do his job and to take the advice and suggestions of the opposition. Over the last 12 months, I've almost lost count of the number of constructive suggestions that the opposition has made to the government to try to get on top of COVID and to try to avoid the kind of damage that we are seeing across the country now. We were calling for wage subsidies long before the government caved in and agreed to JobKeeper. And I heard Senator Brockman give himself and give his government a pat on the back about JobKeeper. Well, I also remember when the Prime Minister was saying that wage subsidies like JobKeeper were dangerous. And because of the time that it took the government to get moving on JobKeeper, that's why we saw all of those queues outside Centrelink early last year. All of those jobs that people lost never to be recovered because this Prime Minister and this government were so stubborn about a Labor idea. And we've seen it again when it comes to vaccines. We were calling for the government to do five or six vaccine deals with different companies, like what we've seen other countries do. But no, they knew better. It was all about AstraZeneca with a little bit of Pfizer thrown in to top it up, and we all know how that went. If they'd only been prepared to listen to Labor's suggestion about doing deals with five or six companies, we would have many more millions of Australians vaccinated by now, and we wouldn't be in lockdown in Sydney, and we wouldn't be in lockdown in, in South East Queensland with all of the job and business losses that come with it. Uh, we suggested purpose-built quarantine stations, but no, that couldn't happen because it was a Labor idea. Uh, we su suggested uh, a serious investment in homegrown manufacturing of MR mRNA vaccines, but no, that couldn't happen because it was a Labor idea. We suggested a proper information campaign, particularly to multicultural communities where we are seeing high rates of uh, COVID infections at the moment and low rates of vaccinations. But no, that couldn't happen because it was a Labor idea. And it happened again yesterday when Labor again put a constructive suggestion forward about paying incentives to get people vaccinated, just like we're seeing in the US, across Europe, across Asia. It's good enough for their governments and good enough for their people to have incentives for vaccination. And they're well ahead of us in terms of vaccination rates. But no, it couldn't happen in Australia. Why? Because it was a Labor idea. This Prime Minister, at some point, and his government have got to recognise that they've got to actually think about the national interest, no matter who puts forward an idea. If it's an idea that's going to work, that's going to lift our vaccination rates, that's going to keep Australians safe, that's going to shield us from the immense economic harm that we are fe feeling around the country right now, then that good idea should be accepted no matter who it suggests. I don't care if the Prime Minister feels a bit embarrassed or a bit bad that he's having to rely on the opposition to put forward ideas rather than come up with his own. I just want these things done. If he wants to take credit for them, like he has done with JobKeeper, even though he resisted in the first place, well, fine, just do it. Because that is the way that we will lift vaccination rates, keep Australians safe and keep Australians running their businesses and keep them in work. That's what matters. Um, and again, his refusal to do so comes back to this stubbornness that we see over and over from the Prime Minister, um, his constant desire to play politics rather than put the national interests first, and it comes back to that complacency that we have seen from the Prime Minister and so many other ministers in this government over the last few months, best exemplified 
by that quote which will hang around his neck forever, it's not a race. Well, we know where that has ended up. So on behalf of my family, who are currently in lockdown in Brisbane, unable to go to their workplace, homeschooling, and on behalf of every other family in South East Queensland or Sydney or anywhere else in this country that is going through lockdown right now, thanks very much, Prime Minister. Maybe next time we might put forward an idea you might like to actually hear it out and think about whether it would work rather than just dismiss it because it wasn't your own idea. It's not about the Prime Minister putting his own vanity about whether he has an idea above the interests of the Australian people. The interests of the Australian people should always come first, not the Prime Minister's vanity, not the source of an idea. Now, as I say, the Prime Minister's failure to do his job to get vaccines in arms, to build quarantine stations, is having a direct impact right around the country at the moment. Um, and even just day after day after day in local media, we see examples of the kind of economic carnage uh, that is being uh, caused right now. I mentioned yesterday that last week I was in, uh, well, earlier in the week before the South East Queensland lockdown started, I met with representatives of the Gold Coast Airport. Um, their passenger numbers have fallen from about 80 per cent of pre-COVID levels, so they were starting to get back pretty close to normal. The minute the Sydney and Melbourne lockdown started, their passenger numbers fell to 10 per cent. Now, that isn't just having an impact on uh, the profits and workers at the Gold Coast Airport. That means there are fewer people coming into the Gold Coast, going to the hotels, going to the restaurants, going to the shops. So that is destroying the local economy across, across the Gold Coast. Um, it's the same in Cairns, where I was last week, meeting with tourism operators. Um, and Port Douglas, one of the most popular tourist resorts in the country at this time of year, usually full of people from Melbourne, particularly escaping the, the dead of winter in Melbourne, prior to the lockdowns, interstate, they were getting back up. They were at 85 per cent hotel occupancy. The minute the Melbourne lockdown and the Sydney lockdown started, their occupancy levels fell to 30 per cent. So that's going to put tourist work, tourism workers out of work in far north Queensland, and it's no doubt going to send many businesses to the wall, given they were barely hanging on in the first place. These are the direct consequences of the Prime Minister failing to do his job. It is not an academic exercise. It is not a political point in a speech. It is about people's jobs, their livelihoods, their health, uh, and whether they can actually continue functioning uh, in, uh, despite what is going on with COVID around the world. Now, as I say, even today, these problems continue to go on. Uh, I noticed in the Gold Coast Bulletin today, uh, the chief operating officer uh, of Village Road Show theme parks on the Gold Coast. Uh, said that um, many small businesses are practically trading insolvent, and in Village's case, we are burning cash with our ongoing costs, which is a really significant burden. For us to survive, we need government support in lockdown, out of lockdown, and it needs to go to December the 31st. I speak on behalf of every hotel, every accommodation house in this city, and of all the small business here who are in dire straits. Small businesses. On small businesses on the Gold Coast and across South East Queensland are in dire straits because of Scott Morrison's lockdown, the Prime Minister's lockdown, the lockdown that was caused because he didn't take it seriously, because he didn't think it was a race, because he didn't get people vaccinated and didn't build quarantine stations. As I say, it's the same in Cairns, and I noticed it in the overnight in last night's TV bulletins in Cairns. Um, the head of tourism uh, North Queensland, Mr Mark Olson, said that without wage support we will lose business forever. Mr Ken Chapman, the head of Skyrail, one of the most popular tourist attractions in far, in far North Queensland, described the current situation as worse than 12 months ago because back then we had JobKeeper. They don't have it now. In fact, because Far North Queensland is not currently locked down, they're not getting any support from this government. Their tourist numbers have fallen away. They've got businesses going to the wall because they were barely hanging on because of the last lockdowns. But now, because they are not in lockdown, there is not a dollar of financial support from the federal government to assist those businesses or assist those workers. It is not good enough. Now, this is the price of the Prime Minister's lockdown. 
This is the price of not taking this seriously, of saying it's not a race, of not doing his two jobs, being get people vaccinated and build quarantine stations. And in fact, the, the situation when it comes to vaccinations has been made really stark overnight with the release of new data from the federal government, which shows just how low the vaccination rates, particularly in regional Queensland and no doubt other parts of regional Australia are. Just to give you a couple of examples, uh, in Queensland right now, the Mackay, Isaac, Whitsunday region, there are only 10 per cent of, of the population that has been fully vaccinated. 10 per cent. That means 90 per cent of the population in the Mackay, Isaac, Whitsunday region is not vaccinated, is at risk of getting COVID when it gets into the region, is at risk of a lockdown happening. Why does it? Th that's, a, that's a seat this government holds. They have the power to get vaccine. I mean, we see them rot every other program under the sun uh, to get car parks in their own electorates, to get sports grants in their, in their electorates. But when it comes to getting vaccines in the arms of their own constituents in their own seats, they're the slowest in the state and slowest in the country. Central Queensland is not much better—14.7 per cent of the population fully vaccinated. And even more worryingly, in South East Queensland, which is currently in lockdown because of uh, a spate of Delta variant vaccinations, the Logan Bow Desert region, only 13.2 per cent of the population is vaccinated. 13.2 per cent of the population vaccinated in an area that is currently locked down and is at high risk of COVID outbreaks emerging. And it's not much better anywhere else in Queensland. Um, so really, we do need this Prime Minister and this government to take this seriously and to finally uh, get vaccinations happening. Now, the only other thing I wanted to say before I close off, specifically in relation to the payments being made through this bill. As I say, we support this bill. We support these payments being made. It shouldn't have ever happened if the government had done its job, but here we are. But there are nevertheless still a few gaps in terms of these payments, uh, which we have been taking up with the government and need to be addressed. Currently, even under this system, workers who are under 17 are unable to access the payment. And my office has certainly heard from young apprentices, 16-year-old apprentices, who don't qualify for these payments even though they're out of work. Workers living outside of COVID hotspot declared areas but are forced to lock down are not eligible. Sole traders and micro businesses have fallen between the gaps as well, as long as a lot of as well as casuals who are not scheduled for work. Order, there is still Senator work to be done. The government expires. needs to get on with it. Uh, we have Senator Seawood remotely. Hello. Uh, we're just checking you can hear me. It's we been playing. The system's been playing up. We certainly can, Senator Seawood. We had oh, some issues fantastic. before, Thank but you. you're good to go. Okay. I'd like to make a contribution to the debate on the Treasury Laws Amendment COVID-19 Economic Res Response uh, Number 2, Bill 2021. The Treasury Laws Amendment, co the, the, this, this bill, is the latest example of the government failing to adequately provide support to people suffering the devastating impacts of lockdown. This bill allows the Treasury to make rules of economic response payments uh, during lockdowns between July this year and December 2022. The economic and social impacts of lockdown are harmful. Lockdowns are especially harmful for the most vulnerable members of our community, including disabled people, carers, single parents, and people without work. At the beginning of the pandemic, the Morrison government did something we never expected them to do, quite frankly. They raised JobKeeper to $1,115 a fortnight doubling, in fact, the job seeker payment. This transformed people's lives. Um, it transformed the lives of thousands of people, uh, of people. For the first time in years, they could afford to pay rent, buy medications and have three meals a day. It enabled them to survive the lockdowns of last year. The Greens warned the government not to reduce job seeker back to the level of the poverty line when they decided that they thought that um, they had provided enough support and that we were coming out of the pandemic. We warned the government that people would need to access adequate income support as the, as the pandemic, in fact, continued. Instead, the government chose to condemn millions of people on income support to living in poverty. Then, when the latest outbreaks occurred, the government was dragged kicking and screaming to provide additional supports. That these are inadequate and ignore 
and they ignored, when they first came in, those living on income support, leaving them out in the cold. More than five weeks into the Sydney lockdown, the government finally provided some limited support to people in lockdown on income support payments. However, for people on income support payments to qualify for the $200 additional payment, you needed to have lost at least eight hours of work. This means that 350,000 people on income support in Greater Sydney missed out on critical support. These people, through no fault of their own, cannot find work. Once again, they, be, they are being punished by government simply because they cannot find work. Now, they cannot find work in the pandemic either. In fact, of course, it's worse. I'm concerned this number will only keep growing as the threat of lockdowns looms over, uh, is continuing Sydney and looms over other states and territories. At any time, any state or territory could go into lockdown because the Prime Minister hasn't secured enough vaccines and hasn't fixed hotel quarantining. I would like to take this opportunity to foreshadow a second reading amendment in my name Senator Hanson Young will in fact move for me, that outlines our concerns with the government's broad approach that continues to leave people behind. It will address people on income support and the fact that they are, have been ignored and are not getting additional support. It will outline the fact that it is very difficult for 350,000 people to try and survive on $44 a day. If we want, it also outlines the fact that if we do want to ensure that people do um, stay home, they need to extend support for all people's on income support. People have, and also it deals with the issue that people that have, lost, that have lost less than eight hours work continue to be excluded from the payment. And it also deals with the fact that all um, income support payments should be increased above the poverty line and everybody who has lost work should be given adequate support with access to full job keeper, to full, the full job keeper rate so that everyone is supported through this pandemic. Almost half the people on the job seeker payment have an illness or disability, meaning that they will need to isolate and require extra services like grocery or medication delivery. How can they afford to do this living below the poverty line? I'm very worried about disabled people and older women who make up a significant proportion of the people on the job seeker payment. Um, I'm very concerned that they will not be able to afford the basics during the lockdown, uh, but in the, the lockdowns that are going on now and into the future. You cannot on the one hand say that people should stay at home and then not provide adequate support for people to do so. This haphazard approach to managing the economic fallout of this pandemic is damaging our communities who are, extreme, who are in extremely stressful situations because the government simply did not have an adequate plan. By introducing the COVID supplement of an extra $550 a fortnight for people on the job seeker and youth allowance payments at the beginning of the payment in March last year, the government acknowledged that $40, that $40 at that time was never enough to survive on. And not, neither is the now, the now change payment of, 40, of just $44 a day. It is not enough to live on. We know it's forcing people to live in poverty and people are now expected to be living in poverty in lockdown situations where they don't have access to, particularly if they're vulnerable, they don't have, they aren't able to go out and buy groceries and essentials. They have to pay extra. We know from the last lockdown that costs increased significantly for people living on income support. People in New South Wales will be going through lockdown without the means to afford essentials. Same if um, in other states, in Queensland, if unfortunate, and if unfortunately other states have to go into lockdown. This is cruel and should not be happening in a country as wealthy as Australia. If we want people to be able to eat, clothe and house themselves, they need a payment of $80 a day. And we will keep cam campaigning to achieve this for people doing it tough on income support. To keep everyone safe, government must ensure that everybody can afford to stay at home. Income support is a public 
health emergency. People who cannot afford to stay home are at a greater risk of getting COVID and spreading it. We should be doing absolutely everything we can to support these people. Instead of income support above the poverty line, we have a government prioritising tax cuts for the rich. We have them giving handouts to their billionaire mates while the most vulnerable members of our community are condemned to living in poverty. This is appalling. To support people to stay at home and follow public health orders, the government must provide COVID disaster payments to everybody on income support, everybody on JobSeeker, Youth Allowance, DSP, carer payment, not just those who have lost work. Of course, people who have lost work need that additional support, but everybody should receive additional support. We had adequate income support at the height of the pandemic last year. We desperately need it back again. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Seawood. Senator Scar. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I'm pleased to rise in support of the Treasury Laws Amendment COVID-19 Economic Response Number no. 2 Bill 2021. Before I go into some detailed comments, I'd just like to provide some uh, initial observations. And the first is this. There are a small number of people in this country who are in very high positions of authority who are doing the best they can in extraordinarily difficult circumstances to make decisions, to make choices, in many cases choices between uh, options, neither of which would be preferable in the usual situation or in usual times. And they're having to make those calls, make those choices in real time based on the best evidence and advice that they can secure. And I think it is incumbent upon all of us, especially those of us who are not in executive positions, to demonstrate a little bit of empathy, a little bit of empathy for people who are in those leadership positions and who are doing the best they can in very trying circumstances. And I apply and extend that principle uh, to those in executive positions leadership positions, whether or not they are in leadership positions in uh, a parliamentary sense or in a public service sense, uh, those in our police forces, other emergency organisations, those in business organisations, those in the union movement, right across the board, right across the board. And I extend that uh, empathy to everyone in those positions, regardless of their political colours. We're all Australians. We're all Australians. And we're doing the best we can in extraordinary circumstances, a one in 100 year pandemic. And I think that needs to be acknowledged at the outset. And I don't think it helps. I don't think it's in the national interest for the rhetoric to get out of control in that regard and to seek to link specific health outcomes with the performance of individuals when those who are making those statements, who are making those comments, know, they know that individuals in those positions are making decisions on the basis of the best scientific advice that they can obtain, the best expert advice they can obtain. Are they getting it perfect? Does anyone ever get it perfect? But especially, where is this expectation that we're going to achieve perfection in terms of responding to a situation like the COVID-19 virus? Where did this expectation come from? Certainly those opposite need to perform their role in terms of keeping the government accountable. And that's their role, absolutely, and I respect that deeply. But I think at times we need to all consider our rhetoric and whether or not it's in the national interest at times when the rhetoric gets out of control and I think um, goes beyond that which is necessary for us to discharge our functions. And in terms of that communication, uh, certainly uh, from my perspective, it needs to be measured. It needs to be respectful. It needs to take into account that different Australians under great stress at this point in time are saying and doing things which they might consider is, uh, is correct, is right. And we need to extend respect and empathy to every single Australian in our country at this point in time and seek to unite. Seek to unite our country, not divide it. Seek to unite it, not divide it. And I apply that principle uh, with respect to uh, all communication 
by whichever stakeholders, including in the political sphere. It's so important, Madam Acting Deputy President, that at this point in time our language unites us, not divides us. It should unite us, not divide us. Now, my friend uh, Senator Watt from Queensland uh, said the Prime Minister only had two jobs. Well, I bet the Prime Minister wishes he only had two jobs, but unfortunately the reality is extraordinarily diff different. Uh, we're in a position at this time in our nation's history where we're, where we're having to face certain geosecurity issues in our region, especially in our region, and we are living in a challenging world in that respect. The Prime Minister tomorrow will deliver a Closing the Gap report uh, in relation to Indigenous health, uh, education, uh, economic participation in our society. There's the issue of our veterans, and those of us uh, who were present in the chamber yesterday saw the uh, very animated discussion with respect to issues relating to veterans and veteran suicide. There are a plethora of jobs, a plethora of responsibilities that come with being the Prime Minister of this country, and I think that needs to be respected. Secondly, I'd say to Senator Watt, I think it is grossly unfair, grossly unfair to connect our Prime Minister with a particular lockdown situation. I think it is grossly unfair and, from my perspective, uh, it is an example. It is an example of the rhetoric exceeding uh, what is called for in terms of a respectful constitutional democracy. I just don't think it's called for. The fact of the matter is the lockdown has arisen from the Delta variant of the COVID-19 virus. That's the cause. That's the cause. And one only has to look all over the world to see every country on the face of this world having to confront this Delta variant of the COVID-19 virus and the disruption that it's causing to economies and societies. It is extraordinarily unfair and unhelpful, to be frank, to, to seek to link our Prime Minister to a particular lockdown. And I think, to be frank, Madam Acting, Acting Deputy President, when the rhetoric, when the rhetoric gets out of control, when the rhetoric goes beyond what is reasonable and rational, when that occurs, it actually undermines, it undermines constructive points which are made by those uh, from any side of the chamber. When the rhetoric is overblown, it undermines whatever is constructive and positive in terms of senators' contribution in this chamber, and I think that needs to be recognised. So, Senator Watt quite legitimately wanted us to consider this issue of the $300 cash uh, incentive for people to get vaccinated. So let's let's consider that on a on a on a fair and reasonable basis. So on the one hand, one can see the argument, the prima facie argument that we'll offer three hundred dollars to someone and that will provide them with an incentive to go and get vaccinated. And by reason of their getting vaccinated, they are going to be uh, decrease the chances that, that they're going to get COVID nineteen and decrease the risk of transmitting it to someone else. So is that $300 payment um, justified? So let's accept that on face value. But let's also accept on face value that there are arguments against the utility of that proposal. And I just want to run through a few. As at 2 August 2021, 8,537,516 Australians had received one dose of a vaccine 4,061,924 had received two doses. So, taking on board the, the constructive suggestion and taking on board the intent is constructive, we would be paying $300 to 4,061,924 Australians who have already received two doses of the vaccine. That equates to something in the region of $1.2 billion. I don't see the public policy argument to actually pay $1.2 billion to people who have already done what you are trying to incentivise them to do. I just don't see the public policy argument in terms, of, in terms of trying to motivate people to do something which they've already done. In terms of the $8.5 million, if we extended the $300 cash bonus to the $8.5 million, 
that would be $2.55 billion of payments. Now, those 8.5 million have all demonstrated their intention to go through with the vaccination program. And I'm one of those. I'm in that 8.537 million. I've had my first AstraZeneca and my second one is scheduled for the first week in September. And again, it is hard to justify why you would be paying $300 incentive payment to someone who's already demonstrated that they're going through the process of getting vaccinated. So if we add the 2.5 together with the 1.2, we get $3.7 billion of money which would be paid under Labor's proposal to pay $300 to people who are vaccinated by 1 December. So on a public policy basis, on a public policy argument, we've got to consider the opportunity cost of that $3.7 billion and how it could be better spent. Senator Seward, who I listen very carefully to whenever she makes a contribution in this place, and her, her passion for those Australians who are in difficult positions is, um, is recognised, certainly by me. And surely to goodness we should be deploying that $3.7 billion to assist Australians who are, who are in specific difficulty who need that support, whether or not it be through mental health support, whether or not it be through augmenting disability services in the case of, uh, in the case of jurisdictions which are in lockdown, be it providing targeted and proportionate assistance to small business. That $3.7 billion which Labor proposes would be spent to paid to people who have either received one or two vaccines. That $3.5 billion, $3.7 billion, could be far better spent in terms of targeted support to people who genuinely need it at this point in time. Our response needs to be proportionate, it needs to be targeted, and it needs to be temporary. Those are the guiding principles which the Australian government has adopted throughout this pandemic, and they are guiding principles which should continue to guide our public policy decision making in that regard. In terms of the bill that's uh, before the Senate, uh, the bill has five schedules. The first schedule provides uh, the power for the government to make rules, for the Treasurer to make rules for economic response payments to provide support to an entity where they are adversely affected by restrictions imposed by a state or territory to control COVID-19. And it applies to all states and all territories equally, as it should, whether or not it be Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, wherever. The same rules should apply for each state and each territory. And that, those amendments are required so that those rules can be introduced in a timely and efficient way to ensure the support starts flowing as quickly as possible. Schedule 2 provides for the disclosure of tax information to Australian government agencies to facilitate COVID-19 business support programs. And that's clearly something which uh, is, is warranted. Schedule 3 deals with the taxation of business support, so that payments received by eligible businesses under certain COVID-19 business support programs administered by the Commonwealth Government will be non-assessable, non-exempt income, so the payments will not be subject to tax. And it's very important that that clarity is provided as soon as possible so that those who are providing tax advice to small business, financial advice to small business, are able to do that with some certainty in that respect. And we should remember, we should always remember that this is an extraordinary measure for extraordinary times. Schedule 4 provides for a modification power, which essentially provides flexibility to adjust information and documentary requirements in order to ensure the continuation of business transactions and government service delivery. And Schedule 5 provides again for tax exempt exemptions for COVID-19 disaster payments, in this case those payments received by individuals from the 2020 to 21 income year onwards, so that those payments are free from income tax. So, In summary, Madam Acting Deputy President, this is another step in the process of the government responsibly dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, a one in 100, 000, a one in 100 years one in 100 years pandemic, and it continues to apply the government's principles, which it supplied throughout this COVID-19 pandemic response, temporary, targeted and proportionate assistance to those who need it most. Thank you, Senator Scar. We have Senator Polly remotely.
Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I joined the debate today speaking on Treasury Laws Amendment COVID-19 Economic Response Number 2 Bill 2021. Labor is supportive of any measures to help Australians and people in my home state of Tasmania get through this pandemic uns as unscathed as possible. But with further lockdowns expected due to the incompetence of Scott Morrison and his tired eight-year-old government, more economic measures are necessary. Scott Morrison has, through this pandemic, had two jobs. Firstly, to roll out the vaccine, and secondly, to build a fit-for-purpose quarantine system. And he has failed both. Business support payments, as outlined in this bill, and other bills are crucial if we are to get the economy back on track. Labor will not stand in the way of support for businesses trying to make ends meet during a global pandemic. The Australian people know too well that this tired and old Morrison government has mishandled the pandemic. They have mishandled the rollout of the vaccine and have mishandled quarantine. To this day, only 15.4% of Australians have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19. This is not a figure to boast about. Let's be very clear and let there be no confusion here. The only reason that this legislation is before this Senate today is because of the Morrison government's failure to bring this pandemic under control. Whether through the vaccine rollout, hotel quarantine or cutting off JobKeeper too early, this government has failed workers and have failed businesses. This government is good at one thing, looking after its mates. The government has more than content handing out $22 million of taxpayers' money to Harvey Norman to fill their coffers. But when it comes to working with people that have been left outside, they've been left outside in the dark without any real support from this government at a time when they most need it. Every Australian feels for their fellow Australians in New South Wales and Queensland at the moment, and our thoughts have been with them throughout the pandemic, just as they were through when the Victorian uh, community were forced into a number of lockdowns. The Delta strain presents new challenges, but these challenges should have been foreseen by this government. We were always going to run into trouble when so few Australians have been vaccinated. To this day, when you have only 3.89 million Australians fully vaccinated, then of course, Delta was always going to be threatening lives and it's just not threatening of them, it is now taking them. For many workers and small businesses in New South Wales and Queensland, any support, too little, too late. Businesses are closing their doors and they're closing them for good. All of this was avoidable, but because of Mr. Morrison's incompetence, this is, this is now a situation where we don't know whether we're going to be able to stop it. The majority of Australians wouldn't be out of pocket if it wasn't for the Morrison government's failures on rolling out the vaccine and quarantine. Mr. Morrison said the vaccine rollout isn't a race. Well, he's wrong. It is a race and Australians are paying the price for his failure. Now, he may want to use the Olympic terminology about racing, but the reality is this Prime Minister has been left wanting without demonstrating any leadership at all. Every Australian knows it's been a race to beat this pandemic. Every Australian has known that it's been a race that we needed to win. We only saw yesterday across the country, every newspaper declaring that in fact, it is a race. So no doubt after Mr. Morris reading uh, some of that media, he's obviously come to accept the fact that it has been a race. Mr. Morrison left many workers and industries out in the cold. Frontline workers in retail and hospitality have not been valued the way they should be. He doesn't value truckies who have delivered the goods and kept services that we needed moving throughout this country. He doesn't value our airline industry and the workforce that keeps Australians in the skies. 
He doesn't value local government workers or the arts community. And I spoke yesterday about the lack of support to our university and tertiary education sector in this country. Then there is the aged care and disability carers. They've been last on Mr. Morrison's list to be vaccinated. It's an absolute tragedy. People want their prime minister to fight for them. They want to know that their prime minister has their back. And they're realizing quite frankly, that this prime minister doesn't. He shirks his responsibilities. Remember this when the prime minister told the Australian community that he doesn't hold a hose. Well, Mr. Morrison, you need to take responsibility. There needs to be a network of purpose-built quarantine facilities across the country. What have we seen from this government? No leadership whatsoever. It can't even roll out the vaccine in a timely manner. They were late getting out of the starting blocks, even ordering and making sure that we had the supplies from the outset. And right now, in the biggest crisis to face our community and the world in over a century, the Prime Minister has been unable to communicate a vision for Australians to be fully vaccinated so that we are out of lockdowns for good. When a healthy woman in her 30s dies because of COVID-19, when Australia had the opportunity to eradicate this virus with a successful rollout of the vaccine is an unmitigated disaster and a huge failure of this leadership. And my heart goes out to the families of those who have lost their lives, uh, particularly recently with Delta um, and the impact that that's had on so many young people and now children. The Prime Minister is not solely responsibility. He doesn't have to shoulder all the blame because the Minister for Health, Mr. Greg Hunt, should also be held accountable. At no other time in our history would a minister survive in their job when it is so obvious his failure to be able to carry out his job as Minister for Health during this pandemic. Mr. Hunt will go down in history as the worst health minister that Australia has ever seen. People are still dying in Australia because of the active decisions made by Mr. Hunt through the mishandling of this outbreak. And yet he's still the Minister for Health. We also have the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Mr. Richard Colbeck, Senator Colbeck, who has failed older Australians over such a long period of time. He's failed the aged care sector, firstly, when he was reluctant to uh, ensure that the Royal Commission into Aged Care and the sector and all the recommendations have been adopted by this government and implemented in a very timely manner. He has mishandled the pandemic. They were warned about the serious nature of COVID-19 early enough to ensure that the aged care sector were protected. But I have to remind you of the tragic circumstances of 2020, when 685 older Australians died because of COVID-19 infections in residential aged care homes. Despite, as I said, those early warnings that these sites were highly vulnerable. And we also have dismal vaccination rates for people in disability homes and for the disability carers with only one third currently vaccinated. Why aren't these ministers being held accountable for their failures in their ministerial duties to keep Australia safe? If Australia had rolled out the vaccine and installed a nationally coordinated vaccine and, uh, and quarantine systems, Australians would not be dying, would not be dying again. And 14 million Australians would not be forced into another avoidable breakdown of their businesses, their livelihoods, and they would not be in lockdown right now because this is destroying their livelihoods, the family businesses, the harm that it's doing to their mental health. 
Scott Morrison's ministers should be and must be held accountable. I'm calling for the resignations of uh, Mr Hunt and Senator Colbeck because they should be sacked by the Prime Minister. Instead, Lieutenant General John James Furwin has been brought in to cover for Mr Morrison's failure, for his minister's failures. It is unacceptable that we just keep accepting the second-rate Prime Minister who continues to fail to emphasise or take responsibility for his own failings, blames everyone else but himself to communicate to the people of Australia. Mr Morrison didn't negotiate, negotiate enough vaccine deals early enough. That's a fact. He failed to hear the early warning signs and protect older Australians in aged care homes. Fact. He has failed to protect aged care and disability workers. Fact. He has failed to protect teachers, retail workers and transport workers. Fact. He has failed to bring back JobKeeper and keep Australians safe. Unfortunately, another fact. I'm angry people's lives are still at risk because we have a Prime Minister bereft of any leadership tendencies whatsoever. We have a Prime Minister who has only ever been worried about his own job and how he is perceived. People's lives are not only at risk, but their mental well-being is as well. And we do not know the full impact of people's mental health, but we will see that transpire over the coming months and years. While New South Wales and Queensland are in lockdown, it hurts the entire country. Tasmania be, may be in its quietest season for tourism, but we rely on mainlanders travelling to our great state to see and taste our world-renowned cuisine. We rely on our mainland brothers and sisters and neighbours to stay for a few We seem to have lost Senator Polly. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I speak to the Treasury Laws Amendment COVID-19 Economic Response No. 2 Bill 2021. This bill is notable for what it is not. Before financing economic response packages using taxpayer funds, government must pay taxpayers the respect and courtesy of a comprehensive definition of the problem being addressed and then a comprehensive detailed plan to which taxpayers and our parliament can hold the government accountable. Yet state and federal governments are lurching from one COVID event to another with no detailed plan. This breeds confusion, duplication, waste, and as we've seen, contradictions within and between governments that are, in plain language, stupid and leave taxpayers incredulous. This is driving fear, confusion, frustration, insecurity and anger between and within and across our country and our communities. Everyday Australians have had a gutful of states blaming and bickering with each other and with the federal government while imposing capricious, arbitrary COVID lockdowns and restrictions, killing businesses, killing employment and killing our economy, and killing people. People are crying out for leadership, competence and integrity. People need to be heard and want a proper plan. What's involved in a comprehensive plan for managing a virus? It starts with data, truth and care. Now, in March and April 2020, I spoke in the Senate and indicated that after seeing reports of tens of thousands of deaths in Italy, Spain, France and China, we would vote with the COVID-19 measures the government introduced. At the time, I repeatedly warned the government that in the months ahead we would hold the government accountable and I expected them to provide the people with data and with a proper detailed plan for their COVID response. <clears throat> I've been holding government accountable since May 2020, yet we've still not seen a proper detailed plan. The government has not even shared the underpinning data on the virus characteristics, nor the Doherty Centre modelling, nor the erroneous flawed UK modelling on which the Doherty modelling is based. Yet the government has splashed a huge bucket of taxpayer cash, hundreds of billions of dollars of taxpayer money, like swill. Economic measures need to be based on a solid plan. 
In Senate estimates hearings in March and May this year, the Chief Medical Officer and Head of the Federal Department of Health both agreed with my list of strategies for a proper plan to manage a virus. There are seven. The first is isolation, lockdowns, national border closure, initially, only initially. Number two, testing, tracing and quarantining of the sick and the vulnerable. Number three, restrictions such as social distancing and masks. Number four, injections, vaccines, provided they're properly, fully tested and safe. Number five, treatments using cures and prophylactics. Number six, personal behaviour such as washing hands. They added that one. Number seven, health and fitness. Both these health officials confirmed that my list is complete. It does not miss anything. It does not contain anything that should not be in a plan. All these seven strategies need to be considered, and I'll return to this list in a, moment, in a minute. I asked these officials for data characterising the virus in terms of severity or mortality and transmissibility. I specified clearly that I wanted data relative to past respiratory diseases such as SARS, MERS and severe flus, including the 1918 Spanish flu and the 1997 H5N1 avian flu. Their later written answer included a diagram showing that while COVID-19 is highly transmissible, highly contagious, its severity is low to moderate. I'll say that again, its severity is low to moderate. The diagram does not show that some people with COVID-19 have no symptoms. Many people diagnosed with COVID show symptoms typical of flu. A small group with comorbidities can die. Having that breakdown into groups is crucial to having a proper plan for managing the virus. Where is that breakdown? Why has government not shared this data with the people? By the way, Texas and Florida have opened their economies and removed COVID measures, including lockdowns, masks and business closures. These jurisdictions have experienced an almost identical pattern of infection, hospital admission and mortality as other American US states that are still in lockdown. After Florida's only lockdown, State Governor DeSantis apologised to his residents and has had no further lockdowns despite Florida having a high proportion of aged residents. So how many? of the seven strategies are our governments adopting. Firstly, the states are capriciously using lockdowns, killing our economy, killing small business, killing the regions, and killing people through increased suicides and attempted suicides. That's slamming a trillion dollar debt on Australians not yet born. Even the UN's World Health Organization, a corrupt, incompetent, and dishonest body, now admits, even the UN World Health Organization admits lockdowns are a blunt instrument to be used only initially to get control of a virus. In continuing to use lockdowns, states are revealing they have not mastered the virus. Instead, the virus is managing the states. Six days ago, the New South Wales Deputy Premier and Leader of the Nationals openly admitted that the New South Wales State Government has no clue what is happening with lockdowns. We welcome his honesty. Lockdowns are a form of controlling people, useful for increasing widespread fear. Fear is a weapon, not only for control, it's used to win elections. Invoking a crisis is a well-known tactic to help incumbent governments. The federal government's partially closed national borders are a form of isolation. Yet there are valid proven strategies for better managing this that are based on data. Due to a looming election, it seems the Prime Minister has taken a lesson from Queensland, the Northern Territory and WA that ramped up fear of the virus before state elections to invoke the power of incumbency and fear. What a disgrace. When politicians and media talk about the cost of COVID, they are lying. The truth is it's the cost of politically driven government restrictions, capricious restrictions, not based on data. Second strategy, testing, tracing and quarantining of the sick and vulnerable. Although improving, testing and tracing in Australia have been poor. Vulnerable people are largely not adequately and fairly quarantined. Taiwan, though, a small island crammed with a population similar to Australia's, has achieved an amazing performance with no interruption to its economy and no legacy debt. Taiwan did not lock up everyone. Instead, it protected the sick and the vulnerable. Taiwan's economy continued to hum along because this proven strategy drastically cut COVID's economic costs. Number three, restrictions such as masks and social distancing. 
Remember, initially there were not enough masks available and authorities here and overseas told us that masks were not important. Yet later, when masks became available, the same authorities told us masks are vital. When Queensland's health minister earlier this year forced mask use, she was asked whether drivers alone in cars by themselves would have to wear masks. She clearly had no clue and then hesitatingly said, mm, yes. When Brisbane, in one corner of our state, had three COVID-19 cases in January this year, the, the Labor government mandated masks across the entire state, including the tiny town of Bamaga, 2,700 kilometres away on our state's northern tip, where there were no cases at all. Masks are becoming a form of conditioning people to follow orders and to submit to government. Vaccines or injections are the fourth strategy. The Federal Chief Medical Officer, Head of the Federal Health Department and the Head of the Therapeutic Goods Administration all have refused to guarantee the safety of these expensive injections. There have been reversals of, of advice and the public is now afraid and hesitant. Health authorities do not know the dosage needed, don't know the number, of frequent, number and frequency of doses and admit that injections will not prevent transmission of the virus, will not stop people getting the virus, will not end restrictions. The effect on children in the womb and on future generations is not known. The long-term effects on people injected is not known. Why the hell is the government injecting people with an untested, unproven drug? Serious adverse effects, including deaths due to injections, have occurred here, and overseas thousands of people have died. Governments, state and federal, have repeatedly contradicted their own advice earlier and assurances. And assurances contradicted their own assurances. Federal Health Minister Greg Hunt publicly admitted, quote, the world is engaged in the largest clinical vaccination trial. We're not lab rats. Governments are using threats of digital passports, or as I call them, digital prisons, that withdraw services and prevent access to work and to livelihoods, to travel and to events. Government wants to remove basic freedoms. No wonder vaccine hesitancy is spreading across our country. Never before have Western governments injected healthy people with a substance that can kill. The fifth strategy. At the same time, our government is depriving us of ivermectin, a known treatment for and preventative for COVID-19. This would dramatically reduce costs, the need for packages. Over a period of 60 years and for various diseases, ivermectin has proven safe in 3.7 billion doses. It's already approved in Australia to treat a number of health conditions. In April last year, I raised the topic of promising ivermectin in vitro trials on COVID in Melbourne, yet the government has done nothing. Ivermectin is easily affordable and over the last year overseas has become a highly successful and proven treatment for COVID. Plus, over 40 medical scientific papers now hail ivermectin success. Prominent doctors across many fields of medicine, including immuno immunology and respiratory diseases, advocate ivermectin for treating COVID-19. Yet the federal government in Australia sits on its hands, is not exploring ivermectin's potential and refuses to authorise its use for COVID. The government is ignoring a proven medicine that could end this virus's reign as it has overseas. The government again has blood on its hands. Overseas, this proven strategy is drastically cutting COVID's economic costs and keeps people healthy and economies healthy. Ivermectin has one hurdle though. Its use will eliminate the hundreds of billions of dollars revenue for vaccine makers from vaccines that have bypassed standard testing and approval processes. Sixth strategy. Personal hygiene, such as hand washing, personal behaviour and practical actions. The same as for stopping the flu or, or a cold, another strain of coronavirus. Seven, health and fitness, obesity and other diseases increase the risk of COVID-19, yet government has done nothing. Although this is mostly personal responsibility, there's a role for government providing data and advice. Of the seven strategies that senior federal health officials confirmed, the government is relying on only one expensive strategy of injections with known adverse health effects and on partial closure of borders. Instead of data, governments are pushing fear. Instead of a detailed plan, governments are pushing paranoia. Instead of strengthening our economy, governments are lining big farmers' pockets. COVID-19 exposed our country's core, atrocious state and federal governance, atrocious and deadly. Governments talk now about a new COVID normal. That is rubbish. If governments cared and wanted us to feel safe, they would have an end-to-end -end solution for COVID, a solid, detailed plan based on solid data and specifying, specifying what actions will be taken, why they will be taken, when they will be taken, where they will be taken, who will be responsible and how will they be taken. 
a solid plan. Before an economic package is produced, there must be a plan. Then it must be costed and a business and health case made for it. When organisations, whether a business or government or not-for-profit, work to a plan, the plan can always be changed as circumstances change and data comes, more data comes in. Yet our state and federal Liberal, Labor and Nationals governments have never attempted to make a detailed plan. That shows that Liberal, Labor and Nationals do not care about people's health and lives, do not respect the taxpayers of Australia, do not provide solid governance. Governance of an entity, any entity, has three aspects. Trusteeship for the entity's values, yet governments are trashing Australian values. Secondly, custodianship for the entity's future, for those Australians not yet born. Yet governments are trashing our children's future and burdening them with a trillion dollars of avoidable debt. Thirdly, stewardship for the entity's resources. Yet governments are wasting taxpayer funds and killing our country's productive capacity. Instead, the government in this bill is just going to spend taxpayer money and tell other departments who they're giving it to. This is not a plan. It's an excuse to splash cash and not be accountable. It will motivate unaccountable premiers to waste more taxpayer money while destroying our country's tax base. It's the very opposite of our Constitution's foundation. Instead of competitive federalism, we are having yet another example of competitive welfareism. The core issue this bill perpetuates is shoddy governance, atrocious governance. Repeatedly, this government shows it cannot plan. That means it cannot govern. It is based on hollow marketing slogans. Its intent is to look good, not do good. It aims to be re-elected, not to serve. The only thing this government has going for it is Anthony Albanese and the Labor Party. This bill discusses government making, quote, disaster payments. It dishonestly does not discuss the fact that state and federal government caused the disaster. Australia needs honest, competent, consistent leadership using solid data. Government needs to serve the people and serve Australia's national interest. We need to restore governance that cares for people's lives, cares for people's livelihoods, cares for people's security, cares for people's future. Governance that cares for our country's security, our country's values, our country's economy, our country's future. We need a government that is honest and that serves the people. We have one flag above this parliament. We are one community. We are one nation. Madam Acting Deputy President, we will be supporting one of the Greens' second reading amendments to recover financial support from entities paying executive bonuses and Senator Patrick's third Thank reading you, amendment Senator to instil Roberts, a register of entities. Your time has expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise today to speak in favour of the Treasury Laws Amendment COVID-19 Economic Response No. 2 Bill 2021. Right at the outset of the COVID-19 pandemic, back at the start of 2020, it was clear that Australia would be facing not only the impacts of a global health crisis, but also a global economic crisis. And certainly in my home state of Tasmania, where with perhaps the exception of the northwest coast, we have been incredibly fortunate in avoiding much of the health crisis, it was the economic concerns and the concerns from small business owners uh, that I was first hearing on the ground when this, uh, when this pandemic first took hold in Australia. As well as the unprecedented challenge of keeping Australians safe, governments had to face the prospect of restrictions on movement, restrictions in consumer confidence and the closure of international borders putting extreme pressure on many businesses and many industries. Since the beginning of 2020, we've seen all of those fears come to pass and then more. Businesses, small, medium and large, in every state and territory have, at different times and to differing degrees, been affected. There have been times where businesses have been unable to open or operate for weeks and months on end, particularly in Victoria last year during the major outbreak and lockdown. We're again seeing that happen in New South Wales and South East Queensland, as I speak in here right now. And of course, we also need to remember that it's not just the businesses directly situated in outbreak areas which are being affected. And certainly as we've come into 21, in 2021 and lockdowns have been uh, more isolated, 
then that is certainly a recurring theme. It's not like back 12 months ago when most of the country was in lockdown. With isolated lockdowns, we are now understanding and learning more about the impacts on not only those regions that are in lockdown, but those outside. And my home state of Tasmania is an excellent example of this. Tourism and hospitality businesses in Tasmania have been significantly affected by the inability of visitors from Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland and other parts of Australia at times to enter the state over the winter period. And it's interesting to note that um, particularly with the Victorian lockdown and the New South Wales lockdowns, uh, that, that contrast has been really stark, just seeing um, the number of people out in the streets uh, enjoying all that Tasmania has to offer when all of a sudden two of our most populous states and two states that clearly um, consist of people that love coming to Tasmania and they aren't able to come here, then the impact is quite stark. And I know that it's a similar situation for tourism businesses all around Australia, whether or not they're in lockdown areas. And we've heard a lot um, in the debate in the chamber on this particular, this particular bill um, around the impact uh, of, of tourism areas in Queensland. And our heart certainly goes out to those areas at the moment, even the ones that aren't in lockdown. The tourism industry is an example of an industry which I think, Madam Deputy President, is going to need well-targeted, carefully thought-out support over the coming months. And unfortunately, it's clear that the threat of COVID-19 and the restrictions that follow aren't going to magically disappear overnight. As much as we might like to think so, we aren't going to wake up one day and suddenly be back in situation normal. We need to continue to pursue those important vaccination thresholds, which will provide a pathway back towards normal life. Yesterday, the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, outlined an incredibly important plan, which has been agreed to in principle by the National Cabinet, built on the clear premise that getting vaccinated is the pathway to making lockdowns, border closures and restrictions a thing of the past. More than 12.5 million vaccine doses have now been administered, and we are now hitting well over a million doses administered every week. A total of 4.5 million vaccinations were given in July, which is more than double that achieved in May, when 2.1 million doses were administered. And, Madam Deputy President, it's particularly pleasing to see how eager Australians around my age are to do our bit and get vaccinated so we can advance towards those 70 and 80 per cent vaccination thresholds as soon as possible. And I know that when um, the, when the um, announcement was made that young people um, that may not have otherwise been eligible for the vaccine yet were, or for the Pfizer vaccine yet were able to go to their doctors, their local GPs, and have that conversation about um, potentially getting the AstraZeneca vaccine, that was incredibly welcomed by uh, young people my age. I think particularly young people um, living in the areas of, of Melbourne and Sydney that were more prone to those lockdowns. They were saying, I just want to get vaccinated. Let me get vaccinated. Let me take personal responsibility for my health and get the vaccine so that I can play my part in protecting the rest of my community. Despite the progress on the vaccination rollout and the pathway back to normal, there is still a way to go. And it is clear that there will continue to be situations over the coming months where businesses are heavily impacted by COVID and are unable to operate as usual. Just as we've done with Commonwealth support programs like JobKeeper, which saved so many businesses from going under and kept millions of Australians in employment, the government will continue to be there to support employees and businesses. You can see that in the assistance that we are providing in New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland as they grapple with current outbreaks in their states. And of course, uh, state governments are also doing their bit to support businesses and employees who are affected by outbreaks and lockdowns. One of the lessons of the pandemic, Madam Deputy President, whether it's in relation to health responses or economic responses, is that we need to be adaptable and flexible in responding to specific situations. And a lot has been said in here of, um, from those on the other side that think that the government should have had a, a crystal ball or had a tarot card reading and known exactly 
how this pandemic was going to play out from the word go. As soon as this virus was on our shores, then apparently we should have had this, um, you know, get, got the book off the wall that says this is how we deal with the COVID-19 pandemic and followed the instruction manual. But this pandemic is unprecedented, Madam Deputy President. We have not gone through something like this in 100 years. And to be perfectly frank, 100 years ago, I suspect that we would have dealt with things quite differently because technology, um, medicine, all of these things were at a completely different point. And every time I've come into this place to talk about our COVID-19 response, whether it has been our economic response and the support that we have provided to individuals and businesses across this country, or whether it has been our health response and the work that our government is doing to ensure that the vaccine is rolled out in a timely fashion. I've always focused on the fact that this pandemic is unprecedented. You think back to January last year um, when we were uh, first hearing about this thing called coronavirus. Um, and then it, it came to Australia at the end of January and, and a lot of people sort of thought, well, what is this, what is this going to be? Is this going to be like um, the, the, the swine flu or the avian flu of, of 10 years ago? Is it just going to be a bit of a cold? Um, what is going to be the impact? How, how transmissible is it going to be? I mean, th th this was something that, that we weren't even sure of in those early days. This was a novel coronavirus. Um, we have had to invest significant time and significant resources, us and other countries globally, into understanding the impacts of this virus, understanding the virus and then understanding how it's going to affect our community. And so we need to be adaptable because, and we, and we have been adaptable, Madam Deputy President. Uh, the entire point of the JobKeeper subsidy was that we designed a program that would be adaptable to the situations that we found ourselves in, adaptable to the fact that some businesses were experiencing significant downturn in their business, others not so much. We have designed programs that were scalable and adaptable based on the fact that this was an unprecedented situation. Um, and we need to make sure that we have the right settings in place to ensure that this financial assistance can be rolled out as efficiently and effectively as possible so it gets where it needs to go and supports the businesses and employees who are in need. And, Madam Deputy President, fundamentally that is what this legislation that we are discussing here today um, will, will seek to do. It will um, tailor the, um, the, the economic response, the support that our government is providing to those that really need it as we move through the pandemic and, and beyond a point where our entire country is in lockdown to, to figuring out how, how we work it out when it's just these smaller uh, geographical locations around our great country. And in understanding how this legislation uh, does target our financial assistance to ensure that it is rolled out in an effective manner, I do want to, um, just for these last few minutes, um, go through the, the details of the legislation. Uh, Schedule 1 to the bill amends the Payments and Benefits Act to allow the Treasurer, Mr Josh Frydenberg, to make rules for economic response payments to provide support to an entity where they are adversely affected by restrictions imposed by a state or territory to control COVID-19, so um, what, what we most commonly know as is lockdowns. Uh, this measure will give effect to the government's commitment, Madam Deputy President, to assist any state that is unable to administer its own business support payments in the event of a significant lockdown imposed by a state or territory, from, backdated from 1 July this year until 31 December 2022. And the law change ensures that the government has the flexibility it needs to provide timely and efficient support to businesses across Australia in cases where they are being impacted by public health orders related to the control of COVID-19. Schedule 2 to the bill amends the Taxation Administration Act 1953 to allow the Australian Tax Office to share data with government agencies for the, for the purpose of administering a relevant COVID-19 business support program. 
Um, relevant business support programs are those that have been included in a declaration by the Treasurer for this purpose. The Treasurer can make this declaration by legislative instrument if he is satisfied that the program responds to the economic impacts of COVID-19 and supports businesses who have had their operations impacted by public health orders as well. Um, and this schedule will assist with a timely and efficient delivery of business support payments to businesses across Australia which are impacted by COVID-19 and have had their operations impacted by public health directives. And Schedule 3 to the bill, Madam Deputy President, introduces a new legislative instrument making a power into the income tax laws to make eligible Commonwealth COVID-19 business grants free from income tax. I'm sure that there will be uh, many grant recipients that will be happy to hear that, Madam Deputy President. This treatment will ensure eligible business support payments are able to provide the greatest possible benefit by classifying them as non-assessable, non-exempt income for tax purposes. Currently, states and territories are able to apply for the same tax treatment where they have grant programs focusing on supports, supporting small and medium businesses facing exceptional circumstances related to COVID-19. This measure builds on the government's broader support to businesses during the COVID-19 pandemic. Schedule 4 uh, is a modification power which will reinstate a power to allow responsible ministers to change arrangements for complying with information and documentary requirements under Commonwealth legislation in response to ongoing challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this measure is temporary and it will be repealed on 31 December 2022. Um, and Schedule 5 is tax exemptions for COVID-19 disaster payments. Um, so incredibly important measures, Madam Deputy President, to ensure that we continue to have um, success in keeping businesses afloat during the worst impacts of COVID-19 and ensure that our economic recovery continues to lead the world. Madam Deputy President, Australia is certainly not out of the woods when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I know that that is incredibly difficult for some Australians to understand, particularly uh, those ones such as um, in Victoria and to an extent in New South Wales as well that have had their lives come into and out of lockdown. And I can't even begin to imagine um, coming from Tasmania where this hasn't been as much of an issue for us the impact that that must be having on, on businesses and employees uh, to an extent. You don't necessarily know if or when you're going to be able to go to work. You are at the mercy of this awful virus. But this government is with you. We are supporting small businesses in Australia to, uh, to deal with this economic crisis. And on that note, Madam Deputy President, I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Uh, Senator Sheldon on remote. Uh, thank you, um, Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment COVID-19 Economic Response No. 2 Bill 2021. Here in Sydney, we're entering our sixth week of lockdown with no end in sight. In the last week, we've been joined by those living in South East Queensland, in Victoria and New South, South Australia. Restrictions have only recently been lifted. There are more than 10 million Australians currently enduring a lockdown, and people are doing it tough, particularly here in southwest Sydney, but also around Australia. There is the most direct consequences of the COVID-19 outbreak, the impact, of course, on mental and physical health. There are 286 currently hospitalised here in New South Wales and 53 people in intensive care. There have been tragically been 17 deaths in this current outbreak. Then there is the heavy me mental health toll this outbreak and the subsequent lockdowns is taking. At a time when loneliness, isolation, alienation are already widely felt across the community, these lockdowns are exceptionally difficult. Then there is the economic toll this outbreak is taking. These lockdowns are costing the Australian economy $300 million a day. When the number is that massive, it can feel very abstract. But it is a collective loss of tens of thousands of small businesses. That's what it means. Many of them forced to shut up shop. It is a collective loss of millions of Australian workers who have had lost their jobs or at least lost their shifts. For weeks, millions of Australian workers and their families 
have faced an uncertain future. The country simply did not know what support would be available from the federal government in this time of great need. This outbreak did not come out of the blue. These lockdowns are not unprecedented. There was no need for this mad scramble to announce a series of ad hoc support packages. It has created unnecessary confusion about what help is available and who is eligible to receive it. When Australia was first plunged into lockdown last year, Labor and the trade union movement called for wage subsidies. The Morrison government opposed it initially. They were eventually dragged kicking and screaming to set up JobKeeper. JobKeeper is deeply flawed, but it's also a critically important scheme. The Morrison government chose to exclude casuals who had been with their employer for more than a year from JobKeeper. In March, when the Morrison government decided JobKeeper, um, uh, to kill JobKeeper, Labor called for that architecture to be kept in place for those who needed it. But the Prime Minister living, was living in his own fantasy world at this point. He was saying the vaccine rollout isn't a race. He was playing down the urgency of the vaccine rollout, while at the same time dismantling the economic support that had been developed in case of further lockdowns. If you aren't going to take the vaccine rollout seriously, you need to keep the contingency measures in place. It's that simple. And this brings us back to the real reason that 10 million Australians are in lockdown today, which is that the Prime Minister failed the only two jobs he had this year. He failed to lead a speedy and effective vaccine rollout. And he failed to set up a national quarantine system. Now we are almost last among all developed nations for vaccination rates. It's a horrific situation we're now finding ourselves in. And this is 18 months into the pandemic. And we're still relying on hotels to act as emergency quarantine facilities. Since November, there's been a leak to hotel quarantine on average every nine days. Every nine days. The Prime Minister's failure on vaccines and fails on quarantine are the reasons we are in this horrible situation. But those that aren't the only failures in the Morrison government this year. The aviation sector has been particularly badly hit by COVID-19 pandemic. When JobKeeper was killed in March, the aviation sector was very clear about the need for continued wage subsidies. At the March hearings of the inquiry into the future of Australia aviation post-COVID-19, all corners of the aviation workers were calling for continued wage subsidies. Not just to keep food on the table, but also to, to keep workers connected to their industry, to their companies. And to ensure that once the sector does get back on its feet, that we have a trained and ready workforce to stand and back up. Ms. Uh, Corey Flynn, an airline worker and Australian Service Union delegate said, and I quote, having keeping Having JobKeeper or knowing that we did have some source of income coming to us was a relief. I can't stress enough how important it is that our industry is to have JobKeeper. There is until our industry can get back on its feet. These are direct quote. This is a direct quote from aviation worker, and you know, a number of other aviation workers have spoken out, you know, very clearly on this matter. And the a flight attendant from the uh, Association of um, Australia, Flight Attendants Association of Australia, said in evidence that without this support, I would have to move back to South Australia and possibly split from my husband whilst I am pregnant and our first child. These are direct quotes about the importance of a continued wage subsidy and the importance of keeping aviation workers connected with their employer. Now, what did the Morrison government do? There was no wage subsidy. They instead set up a pork barrelling scheme to provide subsidised airfares to marginal seats. The pork barrelling was so blatant the government had to lap tack on new destinations the week after it was announced. And we still don't know how the destinations were chosen. I have asked Austrade and the Department of Transport at the last two rounds of estimates, and no one can tell me. 
Austrade pointed me to a few data sets. And when we analysed them, it turned out that none of it matched with the actual destinations the government selected. And it's just the latest in a long series of rorts and lack of transparency by the Morrison government. And this is one particularly disgusting because it came at the expense of those aviation workers who were left behind. And just this week, the Deputy Prime Minister got up and announced a new wage subsidy just five long months after aviation workers had told us that they desperately need support. It took five months for the government to react, and the, the package they announced was only to pilots and cabin crew. There is nothing in that package for thousands of grounding, ground staff doing a tough around Australia. This is a problem with the Morrison government's policy on the run. People get left behind. In this case, those ground staff have been left behind intentionally. But Labor does support this bill today, and we have supported um, any support for workers and families doing it tough during this pandemic. We have not let perfect be the enemy of good. At every stage, Labor has put toward constructive policies, ideas for how we can support Australia through the crisis. Some, like JobKeeper, have been adopted by the government, and albeit with added rotting and carve-outs. I strongly encourage the government to listen to Labor and listen to the trade union movement again. There is need to be simple, clear and consistent financial support for workers who are losing jobs and in, in income as a result of the pandemic. And lastly, the Morrison government needs to take a serious look at what is happening in the vaccine rollout for aged care workers. At the Senate Select Committee on Job Security last week, three major aged care workers, uh, three uh, aged care workers, uh, major, major uh, companies from aged care providers told us that they are going to get struggle to meet the September 17th Senator deadline Sheldon, for full vaccination. The time for this debate has now expired. You'll be in continuation. Um, we'll now move to Senator's statements, and I call Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to make this statement to, utterly, to condemn the utterly odious statements made last week by Mr Julian Burnside. We compared the treatment of Palestinians to the German treatment of Jews during the Second World War. This vile attempt to equate the people of Israel to modern, modern history's most disgusting acts is atrocious and shows the voters shows that voters made the right decision to reject him at the 2019 election. Now, this is not the first time that the former Greens candidate has made vile comments equating people to Nazis. Indeed, in 2018, he shared doctored images of Minister Dutton superimposed with a Nazi office, officer's uniform. It seems as though even after the backlash of this incident, he has not learned his lesson or sought to educate himself on the matter. I would suggest to Mr Burnside that he stops using the Holocaust whenever he has criticism of Israel or their policies, especially as he is, as by his own admission, he's yet to even visit Israel and experience and look at and learn about the situation on the ground. His lack of understanding on this issue is clear and unfathomable that he would still make these comments before educating himself on making those remarks. I was last in Israel in December 2019, and I learned so much from my time on the ground there. What you learn from being there goes to explain a lot of what happens on both the Israel and Palestinian side. I would suggest that Mr Burnside follow suit, and perhaps visit the region meet the people and educate himself to see why such comments leave such a vile taste in one's mouth. These comments not only destroy the promise he previously made to Holocaust survivors after his pr previous disgraceful tweets, it also unnecessarily opens old wounds that many people still suffer from and throws dirt in their face. This type of language and rhetoric is utterly disgraceful and only serves one purpose in promoting anti-Semitic hatred that we are working very hard to stamp out. If we are to remember the atrocities 
so, that occurred during the Holocaust, such that they, so that they never happen again, and properly pay our respect to all those that suffered at the hands of the Nazi Party, we as a nation, and we as a nation must be very clear. This behaviour is unacceptable. And we will not stand by and let the sickening behaviour go unchecked. And to do so, we run the risk of seeing history repeat itself. To hear words from a man who came close to standing in Parliament last year with the Greens is unconscionable. Such rhetoric only poisons and coarsens the public debate. And the Greens should immediately take steps to remove him from the party. To quote uh, um, uh, Mr Burnside, when he met with Holocaust survivor Moshe Fisman a couple of years ago, said that he would never make comments like this again. Yet just last month, he did so once more. I want to make my position known to this chamber <clears throat> and to the uh, people of Australia that anti-Semitism has no place in Australia. And I'll do everything in my power to ensure it is stamped out. As I've said many times in this chamber, Australia has no place for racism, and anti-Semitism is just another form of racism. My concern that the misuse of such events to portray one's own misguided views bites at the foundations of democracy and liberty in the country we all call home. Mr Burnside's contempt for decency clearly shows that he should hand back his AO and that he is not deserved of his QC title. Thank you, Madam Deputy Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Van. Senator Carr. Uh, Madam, uh, Madam Deputy President, um, the government's favourite newspaper, The Australian, advised us on the 30th of July that the Minister for Education is again reported to be worried about threats to free speech on Australia's university campuses. This time his ire was raised by the ANU Student Association which allegedly stopped the ADF and an anti-abortion group from setting up stalls on the association's market day. Now, the facts are hazy. The ANU student news from paper um, were only reported that the group had been excluded, but the student association says that these organisations hadn't applied and therefore weren't excluded. Now, this lack of clarity did not, however, worry the minister. He has threatened to cut funding from student organisations that try to suppress the expression of opinion they do not share. Now, Mr Trudge acknowledges this may be difficult because if a student union is a, a, is a legal entity separate from the university, it does not, it's not covered by the free speech definitions added to the Higher Education Support Act earlier this year. Nor conditions be, can be placed on direct grants because student unions don't receive them. The Commonwealth does lend money to students to pay their amenities fees, and the government could consider legislation to attach conditions to these loans. And if the minister goes that far, it will be because the government's resolve to invent what the review by the former Chief Justice, uh, Robert French, could not find a free speech crisis on Australian campuses. This obsession with a confected crisis is a complete contradiction to the genuine threat to academic freedom that is of the government's own making. The Australian Research Council, which assesses the merits of application for research grants, has been co-opted into a smear campaign that questions the integrity and the loyalty of rep reputable academics. Now, some people believe that McCarthyism, you know, that is the casting of doubt without evidence on the loyalties of people in public life, was dead and buried in the last Cold War. Well, maybe we wish that was so. But this label fits the way Australia's most important research funding institution has been low, has been now browbeaten into putting supposedly national security concerns ahead of academic excellence. In the last round of Senate estimates, the Australian Research Council CEO, Professor Sue Thomas, admitted that the Australian Research Council collects information on what she calls sensitivities, which could be added to the personal records of grant applicants. So the ARC is now keeping dossiers on the, what they perceive to be 
the political uh, application or uh, views of applicants. Now, what sources uh, I say we rightfully describe these as the sensitivity files within the Australian Research Councils. But so it's not only advice by the security agency, but scans of media reports and data from dubious uh, the China University tracker maintained by the Australian uh, Centre for Policy Institute, ASPE. In other words, a slanderous newspaper article and a software program that run by ASPE, which in itself has a disclaimer on the use of that tracker, warns that it should not be taken as evidence of wrongdoing, can now be used to sway the judgment of the Minister for Education when authorising grant applications. Now, this process led to 18 applications being withheld for approval in the October 2020 round of research grants pending security agency advice. Ultimately, 13 of these grants were approved, but five applicants were vetoed without explanation by the then minister, Mr Tian, on his way out the door on his last day in office in that portfolio. Answers to questions on notice indicate that the announcement of the veto was made, as I say, on the very afternoon uh, of the minister's tenure in the office. Mr Tian was set a new benchmark for mopping up loose ends. Now, how has it come to this? Hunting spies and traitors is not the Australian Research Council's job. And its willingness to dabble in that role can only contribute further to the baseless smearing of distinguished academics, many with global reputations, that has become such a repellent feature of recent news reporting. In August, on August 24, 2020, the Australian published the names of more than uh, 30 researchers who were supposedly complicit in the economic sabotage, or economic espionage, I think was the exact words they used, of this country. There was no substance to that allegation. In an answer to the question on notice from the Australian Research Council, has confirmed that all 31 of the alleged uh, allegations relating to the researchers on an ARC grant have been resolved. In other words, no breaches of national security were found. In the same answer, the Australian Research Council stated there were three issues relating to two researchers were identified and action taken. This answer didn't explain what those issues were. But Mr. Uh, Professor Thomas' admission the ARC maintained sensitivity files came after she answered no to a question that were routinely asked at Senate estimates. Has any Australian university breached the Defence Trade Controls Act? Now, if you think about the number of applications within this parliament by members of parliament for support for travel that have required resolution of those uh, applications, then there will be considerably more than the number of issues raised through the Australian Research Council. The Australian Research Council, to the, to the question, has there been uh, has, has the answer is no, confirming that the strict procedures laid down in the Act are working in regard to this, the Defence Control Act. Now, under the Act, universities work closely with the Defence Department to prevent the sharing of information with international co collaborators if that work poses a risk to our national security. But you won't read that in the newspapers, nor will a correction whose baseless smears be found in the Australian. Despite the rigorous processes that have been intent on inciting this new Cold War, continue to be argued as if the collaborations in themselves were dangerous. This has led to the creation of ASPE's Dodger Tracker, and led to a spate of media reports that vilified prominent academics without providing a shred of evidence that they have engaged in anything that could be described as espionage, let alone treason. And I might remind the chamber, despite the fact that collaboration with international agencies is in fact government policy, 
All this has been suited to an agenda of sections of the government, which has, throughout its tenure in office, has engaged in undermining the Australia, Australia's higher education system. The coalition's attitude has been expressed not only through the funding cuts and bias about different types of research, uh, which they say, of course, it doesn't turn a quick dollar, but through its campaigns through confected free speech crises that they've developed in, the, in various campuses. Now, nothing could be more likely, however, to inhibit academic freedom and free speech than the knowledge that the principal research funding body is collecting personal information on academics that a minister might use to support the rejection of a grant application. Information that cannot be subject to refutation by the applicant themselves. Information that is not subject to due process or procedural fairness. This is the type of fear-mongering attitude that prevailed in the heyday of McCarthyism in the United States in the 1950s. The ARC risked damaging its own reputation by becoming complicit in the scaremongering of the new Cold War warriors. It's supposed to be a non-partisan body that makes recommendations on the academic excellence of research projects. Its attitudes and behaviour is not compatible with compiling so-called sensitivity dossiers on some of our leading academics and operating in Australia at the moment. Thank you, uh, Senator Carr. I think we've got Senator Thorpe on remote. Senator Thorpe. Yes. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise today to make a very important statement, something that I didn't think I would need to spell out and highlight to the parliament of this country in 2021. But here we are. Children do best when they are in loving and caring environments and have access to great healthcare, education and community sport. Support and sport. Uh, but, you know, in the land of Oz, that's not afforded to everybody, especially uh, those that are from the age of 10 years old. Children as young as 10 are being thrown in jail in Australia for low level offences, like stealing a chocolate bar or having a bite of the friend's chocolate bar. Having such a low age of legal responsibility is impacting First Nations children the most. Separating children from their families, communities, education, and for First Nations children, their culture and their connection is causing lasting damage to our youngest. Our young people are our future, right? But this government, this country, locks our young people up and makes them more likely to get trapped in the quicksand of the criminal legal system before they've reached their teenage years. Research shows that when someone enters the quicksand of the criminal legal system, the system makes it incredibly difficult to escape. Children belong in schools and playgrounds, connected to their families, communities and culture, not placed in handcuffs, held in watch houses and locked away in prisons. In just one year across this country, close to 600 children aged 10 to 13 years were locked up. 600 children in one year from 10 to 13 locked up and thousands more were hauled through the criminal legal system. Really? These are children. Children that we are keeping in jails in this country. Some of these children still have baby teeth. Where's their tooth fairy? What, the prison guard? Absolutely disgusting. 
It's disgusting that we have people in this place and the Victorian government who continue to lock up these babies that still have baby teeth. For all those parents in this chamber, what if this was your child? Think about that. There's been a chorus of calls from both nationally and internationally from First Nations organisations and advocates, expert United Nations bodies, human rights organisations, medical and legal bodies and academics for this country to raise the minimum age of legal responsibility. You, you talk about medical science and COVID and you come up with all the evidence around coal-fired power stations and how great they are, but you decide what evidence you choose. And in this case, you don't care that 10-year-old children with baby teeth are being incarcerated at the rate that they are in this country. Children need to be loved and supported so they can reach their full potential, not locked up. It's now just over a year since the meeting of Attorneys General, which is what it's called now, they decided to maybe, possibly, somehow do something about our low level of legal responsibility. So they talked and talked and talked. And what did they do? They scrapped it. They took it off the priority list. This do nothing Morrison government recently defied calls from 31 United Nations member states to raise the age. Shame on this country. Shame on the Morrison government. Imagine being the government that was happy to let children as young as 10, children that are nowhere near developing so much so that they still have baby teeth to go to jail. Just cowards. Is it cowards or what is it? What kind of people do this in this country? I'm proud to be in a party that is committed to raising the age of legal responsibility from 10 to 14 as a matter of urgency. We will see so many children released back to their families and communities and in programs that make them people that they want to be. Raising the age of legal responsibility has been identified as an area of urgent, urgent reform to ensure the physical, psychological health of children and their families and their community. Instead of jailing children for minor crimes, we would support children to get back on the right path through culturally safe and supportive diversionary programs, as well as supportive bail and community correction programs to divert people away from prison. No matter who we are, the legal system needs to protect all of us equally. Our legal system fails too many people. How was the legal system, you know, uh, invented in the first place? Based on colonisation, patriarchy, lock them all up, especially the black ones. It fails First Nations people regularly and the consequences can be a matter of life or death. And we know that, right? Death in custody. Everyone doesn't want to talk about that big elephant in the room. The system is too expensive, too hard to access, and often it's simply racist. Children as young as 10 can be imprisoned, and overwhelmingly, we know that they are First Nations kids. We know that they are black kids. And who cares about them in this country? On the 30th anniversary of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, this government is pushing back on working with First Nations families and activists who have had a loved one die in custody to implement all of the outstanding recommendations. And we know the, the uh, rhetoric that the government throws out on that. Don't buy it. It's not working. Implement them all. Millions of Australians are locked down, locked into poverty and locked out of an affordable home because of this do-nothing Morrison government and our people are dying on their watch. You have blood on your hands, Morrison. They don't care about us or you. They don't care about anyone but themselves because they're so privileged and colonised 
that they would know what it's like to have to struggle and put food on the table. In my home state of Victoria, Premier Andrews has presided over a cruel criminal legal system also that punishes blackfellas again instead of protecting them. On the 30th anniversary of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, the Andrews Labor government declared that, I quote, too many Aboriginal Victorians are still dying in custody. Too many Aboriginal Victorians are in custody in the first place, end quote. And yet, the Andrews government, like the Morrison government, is hardly a helpless bystander, right? This is entirely predictable tragedy. The Andrews Labor government is the main contributor to this ongoing crisis also. The Royal Commission recommended, and I quote, that governments in conjunction with Aboriginal legal services and police services give consideration to amending failed legislation, to revise any criteria which inappropriately restrict the granting of bail to Aboriginal people, end quote. The Andrews Labor government is doing the complete opposite. The Andrews bail laws are inappropriately restricting and the granting of bail to First Nations people in Victoria. The Andrews government bail laws ensure that imprisonment is not used as a sanction of last resort. And as a result, from 2010 to 2020, imprisonment of women rose 174% compared to the 81% increase in the male population. And more than half the women now in prison have not been sentenced. Think of that for a moment. Half of the women, our women, imprisoned in Victoria, have not been sentenced for a crime. They don't have their babies with them either. Sani the Thorpe, your time has expired. And I will remind all senators to address those from the other place by their correct titles. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Acting, Acting Deputy President. Uh, look, I rise today with a massive sense of frustration. Throughout COVID, hundreds of families across regional and remote Australia commence each school term with a great sense of trepidation, not knowing whether the child they are sending off to boarding school or university will be caught on the wrong side of a border due to a sudden state lockdown. It was 12 months ago that I rose in this chamber to tell the story of Barney and Charlie Mort, who had been caught up in just such a lockdown in Victoria with their parents a thousand kilometres away, northwest of Burke. Through negotiation with the state agencies, we managed to get Barney and Charlie home via a common sense route, via a direct route with a COVID safe plan that enabled them to drive from their school to their home, avoiding all COVID hotspots, wearing a mask, stopping only at set locations for fuel, and they got home safely. Unfortunately, we are still hearing stories of children getting caught up in lockdowns every term, every time there's a new lockdown. We have not learnt from the past experiences. In mid-July, students in Victoria returned to school for the start of term. Many travelled from remote parts of New South Wales. Less than one week later, that state went into a lockdown. Some of those children were able to return home, others not. The schools did everything they ca could to support the students. Students who had to remain in Victoria were supported by the schools, and I congratulate and thank the schools for them. One of the students caught up again was my friend Charlie Mort. And this time it's done him. Charlie, while being supported by the school, is going to see out the remainder of the term and then has decided he cannot take the risk again. He is not going to return to school. Why are we doing this to our students? Why are we doing this to our generation? Year 12 students in Victoria have not attended a full term of school since they started their final two years. Now, I appreciate we are doing all we can to keep our communities safe, but we really need to think seriously about what we're doing to our younger generations. 
and to our regional, rural and remote students who don't get a choice. I'm talking about students who, if they were to attend their closest state school, are looking at upwards of over an hour travel on unsealed roads one way. It is unfeasible for those students to attend a state school. Boarding is their only realistic option. And I, this is not limited to the New South Wales and Victorian state border. We have the same issue in Queensland, although I commend the Queensland government for currently having a border bubble that does allow students living within proximity to the border to cross over and their parents for educational and support purposes. But outside the bubble, if those students are to return home, they've got to isolate. I, uh, I've been raising this, as I said, for 12 months. I wrote to the Prime Minister in January warning that the issue was, remained unresolved as we were entering the 2021 school year. And I again wrote to the Prime Minister just last month. National Cabinet needs to come together and they seriously need to look at this issue. Because each term, as these parents are sending their children across a state border, it seems like we're starting from scratch. We haven't learned from previous lockdowns. We haven't looked at what worked. We haven't looked at the common sense approach that we used for Barney and Charlie last year with a COVID safe travel plan to get them home and ease the minds of parents and children alike. The mental health issues and the impact this is having on our students is immeasurable. I'm getting reports from parents of daily, weekly phone calls from their children expressing concern because of the uncertainty. The Isolated Children's Parents Association have done a lot of work in this area. And, uh, in November last year, they provided a comprehensive submission to the government. That was, uh, it, the hope was that um, it would be implemented for January. We have been calling for consistency from National Cabinet on a number of issues. National Cabinet, very early in the piece, agreed to a national freight initiative to apply a consistent mechanism for our freight and transport companies to be able to cross borders even when there's a lockdown. That has worked. It took a lot longer, it took about six months longer, but finally National Cabinet also agreed on a set of rules to allow agricultural workers to cross borders. And despite some confusion shortly after it was implemented, uh, with a, another lockdown towards the end of last year, it seems to be working, which is great. So it shows that when we have agreement, when we decide on a consistent approach, when the rules are clear and when people know how to apply for an exemption, what rules they must follow to get an exemption, the rules work. Unfortunately, Despite calls from the Isolated Children's Parents Association, from the Australian Boarding Schools Association, from uh, others, we have no such approach to boarding school students. Each term, students going from southwestern New South Wales into South Australia need to review the rules. Often they need to reapply for another exemption. Often they're being told they're not going to get an exemption. They have to go into isolation. In Victoria, the rules change uh, weekly. We've had a border bubble between New South Wales and Victoria. The boundaries of that bubble have recently been adjusted. The reasons for travel within the bubble during the period of lockdown have also changed as recently as last night. There is no consistency in our rules. And I understand the angst that our families have when they're trying to work out what is best 
They all want the best education opportunities for their children, but they all want their children to be safe and well mentally as well as physically. We can now see that until there is a sufficient level of vaccination and confidence in the community, the states will continue to rely on lockdowns as a mechanism to manage the virus in the community. And that is their right. But in the meantime, our rural, regional and remote students should not have to suffer the additional burdens when there are common sense approaches that we can use. We are not talking about sending students from hotspots to hotspots. We are talking about students who are actually happy to isolate on their home farms. Most of these students are farm kids. Most of the families are happy to comply with any COVID safe travel plans that are put in place. So I, I implore National Cabinet to sit down and develop a consistent set of rules that can apply to interstate students, be they boarding school students, be they university students, because this impacts them across the board. I did have a suggestion sent to me uh, via email from a constituent about National Cabinet. And, uh, in, in the email, this constituent said, after each National Cabinet, the Prime Minister comes out and extols about how well it's working, how the robust discussions happen but consensus decisions are made. But then within hours, if not minutes, state premiers return to sniping backhanded comments to each other, create negative media stories and create their own rules. This is the problem that must be resolved. Thank you. Now, Senator Billick on the remote. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Charities and not-for-profits play an important role in our democracy. As organisations that exist solely for the purpose of contributing to the public good, they work at the coalface of many important causes such as welfare, human rights, overseas development assistance and the environment. The expertise they gain through this work makes an important contribution to the public debate and for this contribution, we get better policy outcomes. Some of the most important social reforms in Australia that are now widely embraced and accepted, such as the NDIS, Medicare and marriage equality, were advocated for by charities. Many organisations from the sector and hundreds of my Tasmanian constituents have contacted me to express concern that this important role is now under threat by new regulation. In a case of extreme legislative overreach, the Morrison government has introduced a new regulation which charities say could have a chilling effect on free speech. This regulation will come into effect if not disallowed by the Senate. It has been introduced under the guise of cracking down on charities that break the law. Now, Labor agrees that charities and not-for-profits who break the law should be deregistered. In fact, that's what the current regulations allow. But the government's new regulation goes a lot further than that. The changes that target charities which engage in public events such as protests or vigils at which minor or summary offences could occur. This could be something as simple as blocking a footpath or failing to shut a gate to a private property. Even the mere act of promoting an event at which a summary offence is committed by just one person could result in deregistration. And the Commissioner can even deregister a charity simply because he anticipates a summary offence might be committed. He can anticipate what somebody might be going to do. Charities are going to be bogged down in red tape trying to comply with the new regulation diverting valuable resources into seeking legal advice that should be going towards the important causes that they were established to promote. Under the existing regulations, which already capture charities that are breaking the law, only two, that's right, two of Australia's 59,000 registered charities 
have lost their registration for unacceptable activist activity. So there's no charity crime way gripping the nation, as the, as the um, government would have you believe. And there's no need for this authoritarian regulation. The Charities Commissioner already admitted in Senate estimates that there is no evidence no evidence to support the claim that there is a widespread phenomenon of criminals masquerading as activists. This proposed regulation could have a chilling effect on democracy and on free speech. The proposal has already been criticised by a wide range of charities, including welfare organisations and faith groups. The peak community sector body, ACOS, described it as an extreme overreach and an attack on our democracy. So it appears that our Prime Minister, who praises the quiet Australians, preferred charities to be not just quiet, but silent. The Liberals want Australian charities to just be doing their hard, hands-on work in the community, not engaging in activism or any public debate. This government wants charities planting trees and running soup kitchens, but not campaigning for action on climate change or trying to fight the cause of structural inequality. In the Liberal worldview, charities have no place in public debate. Like naughty children, they should be seen but not heard. I worry about the enforcement of this regulation under any charities commission, but it's even more worrisome with the current Commissioner giving his outdated views on so many issues. Mr Johns has said that poor women were being used as cash cows, that Australia is sucking in too many of the wrong type of immigrant and that there is a great deal of impure altruism in the charity sector. It's bad enough giving anyone such extraordinary and far-reaching powers without putting them in the hands of someone as irresponsible with his public statements as Mr Johns. This regulation is the kind of attack we've come to expect from a government that is at war with charities. They declared that war in 2014, less than a year after coming to power, with attempts to scrap the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission. And when they failed to pass that legislation to shut down the ACNC, they appointed a commissioner who had a history of openly criticising charities an appointment that was described by some as bizarre. The new government's regulation is one of many attempts to silence the sector and to stop them from legitimately participating in public debate. This government has put the gag clauses in social services agreements with charities. They've attempted to shut down the ability of charities to advocate and they tried to extend to charities the ban on foreign donations to political parties. For years, they've dragged their feet on harmonising charity fundraising laws, continuing to allow charities to be tied up in the red tape of complying with a myriad of conflicting and outdated laws. Charities have been established to promote social, economic and environmental good. When they participate in public debate, they do so on behalf of the poorest, most disadvantaged, most vulnerable people in our society. Those who usually don't have the power, the wealth and the connections to fight for themselves. Charities give a voice to the voiceless. So when charities suffer, people suffer too. And that's why the government's war on charities must end. Australia needs a government that's on the side of the Australian charities, not one that is working against them. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Billick. Senator Hanson, also on the remote, you have the call. I have, thank you very much. I rise to speak on the divisive and racist campaigns promoting the legislation of an Indigenous voice to Parliament and the specific recognition of an Indigenous people in the Australian Constitution. Our Constitution is a great achievement. It reflects the establishment of a great nation. The people of distant colonies gathered together in the 1890s and drafted a constitution which has mostly served the nation very well over the past 130 years. This is remarkable because the architects of the constitution could not foresee many of the events and developments that would shape Australia and change how it was governed. In the 
1890s, travel between the colonies took days. Today, it takes hours. Communication was mostly by letter, which also took days. For the majority of Australians at the time, sending the message over the telegraph was too expensive. And in the 1890s, Indigenous Australians weren't recognised as citizens. They didn't participate in the constitutional conventions and they weren't eligible to vote in the referenda held by each colony to approve the constitution. In 1967, of course, Australians voted strongly in favour of removing racist elements of the constitution that were specific about Indigenous people. This historic referendum meant remove, removing the reference to the Aboriginal race in section 51 of the constitution and altogether remove section 127 so that Indigenous Australians could be counted in the national census. As a result, the constitution today is colour blind. Every Australian adult is equal under the constitution regardless of their race. That's the way it should be. Equality before the law is one of the most important foundations of a democracy. Without it, there is no democracy. One adult, one vote. It's the only way that's free and fair. There have been 44 referenda held to change our constitution and the 1967 referendum is the most well known. It was a catalyst for many changes in how Australia treated Aborigines. And it was also remarkable for the 90% vote in favour of change because few referenda are ever passed. The campaigns for specific Indigenous recognition in our constitution threaten to undo this tremendous achievement. They place at risk the positive steps taken towards reconciliation since that historic moment. They seek to make our constitution a racist document once more by again signalling out a specific race of people to be treated differently than other Australians. That isn't progress, it's regression. Noel Pearson says constitutional recognition is needed because he believes Australia does not recognise its Indigenous peoples. That simply isn't true. Flags representing Indigenous Australians are flown everywhere. It seems you can't even start a meeting in Australia without formally acknowledging Indigenous people and you can't hold an event without paying for a welcome to country ceremony. Our children learn about Indigenous Australia in school, even learning to speak Indigenous languages. They're also being taught critical race theory so they feel guilt and shame for being white. Canberra, the nation's capital, gets its name from an Indigenous word. Many other places in Australia do too. Some iconic locations have even had their names changed to Indigenous words. We don't call it Ayers Rock anymore and we're not allowed to climb it anymore. Our anthem was also recently changed in recognition of Indigenous sensitivities. We have ministers and whole government departments dedicated to Aboriginal affairs. Buckets of taxpayer money are spent directly on Indigenous people. It's around $44,000 per Indigenous Australian, while it's only around $24,000 per non-Indigenous Australian. We even have the Closing the Gap report delivered by the Prime Minister each year to report on Indigenous progress against national benchmarks, or more accurately, the lack of progress despite the many billions of dollars thrown at the issue. To suggest Australia doesn't already recognise its Indigenous people is ridiculous. In fact, the Constitution itself already recognises Indigenous people without referring to them specifically. The Constitution has many references to the people and electors. Today, that means every voting adult in Australia, Indigenous or otherwise. The question which everyone is avoiding is this. Who will be eligible to vote for delegates in the proposed voice? Since 1971, the number of people identifying as Indigenous in the national census has risen from approximately 116,000 to 800,000. It's an increase of 590%. Is that how Indigenous eligibility will be decided by people ticking a box in a survey? Let me enlighten a lot of people about the working definition of an Indigenous person used by Australian governments. Aboriginal means a person who is a member of the Aboriginal race of Australia, identifies as an Aboriginal and is accepted 
by the Aboriginal community as an Aboriginal. If this is the working definition, it's no wonder so many more people are identifying as Indigenous to claim the benefits this government provides exclusively to Indigenous people. How will eligibility be defined and nepotism stopped in its tracks for electing the voice? We must also remember that elected representation exclusively for Aboriginal people has been tried before. In my first speech in this building 25 years ago, I highlighted the failures of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission and called for it to be abolished. ADSIC was dis dysfunctional, corrupt and rife with the nepotism and lack of accountability which still plagues the Aboriginal industry today. It took another eight long, unproductive years for the coalition government to realise these failures and abolish ADSIC with bipartisan support. To this day, I'm hearing from the true Indigenous people who are crying out for the industry to be audited and held accountable for the billions of dollars it has wasted for no real tangible benefits to them or improvements to the conditions in which they live. If a voice to parliament is placed in our constitution, Australians won't have the option to abolish it like was done with ATSIC. It's no wonder the unaccountable Aboriginal industry is campaigning for it. But some feedback from the consultation process suggests many are sceptical that recognition or a voice to parliament will do anything to make a practical difference in their lives. Many of us want policies which deliver practical outcomes that make a positive difference for Aborigines, not more of the same failures and not more of the same useless symbolism. That's where the focus of this parliament should be. Those politicians in this place campaigning for a constitutional voice to parliament for Indigenous people seem to forget there are already 227 voices representing Indigenous people in this parliament, let alone those who identify as Aboriginal, including one who is a Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. If you think more representation in parliament is needed for Indigenous people, then you haven't been doing your jobs representing them. You're not listening to Indigenous people, or for that matter, the rest of your constituents. They're becoming fatigued by a reconciliation process with no real progress and no end in sight. They're tired of being unfairly shamed as racist colonists, colonial occupiers. They're becoming cynical at an Aboriginal industry only interested in money, power, division and fostering a culture of perpetual victimhood. They understand that what Indigenous people need is empowerment, not as a race, but as individuals to address their own disadvantage. This means an education and opportunities which enable them to fully participate in the national economy and in Australian society. Where taxpayer support is needed to help make this happen, it should be provided based on an individual's need and not on the skin colour. It's not the dream of Martin Luther King Jr that people will be judged on the content of their character, not the colour of their skin. Finally, a note of warning. If we recognise prior Indigenous ownership in the Constitution and then one day become a republic, the High Court could be forced to rule the Crown's former sovereignty over Australia only belongs to Indigenous people as native title holders rather than every Australian. With 32% of Australia already under native title, is that the outcome we really want? No. Australia belongs to every Australian. Indigenous people, the early convicts and settlers and the many migrants who came here from all over the world have all contributed to the success story of Australia. Australia belongs to all of us. As that great Australian export, Paul Hogan said in Crocodile Dundee, Aborigines don't own the land, they belong to it. It's like their mother. See those rocks? Been standing there for 600 million years. Still be there when you and I are gone. So arguing over who owns them is like two fleas over, arguing over who owns the dog they live on. Senator it's our Hanson. nation together. Senator That's Hanson. what one nation stands for. Your time has expired. You. Senator McMahon. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise today to discuss the enormous potential of the Beetaloo Basin in the Northern Territory. There is growing frustrate, frustration amongst those of us who take a more reasoned approach to debate around resource development and combating climate change through sensible rather than hysterical debate. For years now, the doomsday soothsayers have talked about the world ending. They have talked about the single greatest crisis facing humanity, 
They have told those of us who disagree with them and don't fall into line that we are all going to hell in a handbasket. And they have told us that if we dare challenge their thinking, then we are a deniest. We are not worthy thinkers. I find that to be so condescending from a group of people who also champion free speech. I guess it is free speech as long as the speech is in agreement with those views. Today, the front page of the NT News was headlined Battery Investment – Half a Million Dollars to Supercharge NT Battery Manufacturing. It stated, the Northern Territory Government has announced a $500,000 grant to turbocharge investment in battery research and manufacturing. The Territory's plentiful natural resources are also expected to become attractive to the growing battery sector, which is expected to play a crucial role in the globe's transition to renewable energy. Do we see the irony of that statement, Mr Acting Deputy President? Transition to rural energy is reliant on the NT's natural resources. Mr Acting Deputy President, given the current public debate about investing in fossil fuels, it occurs to me that this is a classic case of applying the animal farm mentality. And that is, if you, you support government spending money in areas as long as it fits with your resource development philosophy. The fossil fuel industry is not evil. It doesn't matter if we're talking about intermittent generators, oil and gas, coal or even nuclear. They all have a role to play in the future energy needs of the world and they have an even bigger role to play in the manufacturing sector, something the government is currently trying to turbocharge. Mr Acting Deputy President, here is the absolute irony of the opposition to fossil fuel development. You might be able to keep the lights on using renewable energy, but you won't be able to manufacture or supply a wide range of products that modern society depends upon. Now, the lefties would have you believe that we can simply replace oil and gas with so-called renewables or intermittent generators. But we all know and understand that the use of intermittent generators requires firming. That is a source of power to provide power when the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow. Now, from my maiden speech, I indicated my support for a nuclear industry. I even spoke about this yesterday. I'm even more resolute now. If we are to have a zero emissions target, forced onto us, then nuclear will have to be part of the mix. It cannot be avoided. And here is a stark comparison of nuclear versus an intermittent generator such as solar. In the Northern Territory, there has been a heap of talk around the Sun Cable project. Sun Cable is located in the Bedwaloose Basin area, which is known for its cattle as much as its gas. Sun Cable will occupy 12,000 hectares. At full capacity, under ideal conditions, that is, no dust and temperatures under 24 degrees and full sunshine, occupying the 12,000 hectares, it will generate 14,000 megawatts. The plan is to sell this power to Singapore. So, 12,000 hectares, 14,000 megawatts. If we compare this to New Scale, a small modular nuclear reactor, which has been the first to receive US regulatory final safety evaluation, this will produce 1,000 megawatts continuously, 24-7, on 18 hectares. Sun Cable is 47 times the size of new scale in land area to produce similar output if operating 24-7, uh, which it would be, be lucky to do for about one third of the time. Uh, many of those opposite uh, and all of the disarray in the corner 
would have us use no fossil fuels for anything ever. And you could say, well, if we have intermittent generators backed up by nuclear power, why would we need to? Well, again, the irony here is that intermittent generators and even power stations themselves are constructed with products of the oil and gas industry. These products are used for a very wide number of products that modern society simply could not do without. Things like plastics, fibres, rubber, explosives, solvents and a whole range of industrial chemicals. Methane, ethane, propane are all products of the oil and gas industry and available in the Beedaloo Basin. Basin. Imagine, even in this chamber, if all these products suddenly disappeared. There would go the carpet, there would go the glasses that you're wearing on your head, there would go some people's clothes. Um, phones, tablets, computers, shoes, a whole range of products that we use and rely on would simply not exist. Not to mention some very vital uses of these products, such as in um, medicine, food production, agriculture, vet science. In medicine, everything from syringes to implants to highly complex life-saving machinery relies on products of the oil and gas industry. We simply could not do without this industry. We may well be able to generate power from other sources, ironically, made from the oil and gas industry precursor products, um, but there's a whole range of things that we take for granted in our modern society that we simply wouldn't be able to do. How many lives would be lost? We talk about losing lives from COVID-19, and yes, every single life is a tragedy. How many more lives would be lost if we didn't have access to modern medical products? Even something as simple as go and getting the so-called jab for COVID-19 requires the use of a needle and a syringe made from, you guessed it, products of the oil and gas industry. Every single time you go into hospital, there are thousands of products used in procedures, used in preparation for procedures, used after procedures for uh, every single operation or um, intervention that's done on a person, thousands and thousands of products of the oil and gas industry. If we clicked our fingers tomorrow and wiped out those products, then how many hundreds of thousands of mil and millions of people would die? I, I would put it to you that there is not a single person in Australia and around most of the world that doesn't use products of the oil and gas industry, apart from power, in their lives almost every single day. So this is the great importance of the Beedaloo Basin. Sure, the Northern Territory has plenty of uranium. We can generate nuclear power for uh, many thousands of years to come. But what we have is even more valuable in the capacity to produce the products that everyday Australians and, in fact, everyone around the world relies on for modern life. Unless we want to go back to living in a cave and belting animals over the heads with clubs, we need products of the oil and gas industry. And that is the true benefit of the Beedaloo Basin. Senator Walsh, on the remote, you have the call. Yes, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, over the last few years of this Morrison government, we have seen time and again that it acts too little and too late. Now, Prime Minister Morrison wants Australians to make up for his lost time on the vaccine rollout and go for gold. When it comes down to it, in almost everything that would benefit 
Australians, Mr Morrison makes sure that we are last out of the blocks. There's always excuses, there's always blame, there's always something that this government uses to justify its inaction. It's complacency, it's failures, and in the case of the vaccine rollout, the government's inaction, complacency and failures have had devastating consequences. If the vaccine rollout was a Liberal Party pet project in a marginal seat, you could bet your house on this government winning gold. There would be colour-coded spreadsheets. The Prime Minister would take charge. Uh, in fact, he would be the captain, the coach, uh, and the main player. The vaccines would be out the door as fast as a Liberal Party promise. They'd be into people's arms as fast as a prime ministerial dash to a press conference. But the vaccine rollout is not a Liberal Party pet project. It's a national program that needs to be run to benefit all of us with a plan, with energy, with commitment, with leadership. And without any of those things from this government, we are running last in the race, last in the OECD, and running something like 80th in the world. We are nowhere near the podium when it comes to the race to be vaccinated. We are not even close to qualifying for the main event. But Prime Minister Morrison has sought to spin the fact that we were at the front of the queue, that it wasn't a race. The truth is, he didn't do his job when he needed to. And now Australians have lost ground. We've lost the ground that we gained last year through so much hard work and so much sacrifice. We've lost the ground that we gained through the hard work of all Australians to lock down, to follow the rules and to stay safe. The Prime Minister has squandered our lead. He squandered the advantage that we had with his failure to roll out the vaccine. We are coming last in the developed world and Australians are paying the price today. Australians who last year did their job, Australians who are doing their job again under the incredible pressure of lockdowns and restrictions. They're staying home, they're getting tested, they're missing time with family and friends. And now, eight months into 2021, the Prime Minister finally does admit, does admit that it is a race. He finally wants to claim a gold medal uh, and race us to the end of the year. Well, Prime Minister, I don't think there's going to be a gold medal waiting for you at the finish line. Australians deserve so much better. They deserve a government that truly cares about keeping them safe and getting them through this pandemic. We should have had multiple vaccines secured and enough vaccines secured because Prime Minister Morrison's incompetence led to a devastating over-reliance on just one vaccine. We should have had purpose-built quarantine up and running because Prime Minister Morrison's claim that hotel quarantine is 99.9% .9 effective, that has to be one of the biggest leaps uh, in marketing history. And we should have had an objective and neutral response from the Prime Minister to lockdowns because Prime Minister Morrison's refusal to accept going hard and going early on lockdowns and his determination to politicise state lockdowns is clearly costing us dearly now. Australians have had to wait time and again for Prime Minister Morrison to backflip into doing the right thing, the right thing that Australians and Labor have called on him to do time and again. And that waiting has been disastrous, waiting on him to backflip into financial support for struggling workers and businesses, waiting on him to backflip into supporting short and sharp lockdowns to control the spread of the virus, waiting on him to backflip into picking up the phone and getting more Pfizer delivered into our country. Now we're waiting on him to perform his next backflip 
We're waiting on him to backflip into supporting incentives to get more Australians rolling up their sleeves and getting the jab. The backflip, now that is an event where this Prime Minister would win a gold medal. Why is the Prime Minister so incapable of hearing what is needed and acting in a timely and effective manner? Why does he insist on being dragged, kicking and screaming into any form of action? Why does he struggle so hard to admit his mistakes and learn from them? These are not the hallmarks of a real leader. They are the hallmarks of someone who just does not care. Who does not care about the lives and livelihoods of the people he is supposed to stand up for, the people that he is supposed to fight for each and every single day? Now, Australians trusted that this government would keep them safe. Australians trusted that they would get a good supply of vaccines and have them ready by the start of this year. Australians trusted that this government wouldn't leave them like sitting ducks waiting for the next outbreak of this virus. And this government failed. They failed. And no matter how the Morrison government tries to spin it, they have failed to keep Australians safe. And that is their core responsibility. The Prime Minister says it's time to go for gold, but time and time again, he has left Australians running last. Mr Morrison said Australia was at the front of the queue. What a load of spin. What a load of absolute spin. Then when he had to front up and say we were in fact right at the back of the line, he decided to say that it's not a race. Now he's trying to spin that statement uh, and tell us that it was in the context of getting vaccines approved safely in this country. But the truth is that Prime Minister Morrison said it wasn't a race well after approvals for the vaccines had already been secured. The truth matters. It matters every single day. It certainly matters in a pandemic, but it doesn't seem to matter to this Prime Minister. We all know far too well now that it always was a race, that it is a race today, and that it's a race that Prime Minister Morrison has been losing for all of us, with Australians paying the price. Bad decision after bad decision has been made, interspersed with only non-decisions and with complacency. The advice was to buy multiple vaccines, but it seems that the Prime Minister told Pfizer where to go, and they went. They went to the rest of the world with their vaccine. Instead, he put all the eggs into the AstraZeneca basket. He didn't spread the risk, he didn't plan, and Australians have been left behind. Left behind the rest of the world, left exposed to this new deadly strain of the virus, left out in the cold again, locked down, quarantining, isolating, staying home, all because Scott Morrison, Prime Minister Morrison, did not roll out the vaccine. We have consistently ranked the worst in the world for the vaccine rollout. More than 80 countries are ahead of us, 80 countries today, as the Delta strain tries to spread itself across our country. Only 15% of us are vaccinated. What an absolute disgrace, 15%. Scott Morrison has failed the vaccine rollout and failed to protect Australians against this highly infectious variant. And so after all of this, now he tells us to go for gold. He tells the Australian people to go for gold, to make up for his lost time. What an absolute disgrace. What a disgrace. I didn't do my job, he says, but now you should get on board and get in the race. That is his message for the Australian people. And how we can think that his weak apology can make up for these astronomical failures is just beyond me. How he thinks he can say, oops, my bad, and expect Australians to move Thank on you, from Senator Walsh, your time has expired. Your time has expired. Senator Dean Smith. afternoon uh, to talk about an issue in our community that has gone from being very, very invisible to one that has gone to being very, very visible. 
And at the outset, I'd just like to congratulate this Australian Senate chamber, uh, senators in this place, but indeed members of parliament across the country have, have, have sought to consistently draw greater attention to the very, very real issue of grandparents raising grandchildren in our community. And in particular, I would like to draw attention to what I think is a very, very important and critical report, A Fairer Future for Grandchildren, Understanding the Impact of the Caring Role on Grandparents Raising Their Grandchildren, a report that is being prepared by Wansley in Western Australia, supported by Edith Cowan University from Western Australia and supported by Curtin University, again from Western Australia. I am delighted to have been on the research advisory group for that meeting. I'll be the first one to admit that I didn't get an opportunity to attend every meeting, but uh, they did know my very, very keen interest in drawing attention to this issue, but also in developing a plan for future action. I just want to sh share with the Australian Senate uh, a number of what I think are very, very critical statistics that come from that report that really do remind us of how critically important this issue is. 44 per cent of grandparent carers in Western Australia are single and most often women. 70 per cent of families have grandmother as the primary or sole carer. 77 per cent are 50 to 69-year-olds. One to two more grandchildren are raised by Aboriginal grandparent carers. But let's just think about the grandchildren. The report reminds us 50 per cent have come into care due to parent alcohol and or drug use. 12 per cent lived with their grandparents for longer than 10 years. 16 per cent entered informal care of their grandparents aged 10 to 14 years. 20 per cent came into care aged one year or less. But this is the image I would like people to think about when I remind them of these statistics. Think about the statistics not as numbers but of an image. 70 per cent of grandparent carers are 50 to 69 years of age, 44 per cent of them are single, most often women, and 20 per cent care of grandchildren Thank come you, into Senator the Smith, care. Your time has expired. We'll now proceed to two-minute statements, and I'll call Senator Walsh remotely again. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, Prime Minister Morrison took a baby step recently. He actually said sorry for the failures in his vaccine rollout, sort of. Prime Minister Morrison said, I'm certainly sorry we haven't been able to achieve the marks that we hoped for at the beginning of this year. Not I'm sorry I failed to pick up the phone and get the vaccines that we needed when we needed them. Not I'm sorry I insisted getting Australians vaccinated wasn't a race. Not, I'm sorry that my inaction has meant millions of Australians have been in lockdowns this year. And not, I'm sorry for the hurt and harm that I have caused the Australian people. Prime Minister Morrison's apology just doesn't quite cut it. It doesn't cut it for all the Australians who've had to close their businesses. It doesn't cut it for all the Australians who've lost their jobs. It doesn't cut it for all the Australians who can't see their families and friends today due to the Morrison lockdowns. But our Prime Minister doesn't know how to give a real apology. So I have some tips for him, and I suspect they may come in handy in the future. Prime Minister, a real apology isn't followed up by a but. A real apology comes from the heart. You actually need to mean it. A real apology acknowledges and accepts the damage that you caused without excuses. You don't downplay your mistakes and you certainly don't blame others for your failures. That is how you give a real apology. That is the apology the Prime Minister owes Australians and sadly it's the apology they will never hear from this Prime Minister. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. The great Roman writer Jovenel once asked, who will judge the judges? Well, today the question needs to be asked, who will audit the Auditor General? And why do I ask that question? Because the Auditor General is refusing to hand over minutes of meetings between his staff and the staff in the Infrastructure Department about the purchase of Leppington Triangle. 
And why does that matter? Because audits are all about transparency, and the Auditor General himself needs to practice what he preaches. You see, he has been very critical of government record keeping, but yet when I asked in a question on notice and estimates for, record, for uh, records of their record keeping of the correspondence, they are refusing to hand it over. And I quote, the audit office does not release specific items of audit evidence that were not included in the audit report, as the public interest benefit in the audit office providing the audit evidence is outweighed by the potential for public interest harm. What a load of tosh. Public interest harm? Give me a break. Why is the audit office engaging in a gross cover-up? Is it to try and hide their incompetence at the grossly misleading report on the Leppington Triangle where they made a fundamental error of fact in placing the triangle outside the airport zone, failed to take into account the benefits outlined in a report showing that the airport would contribute $32 billion to GDP by 2060 and create 70,000 jobs, and ignore AASB 13 that said non-financial assets must be valued at the highest and best use by market participants regardless of intent, and ignore case law that has repeatedly ruled that land must be purchased for its highest and best use. The Auditor-General has misled the people of Australia by using incorrect zoning and averaging the lowest valuations rather than using the highest valuation in order to smear the government and stop the construction you, of nation-building infrastructure. McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, Labor's up utter capitulation on tax policy is so saddening and so devastating for the millions of Australians who believe in progressive taxation and economic fairness. By backing in the stage three income tax cuts, negative gearing and the capital gains tax discount, Labor has ensured that no matter who wins the next election, economic inequality will keep spiralling, the rich will keep getting richer and for everyone else, the hope that they can enjoy their fair share of prosperity will ebb away even more quickly than it already is. We'll see cuts to spending on essential services, house prices reaching even more ridiculous heights, more people forced into homelessness and young people, whether they be renters or aspiring homeowners, having to spend even more to have a home. This Labor capitulation follows exactly the same pattern as what they've done on climate change, on public subsidies for burning fossil fuels, on the war on nature, on the torture of refugees, on the descent into a surveillance state. It allows the LNP to lurch Australia even further to the right and further into neoliberalism. The only way that we can break this cycle, and break this cycle we must, is to put the Greens into the balance of power in the House and in the Senate. Turf the current government out and allow the Greens, in balance of power, a position to force a new Labor government to be more progressive and force them to act more strongly and more quickly on climate action and economic inequality. That is what we must do to save our country from the neoliberals. Senator McCarthy, remotely. Thank you. The Copaskilling Islands, part of my Northern Territory electorate, are an unspoilt Indian Ocean paradise. But unfortunately for business operators, the O'Dowd Lu family, their piece of paradise has become bogged in a nightmare of bureaucratic and ministerial negligence. In March this year, the family's business premises, Cocos Autos, was burnt to the ground. It was the only authorised mechanical workshop on the island. And their loss is estimated at over $350,000. And as there is no insurance service provided on the island, it's devastating to any small businesses already feeling the impacts of COVID with a big reduction in tourism related activity. Helen Liu and David O'Dowd have been trying to lease a suitable alternative premises since March with no luck in a place where the landlord is effectively the Commonwealth Government. I raised these issues in estimates and just this week received some scant answers to the many questions I asked. I also wrote to the Assistant Minister for Regional Development and Territories, Nola Marino, urging her to help in finding a suitable new home for Cocos Autos. 
the assistant minister has not bothered to reply or assist the family in any way. They are facing severe financial and personal pressures as they cannot relocate their business. They have lost the majority of their income and have unfortunately had to lay off staff. Their inability to offer a full service to the islands is impacting other businesses and residents who have no alternative for repairs or of automotive equipment. Cocos Islanders deserve so much better than to be ignored by this Morrison government. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. There is no family home on a block of land in the future, according to the Greens, Labor, the Liberal Party and their sellout sidekicks, the Nationals. Not even a five, four or three hundred square metre block on which to raise a family. The next generation will lose access to land entirely. Town planning now is based on everyday Australians being herded into intensive housing bands located away from the elitist inner city bubble. This shepherding together is designed to feed massive new urban rail networks to bring workers, or more accurately, feudal serfs, into central business districts. Once workers, or serfs, catch the train home, inner cities become ghost towns filled with expensive restaurants and rats. Cars are being phased out right now. New housing precincts do not have roads wide enough for, cars to, for two cars to pass. They're being designed for a world where workers do not own cars. Proposed building codes include five storeys with no lift, lower ceilings, thinner walls and narrower corridors, towers built to the four corners of the block and zero green space. Although land is an asset that lasts forever, a cheap and nasty home unit lasts as long as the building does and then owners have nothing. The Greens, Labor and Liberal Nationals say this is all that working Australians deserve. The Morrison government is pumping up house prices to force young families into, into tiny housing expensive housing. How do parents raise happy, healthy children in a, t in a tiny unit tower that's home to 20 other families on a block of land that used to house one family? One Nation rejects this dystopian future, this future of misery, human misery, squalor, oppression, disease and overcrowding. One Nation policies will ensure sensible population growth, building of water and energy capacity and revival of manufacturing for life worth living for all Australians. We will not be divided. We have one flag, we are one community, we are one nation. Thank you. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Last Saturday, July the 31st, was World Rangers Day, where we celebrate the work of rangers around the world in protecting our planet's natural environment. I would like today to acknowledge Australia's Indigenous rangers, uh, who make a significant contribution in protecting Australia's national heritage. The Indigenous Rangers combine traditional knowledge with conservation training to help protect and manage Australia's natural heritage. They undertake a range of important projects, including activities such as bushfire mitigation and the protection of threatened species. They also play a critical role in Australia's national biosecurity system, particularly in northern Australia, where they work to combat exotic pests and diseases as a key part of the Northern Australia Quarantine Strategy. The Morrison government has committed to long-term funding for the Indigenous Ranger program, with Minister for Indigenous Affairs, the Honourable Ken Wyatt MP, announcing an additional $746 million over the next seven years to provide ongoing support for over 80 organisations engaged in land and sea management. This will support 1,900 Indigenous jobs and is a demonstration of the Morrison government's continued commitment to respecting the unique relationship that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have with the land. Examples from my home site include the Midwest Aboriginal Ranger Program uh, in the seat of Jurak and the Spinifex Land Management Rangers in the seat of O'Connor. The benefits offered by this program are clear on true fronts. They achieve broad economic and environmental goals. And we must always remember, in particular, that these programs are occurring in places with a very thin economic base, and yet an essential requirement for ongoing land management services. So this is certainly a win-win situation thank for you, all. Senator Brockman. Senator Griff, remotely. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. In question time yesterday, I asked Senator Reynolds, the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, about the government's response to the Robertson Review. 
That review was prompted by the appalling and tragic death of Anne-Marie Smith after extreme neglect by her NDIS carer. I asked how many of the review's 10 recommendations have been implemented, and the minister took the question on notice. Her response, tabled at the end of question time, shocked me. One year on, one recommendation has been implemented. Just one recommendation. This is simply unacceptable. The Minister must recognise these recommendations are intended to ensure the safety and the dignity of NDIS participants. The implementation of recommendations may be a routine matter for government, a matter of process, but it is not routine for those who depend on the NDIS. For them, it is necessary and it is urgent. We must do better in delivering the changes. Speaking after the death of Ms Smith, the Minister said that no Australian should ever have to die the way that she did. If the Minister genuinely believes this, and I think she does, then I would ask her to get involved, to get seriously involved. Take immediate action to progress these changes and provide comfort and assurance to those who are in our care. They deserve nothing less. Thank you, Senator Grip. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise today to remark on the Global Partnership for Education Replenishment, uh, which happened in London last week, chaired very ably and, and led by the former Prime Minister of our great country, Julia Gillard. Uh, as Benjamin Franklin once said, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. And Australia's investment in that recent GPE replenishment to the amount of $180 million over five years will pay untold dividends in the lives of thousands and thousands of children. While this wasn't the full $70 million per year that was requested by the GPE, nonetheless our contribution will make a great difference. Uh, I want to acknowledge Kevin Andrews as the co-chair of Parliamentary Friends, who with myself uh, as the co-chair garnered the signatures of 40 uh, Australian parliamentarians from both the Senate and the House and all parties and the crossbench to encourage Senator Payne uh, as the Foreign Minister to make this commitment. And I acknowledge the efforts of every single one of those colleagues and I'm very pleased that um, Senator Payne and I thank her for making that important commitment on behalf of the Australian people. Overall, the Global Partnership, uh, the Global Education Summit raised a matter of a no small sum, $4 billion was committed, which is 80 per cent of the target that they sought to reach from countries like Australia making a contribution. I also want to acknowledge 19 heads of states of, of recipient countries who pledged to spend $192 billion of their domestic education budget to boost education outcomes. We know that the money that is invested by Australia will be very significant in changing the life outcomes of uh, young people in our countries, uh, our friends across the Pacific, in particular Vanuatu, Tuvalu, Kiribati, the Solomon Islands and Tonga, to build schools, uh, to make sure education systems are robust and to give ch kids the chance to not only get to school but receive a quality education. Thank you. Senator Steelejohn, remotely. Thank you, Acting uh, Deputy President. This week is National Homelessness Week, and our community here in Perth is in mourning. We in, are in mourning for the death of no less than 56 of our community's members, 56 human beings who lost their life in this last year alone homelessness on the streets of our city. Yesterday there was a vigil held for those who have lost their lives, particularly triggered by the death of Ilana Gala, a First Nations woman who died on the 18th of June outside, uh, after sleeping overnight outside of the Wesley Church here in Perth. As one of the 56 members of our community who we have lost this year, her death triggered an outpouring of grief and a deep desire for action, driven by the knowledge that this housing and homelessness 
crisis that we are suffering through is disproportionately impacting First Nations people. And that of those 56, the average age was just 47 years old. Now we know here in WA that we have the wealth to solve this problem. We know that there are tens of thousands of people on our public housing waiting list. We know that our state is about to register a $5 billion budget surplus. And with that, the Labour and Liberal parties will have run out of excuses for inaction. Our community understands that the existence of homelessness is the result of political in inaction. And in Alana Garlett's name, we demand that Thank action you, is now Steele, taken. John. Time has expired. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to uh, speak briefly on the need for a federal anti-corruption commission. This is a major concern for independence in both houses. The independents continue to keep this issue in the forefront of federal politics through this parliament. Labor has committed to establish a national anti-corruption commission if they are elected to government and advancing proposals to improve governance and transparency in federal grants programs. As for the coalition government, they really are a lost cause as far as the question of integrity is concerned. They have dragged, deliberately dragged their feet on a federal ICAC to make sure one will not be operating during this parliament. The former Attorney General uh, Christian Porter bears a lot of responsibility for this, but ultimately it is the Prime Minister that must be held to account. Why hasn't the government expedited a national anti-corruption commission? The answer is simple. They are politically corrupt. From sports rorts to the pork barrel car parks grants scheme, from dodgy water purchases to politically directed community safety projects, we have seen integrity standards plummet. The Prime Minister is no doubt focused on a new round of pork barrelling for the next election. Of course, notwithstanding Labor's recent good intentions, they have plenty of form, both uh, at the state and federal level. After all, the first sports rorts uh, was Labor Minister Ros Kelly and her infamous uh, whiteboard. Whatever the results of the election, the independents will have to continue to do a lot of hard work in this area. Senator Polly, remotely. The Morrison Liberal government has been criticised for the slow and miscommunicated rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine across Tasmania and Australia, and with good reason. Australia is travelling at a snail's pace with this rollout. We are behind 80 other countries in terms of ranking of vaccination rollouts. If you look at the Australian workforce, frontline workers within the retail sector, transport sectors were not considered to be frontline workers under this old and tired eight-year-old Morrison Liberal government. It was the frontline retail staff at our major supermarkets and retail chains that stood at their checkouts fighting the blunt of this pandemic. It was the truck drivers across the country that delivered the goods that kept Australia moving, whether it was goods for our homes, our businesses and our Australian way of life. Without those truck drivers, we would have come to a complete standstill. And Labor stands side by side with these workers and always will. If you look at the rollout within the aged care sector and the disability sectors, the numbers are distressing to say the very least. People are still dying in this country because of the inactions of not only the Prime Minister, but the Minister for Health, uh, Greg Hunt, through the mishandling of the outbreaks and for the slow rollout of vaccines and the lack of having specialised quarantine uh, facilities. And we also have a dismal vaccine rate for people in disability homes and the disability carers, with only one third currently being vaccinated. Why are these ministers like Senator Colbeck and Minister Hunt still not being held accountable for their failures? I just wish those opposite would treat all Australians fairly and especially Australians who are working on the front line. Thank you, Senator Polly. Senator Faruqi, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It was welcome, but not totally surprising this week, to see that Sky News Australia had been temporarily banned from YouTube for sharing videos involving COVID misinformation. 
It is such a poor reflection on our media and political establishment that this extremist, conspiratorial, racist news channel is still considered normal and acceptable by so many. Only hours after the ban was reported on, the treasurer went on Sky for an interview as if nothing had happened. It is also such poor reflection on our media regulator that YouTube, which notoriously has itself boosted the proliferation of far-right content online, is better at holding Sky News accountable than the actual watchdog. When I joined Parliament, I made a conscious decision not to engage with this far-right, toxic news channel, and I believe that decision has been vindicated time and again. Sky News serves no purpose in our democracy and in fact harms our democracy and makes people in our community less safe. It should be treated as the extremist, dangerous, divisive news channel that it is. Predictably and laughably, Sky News claims to be the victim of so-called cancel culture in all of this. What nonsense! Being held accountable for spreading misinformation and conspiracy theories is not an impingement of your freedom of speech. In fact, the most disappointing aspect of this whole saga has been that it hasn't happened sooner. I could list the dozens of incidents involving racism, soft platforms given to far-right figures, conspiracy theorizing, but these are all on the public record. I hope this week is a turning point for people's tolerance of Sky News. We have to draw a line in the sand somewhere, and it's beyond time that Sky News is held accountable for its extremism and far-right toxicity. Thank you. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Chair. Well, it's well known that here in Australia we have a world-class defence force, arguably one of the best in the world. We have men and women who are proud members of our Air Force, Army and Navy and who serve their country with distinction and honour. The Brereton Report, released last year, brought to light that it was possible a small group of people within our ADF may not have acted in accordance with the values and standards that their fellow servicemen and women uphold so proudly. The transparent and dignified way that our Chief of Defence Force and his leadership team have managed this is a true mark of their strength and integrity. Recently, Defence released its response to the Brereton Inquiry, which sets out a clear and deliberate reform program. The reform program will address past actions and take appropriate action where needed and prevent unwelcome behaviours from occurring again. Out of the 191 findings and 143 recommendations, Defence has accepted all the findings and is committed to addressing all the recommendations made. At times like this, it is also important to remember the work that our ADF do. Their clear and primary mission is to protect Australia's national security interests. But over and above that, they helped state governments during the pandemic or during recent bushfires where they assisted with rescue operations, medical and disaster relief, or we could look further afield where, where our ADF members have been deployed to assist our family in the Pacific. We should also reflect on both the significant achievements and heartbreaking sacrifices made in battlefields around the world, most recently in the Middle East. Sacrifices still being made today as our people spend long time of uh, long periods of time away from their families. So I thank those people serving in our defence force Order. for keeping Australia Senator safe. Van, Senator Ayres remotely. Uh, thanks, Mr President. Last month, the Deputy Prime Minister was asked on Insiders about the vaccine rollout in regional Australia. He said, we're doing quite well. Uh, figures released yesterday have shown the truth. Regional Australia has been left behind by the vaccine rollout. Even his own electorate has one of the lowest vaccination rates in the state. Scott Morrison's utter failure on vaccines has resulted in less than one in five Australians being fully vaccinated. That, along with failed hotel quarantine uh, and more infections, uh, has led to more infections, more deaths, more lockdowns, uh, like in Sydney today. But it's much worse in regional New South Wales. Far West and Arana, 13 per cent. Hunter Valley, 14 per cent. Coffs Harbour and Grafton, 14.6 per cent. His own electorate of New England, a touch over 15 per cent. Regional Australia has enough problems in accessing decent, affordable health care. 
Uh, but this has been made much harder. It's going to be harder for regional communities in the event of a COVID outbreak to access hospitals and respirators. We saw this in the Spanish flu. It ravaged regional communities and disproportionately Aboriginal communities more than it did in the cities. Now, the opportunity to vaccinate those communities in advance of this last round of infections has been squandered. The last 12 months, National Party MPs have clearly spent more time plotting against each other, focused on their own jobs, than doing the job that they've been required to do. Uh, and National Party members have done more than anybody else, senators like Canavan and Rennick, to undermine the public health effort by spreading conspiracy theories. At the end, it's about vaccine supply, and Scott Morrison's Order. got to do his job. Senator Ayres. Senator Canavan. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, in the limited time I have uh, available, I wanted to uh, say thank you to the, um, to the Collinsville mine and the uh, workers there who hosted us uh, last week. Uh, I was there with the member uh, for that area, member for Capricorn, Michelle Landry, and the member for Dawson, George Christensen, as well. We are also joined by the Mayor of Whit Sunday, um, uh, Andrew, Mr Andrew Wilcox. Uh, it was great to get out to, to a coal mine in North Queensland and thank all the hard workers at that mine for what they do for our country, the wealth they produce, uh, which we really, really need now to help our country uh, through this pandemic, uh, and also talk to them about their jobs and livelihoods, about issues like casualisation, uh, about uh, their pay, uh, uh, the, the, the rights they now have, thanks to legislation passed in this parliament, that they can convert to permanent work. And I, may, I must say that we were proud to be there as members of uh, this government that supports our coal miners. We, we happily posted photos. Uh, some, of the, some of the guys wanted to have a selfie with us. We put them up on our social media. Uh, we're proud of the workers of this nation. We had another visit. We had a visitor up in Queensland uh, for the last few weeks, the leader of the Labor Party. He, he, sort of, he sort of camped up there north of the Tweed. Not a single photo on his social media posted with workers in the coal mining industry. Where was he? There's no evidence that he actually visited a coal mine. There is more evidence that Neil Armstrong walked on the moon than there is that the Labor Party visited workers and celebrated the coal industry in this great nation. Order. It being 2 p.m. Questions without notice. Senator Birmingham. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I just wish to advise the chamber that uh, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne, uh, is, uh, is detained in international calls that are running slightly over time. Uh, Minister Payne wishes to extend her apologies to the chamber. Um, uh, obviously, she will endeavour to be here as soon as possible, and I'm advised will be here uh, during this question time. Uh, if there are early questions for Senator Payne, then I will take them. But, uh, but uh, otherwise, I thank the chamber for the understanding. Questions, Senator Sheldon, remotely. Well, my, no, thank you, um, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister confirm that less than 15 per cent of Australians aged 15 and over have been fully vaccinated in South West Sydney, which is one of the lowest vaccination rates in New South Wales? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck, remotely. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, uh, the, uh, the vaccination rollout continues to gather pace. Mr. President, and uh, as of uh, yesterday, over uh, 12 million Australians have had access uh, to. Uh, uh, there have been over 12 million doses of vaccine administered across the country. Uh, we continue to work collaboratively with the states to provide more opportunities for more Australians to access the uh, the vaccine, uh, and Senator we continue Colbeck, to grow Senator, the number. I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. Point of order, direct relevance. It was a very um, precise question, uh, which simply asked the minister to confirm a particular fact about South West Sydney vaccination rates. I have previously ruled that specific questions that are very factual um, will be interpreted very tightly when it comes to direct relevance. You've reminded the minister of the answer. I notice of the question. Sorry, I notice he has been speaking for just over 30 seconds. Uh, and I'll listen carefully to when he turning to the specific nature of the question. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, um, we continue to provide opportunities for, for Australians to access the vaccine. 
uh, and we continue to increase the number of outlets available to Australians to access the vaccine. Uh, Senator the Wong, on, intent... a, on a point of order, Senator Wong, Senator. Pete, I repeat, point of order, direct relevance. I repeat my previous point of order and point out that the minister is ignoring uh, your advice to him. I have been reluctant in my time in this role to do what happens in the other place, to call ministers to the specific nature of a question without a point of order being raised. I don't want to have to start making that habit. I think it interrupts the free flow of debate in the chamber. But, Minister, I am going to ask you to turn to the specific nature of what was a specifically worded question. Uh, rather than address the general terms of the vaccination policy. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, uh, and in New South Wales, uh, as of 3 p.m. yesterday, uh, over 42 um, per cent of the New South Wales population eligible for vaccination have received their first dose. And over 20 per cent, Mr. President, are fully vaccinated. Mr. President, I don't have the specific details of a particular area of Sydney with me. Order. Um, Order. Order. And Mr. President, over the last seven days, we have administered over 450,000 doses in New South Wales. Uh, and as of the 3rd of August, uh, 4,139,773 doses have been administered in New South Wales. As I've said a number of times, Mr President, we continue Order. to grow the pace of the vaccine rollout. We continue to grow the number of outlets available to Australians to access the, uh, the vaccine uh, through uh, a number of various different Order. types of the time outlet. for the answer has expired. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. Uh, can the minister confirm that in Logan Bow Desert, one of 11 local government areas in lockdown in southeast Queensland, only 13.2 per cent of Australians are vaccinated, the third lowest rate in the nation? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And again, I don't have specific details of a particular local government area with me, but Mr. President, uh, to assist the chamber, uh, as at as Order. at 11:59 uh, on the 3rd of August, there have been 2.387 million doses administered in Queensland. Uh, over 38% of the Queensland population eligible for vaccination have received their first dose, Mr. President, and 19% are fully vaccinated. Uh, we continue to work closely with the Queensland government to provide uh, both vaccines uh, and support the Queensland vaccination program. Uh, this week, uh, ending the 8th of August, the Commonwealth will provide Queensland with uh, just under 80,000 doses of Pfizer vaccine. Uh, and there will be uh, also 49,600 doses of AstraZeneca and over 47,000 doses Senator Colbert, of Pfizer vaccine. The answer the has expired. Senator, order. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Does the Morrison government take responsibility for such low vaccination rates? Senator Colbeck. Well, clearly, Mr. President, the government is responsible for the vaccine rollout and therefore takes responsibility um, for the current vaccinations that have occurred around Australia. Uh, but as I've said a number of times uh, and to the chamber, uh, and as the government has said on a number of occasions, as the supply of vaccine has increased, so have we included the uh, increased the, the uh, capacity and the availability of, va of vaccine for the Australian people. Uh, we have continued to grow the number of vaccines applied uh, to Australians over recent weeks. In fact, the last two million uh, vaccines to be administered have taken less than six, six, uh, six days on each of those occasions. So the, the rate of the rollout continues to grow. The number of outlets available for Australians to access the vaccine continue to grow. And we continue to have the objective of making available to all Australians a vaccine who Order. want one by, by the end of Colbeck. this year. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. 
Can the minister please update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government is working towards the goal of ending violence against women and their children? The Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Chandler for her question on this extraordinarily important subject. The Morrison government is absolutely focused on making Australia a place that is free from violence against women and their children. We demonstrated our commitment to this, um, ending violence against uh, women, domestic, family and sexual violence against women in the 21-22 budget, where we made the largest ever commitment to women's safety with our $1.1 billion package. This absolutely historic package is a key measure uh, that will contribute to the towards zero target that this government is absolutely committed to. Importantly, the package is also a down payment on the next national plan, not only to reduce violence but to end violence against women and their children. And working towards this important goal, the next national plan absolutely must be an ambitious blueprint to stop the rot that is family, domestic and sexual violence across our national landscape. It will not only build on the previous work of the previous national plan, but it will respond to urgent new issues uh, that we are facing today and build a base for emerging issues that are likely to occur into the future. The, up and, uh, the upcoming Women's Safety Summit on the 6th and 7th of September this year will be a critical step in the development of this new plan. The summit provides us with an opportunity to shine a light on the terrible violence that women from all walks of life experience in Australia. It will discuss key issues of women's safety, including financial security, policing and justice responses, sexual violence and the challenges facing diverse members of the Australian community. The two-day program also includes a series of roundtables that will inform the consultation process as we work towards developing the next national plan. Um, by bringing together a cross-section of Australian community, the voices of all Australians will have the opportunity to be heard. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Minister, for that update. Minister, can you please outline the other measures the government is implementing to support Australians who are escaping family and domestic violence? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, we have a number of measures that we're putting in place. Um, that because we believe, first and foremost, that when women are making the brave decision to escape a violent situation, um, that they need to have a safe place to go. And that is why um, we're providing $144 million for the escaping violence payment, and we have provided uh, $72.6 million for the Safe Places program across the country. The escaping violence program will provide immediate access to funds uh, for women and children when they flee a violent situation to allow them to pay for such things, whether it might be school fees, a rental bond or the like. As Safe Places funding uh, bolsters the already $1.6 billion that is provided in housing and homelessness funding uh, to make sure that we have new emergency accommodation to be built specifically for women escaping violence. Safe Places will help uh, nearly 6,500 women and children every year, not just in metropolitan areas but across rural and regional Australia as well. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, could you please advise how the government is helping to improve responses for victims of sexual violence? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Well, recently I visited the Monash University Department of Forensic Medicine, which had received $4.5 million from uh, the government to develop and implement Australia's first accredited training course for health practitioners and frontline workers uh, to improve their responses. To sexual violence victims. So participants in the courses that are being run uh, by Monash University will learn how to identify risk factors and respond to disclosures in sensitive and appropriate ways. It's absolutely vital that when someone discloses an experience of sexual violence, their disclosure is handled with care and appropriately. So we believe by um, arming uh, tr and training healthcare professionals with the kind of expertise so that they can understand uh, the signs and the symptoms and the risks that are associated with violence, we can assist many, many more people. And I want to take this opportunity to urge anyone who needs support to call 1800 RESPECT at any time of the day. Senator O'Neill. Mr President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister confirm that under Mr Morrison's latest announcement, Australians will continue to face lockdowns 
even with 70 per cent of the eligible population vaccinated. The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Senator Colbeck, I think you're on mute. Are you on mute? No, we, we're having a... Yes, I, I was on mute. Thank My you. apologies, Mr President. Apologies we'll for the restart the... Oh, cool. Great. Thank you. Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, and, and I can confirm that at the rate of 70 per cent of the eligible population being vaccinated, there is still some scope for lockdowns under the Doherty Institute modelling, Mr. President. Uh, the, uh, the modelling contemplates those sorts of circumstances occurring. Um, as a part of the development of the phased phase plan for reopening the economy, Mr. President. So there are a number of targets uh, that, are, that talk about uh, the progressive rates of vaccination within the country increasing uh, to provide more and more freedoms. That's the point of the exercise, Mr. President, so that the Australian community can understand the circumstances under which they might enjoy more freedoms, uh, the circumstances by which governments, state, territory and Commonwealth may make decisions about reopening the economy and the community, Mr President. That is the point of the government commissioning the Doherty modelling so that that information about those circumstances would be clear to the Australian people. So it is contemplated that there still could be lockdowns under those circumstances, Mr President. Uh, and particularly as we see new variants to the COVID-19 um, coming into uh, circulation, those circumstances may change, as they have done throughout the pandemic, Mr President. And we will have to be prepared, as we have done so far, to adjust to those new variants and the new circumstances. Uh, but the Doherty Institute modelling has been put in place so Australians have a full understanding of the circumstances about reopening the community and the economy. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister confirm that under Mr Morrison's latest announcement, Australians will continue to face lockdowns even with 80 per cent of the eligible population vaccinated? Senator Colbeck. Well, again, Mr. President, uh, that is contemplated in the Doherty modelling. Uh, the Doherty modelling talks about when at least 80% of the adult population is fully vaccinated, we, we can consider transition to phase C, which is regarded in the, in the, um, the plan as the vaccination consolidation phase. Uh, measures may include minimum ongoing baseline restrictions adjusted to minimise cases without lockdowns and highly targeted lockdowns only. Mr President, the whole purpose of this uh, vaccination process and the plan is to minimise serious illness, hospital, hospitalisations and fatalities as a part of the plan. But Mr President, we are going to have to continue to be prepared to adjust uh, as we have been throughout the pandemic as new variants to the virus have occurred, uh, Mr. President. So, yes, there are lockdowns Order, contemplated, Senator targeted Colbeck, lockdowns. Time for the Come answer on. has expired. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. When asked yesterday, Minister, what date the 70 per cent target will be reached, uh, you said, and I quote, the government deliberately has not established a date for that to occur. Why is the Morrison government keeping Australians in the dark? Is it because Mr Morrison doesn't want to take responsibility for meeting his own targets? Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr President, I completely reject the insinuation by the question. Mr President, we want all Australians to front up and get vaccinated as soon as possible. Reaching the targets and putting the targets into the public domain is putting the power into reopening the economy back into the hands of Australians. That's the point of it. Australians can understand what the thresholds are
for the reopening of the economy, uh, and they can then Order. work towards meet, meeting the targets. Our responsibility, Mr. President, the responsibility of the government is to make available the vaccine and make, av make available as many as possible outlets for Australians Order. to access the vaccine. That Senator is our responsibility, Mr. President. So we deliberately haven't set a target. Um, we, we make no apology for that. But Australians now know the circumstances. Order, Senator that Colbeck. We can the time economy. for the answer has expired. Senator Hanson Young. Mr. President, my question is to Senator Birmingham, representing the Prime Minister. Last week, Sky News was banned from YouTube for spreading COVID-19 medical misinformation. Sky is broadcast on subscription and free-to-air television. What is the Morrison government doing to prevent the spread of COVID misinformation on our TV screens? And what's the role of the government's television and media regulator? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Hanson Young uh, for her question. Uh, the provision of, uh, of accurate information in relation uh, to uh, all health matters, but particularly in relation to COVID-19 and the COVID-19 vaccine rollout, uh, is particularly uh, important. Uh, the, uh, the government uh, is investing in communications to ensure that uh, accurate, timely information is provided to Australians to give them reassurance about the facts uh, around the COVID-19 vaccine uh, availability, uh, about the safety and efficacy of COVID-19 vaccines as well. Uh, those information measures that the government undertakes are important means of communicating uh, with the Australian people, along with indeed the support provided uh, by many, uh, by many, be they by uh, many in the media, uh, be they by many uh, in public life, uh, even uh, people like the member for Maribyrnong, I note, have been uh, quite uh, quite vocal in their uh, uh, information provision in relation to uh, to uh, vaccines, including the AstraZeneca vaccine, and I welcome that. I welcome that. Uh, Mr President, uh, uh, obviously uh, our media regulators are empowered under uh, Australian laws to, uh, to act uh, where necessary. Uh, they have clear processes in place in, uh, in relation to, uh, to the way in which uh, they respond to complaints, conduct investigations and respond to such matters. Uh, those processes uh, don't involve um, political interference, uh, but uh, I am happy to uh, seek any further information in terms of uh, actions those regulators may be taking that could be provided to the chamber. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Rennick and George Christensen, PM, uh, MP, both members of the Morrison government, have made several statements that have been flagged by online platforms like Facebook because they contradict medical advice and undermine medical experts. What is the Prime Minister doing to stop the spread of COVID misinformation from those sabotaging his own health response? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr. President. Uh, I thank you, Mr. President. And, uh, Mr. President, uh, as I indicated before, the government uh, takes very seriously the importance of ensuring uh, accurate, timely information uh, is provided to Australians, providing them with reassurance uh, about uh, the COVID-19 vaccines, uh, the safety, the efficacy uh, of those vaccines. You know, I restate in this place the very thorough process that Australia went through, unlike other parts of the world where there were uh, emergency listings that shortcut uh, regulatory approvals in Australia, we went through uh, the thorough processes of the Therapeutic Goods Administration to ensure uh, the safety of vaccines. Uh, in this country, uh, we've uh, developed the type of modelling that you've heard from Senator Colbeck uh, outlines very clearly the efficacy of those vaccines. Uh, the fact that, uh, that be they uh, the Pfizer vaccine or the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, they reduce the rate of serious uh, illness and indeed death uh, by up to 90 per cent for each of Order. them. Senator Birmingham. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. YouTube has a policy that it, quote, doesn't allow content that spreads medical misinformation about COVID, that contradicts medical information about COVID-19 from local health authorities or the World Health Organization. It seems that YouTube has higher standards for facts and truth than this government. What, is, what are you doing to stop those sabotaging your health response who are members of your own government. Senator Birmingham. 
Well, Mr. President, uh, I make clear that, uh, that false information shared online can create public confusion. It can be harmful and can, can, uh, can create uh, difficulties for vulnerable people in our community. Uh, that's why, as, uh, as a government, uh, we've developed a uh, code of practice on disinformation and misinformation. Uh, it's, uh, it's why, indeed, uh, we have uh, regulatory processes in place that I spoke about before, and as I indicated, uh, I will bring back to the Chamber any information in terms of uh, regulatory actions underway. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Government Services, Senator Reynolds. Could the Minister describe how the Services Australia is supporting Australians in the current lockdowns? The Minister for Government Services, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Askew for that question. And indeed, I'm delighted to uh, answer this question. Services Australia is truly the engine room of government support to all Australians. Throughout this pandemic, the Morrison government has ensured that services are delivered seamlessly and efficiently when and where they are needed most by Australians. We've quickly and efficiently bolstered the Australian Immunisation Register and MyGov. We've applied fast-moving Centrelink payment changes and supported much-needed telehealth items through the MBS. We've also paused debt raising and recovery in lockdown areas of New South Wales and Queensland. But when we make policy decisions, it's Services Australia that are on the receiving end of thousands, in fact hundreds of thousands, of claims, phone calls and questions. They're setting and now regularly breaking their own records for social security and welfare telephony and processing channels and also now for digital claims. This year, in the past two months alone, they have approved over 1.4 million COVID disaster payments during these current lockdowns, totalling $1.33 billion, and they're supporting over 900,000 Australians. Yesterday alone, more than 1,600 income support customers in New South Wales who have lost more than eight hours' work applied for the additional support payment. Colleagues, Mr President, there are so many ways to serve our nation, be they in or out of uniform. And on behalf of all Australians, I would like to thank from the bottom of my heart, and I'm sure yours, all Services Australia staff for their unwavering focus and urgency and momentum towards supporting Australians doing natural disasters. Their work is sometimes an unsung service to the nation, and I know many Australians are very grateful for their service. Senator, ask you a supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, how have Services Australia had to adapt to meet demand? Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, at every stage of the pandemic, the Morrison government has adjusted to support Australians and ensure that services are delivered seamlessly, efficiently and as quickly as we can. Service Australia have mobilised more than 18,000 internal and external staff uh, to ensure that calls and claims for the COVID-19 disaster payment are processed as quickly as possible. And in some cases, that has been as quickly being in the bank in 40 uh, minutes. So what does this mobilisation look like? It includes over 600 new staff, uh, over 250 APS surge staff from other departments and also other agencies. Over 4,000 agency staff who usually undertake other roles have been redeployed to this effort. And over 13,000 staff from the customer service delivery group who are prioritising the COVID-19 disaster payment at this time. And can I again thank them for their efforts and their work in stepping up and Order. supporting all Senator Australians. Reynolds. Senator, ask you a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, how has the Liberal and Nationals government communicated support available to impacted communities? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. The Morrison government is indeed here to support all Australians, uh, and that also includes our cold communities. And we do understand the challenges faced by many of these communities, particularly in Western Sydney at the moment. Our government, through Services Australia, is ensuring that information is available on support is accessible to all Australians, with content now translated into 63 different languages to help uh, many of those communities. Multicultural service officers are also working directly with the community, and also they do in-language interviews have been made available to provide information about this payment. 
The payment is available to Australian residents and eligible working visa uh, holders who meet the eligible criteria. People can also call 131 202 to talk to Services Australia in languages other than English. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In his announcement on 2 July during the Delta outbreak in Sydney, Mr Morrison declared that in phase B, and I quote, lockdowns would only occur in extreme circumstances. Given Mr Morrison's announcement last Friday, can the minister confirm this statement is no longer true? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, uh, thanks Mr President. Mr President, uh, um, as uh, uh, all senators and all Australians have the opportunity uh, following the release of the uh, Doherty Institute modelling yesterday, uh, people are able to see uh, both the content of that modelling, uh, the way in which the modelling uh, outlines the uh, impact of different vaccination levels uh, on expected rates of transmission uh, and on expected rates of contraction of COVID-19 uh, and on the seriousness of the consequences of, uh, of that and how that shifts at different levels uh, of vaccination uh, across the population. Uh, it also outlines uh, different phases of restrictions that could be applied at those different, uh, different rates. Uh, it is correct, uh, Mr President, that, uh, that in terms of uh, the different phases of moving through, uh, variations in terms of the types of restrictions that may be necessary at different levels uh, were made to make sure uh, that we could have an appropriately staged approach at the different levels of, uh, of vaccination through the, uh, the modelling. This, Mr President, is, uh, is entirely consistent with an approach uh, of seeking to follow scientific and medical advice in the handling of the pandemic. Mr President, uh, what, uh, what the government has done in terms of uh, seeking to chart a pathway of reopening is listen to that scientific and medical advice. And we're one of the few countries in the world to have had the opportunity to have had the opportunity to be able to take Order. that advice and adapt policy along the way according to that advice and information, some of the best practice in the world, and one of the few countries in the world to have that opportunity to do so. Uh, and that is because, as a country, notwithstanding the many difficulties and uncertainties in responding to a global pandemic, we have been uh, in a position where lives have been saved, where we have been able to act in accordance with advice, and where we are able to make sure that we get it right before we move to those next stages. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, in his announcement on 2 July, in the midst of a Delta outbreak, Mr Morrison declared that in Phase C there would be, and I quote, no lockdowns. Can the minister confirm that this is not true and that in Phase C Australians will in fact be subjected to more lockdowns in a whole range of circumstances? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, uh, I'd refer the senator to the answer I just gave and to the answer that Senator Colbeck gave previously. Uh, the answer I just gave, Mr President, Order. outlined very clearly the fact uh, that, uh, that the government outlined uh, the potential stages uh, for reopening. The government asked the Doherty Institute uh, to undertake modelling against those sorts of, uh, of processes. In the process of undertaking that modelling, in the process of undertaking that modelling, Mr President, uh, it became apparent uh, that there needed to be differences in those stages uh, to be able to work successfully through uh, reopening. The government fully expects that. That's why the government was asking for expert advice. It's why we have done so. Uh, now, uh, as Senator Colbeck said before, uh, the advice as published makes clear uh, that in the third phase, limited, targeted lockdowns may be necessary in certain extreme circumstances, and that, uh, and that indeed uh, Order, is Senator there Birmingham, in that public time advice. The answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you. I do have one. <laughs> Last year, Mr Morrison and his ministers consistently criticised the Victorian lockdown, and this year he has gone from urging Victoria to lift restrictions and commending New South Wales for not going into full lockdown in June to declaring in July that, and I quote, lockdowns are absolutely necessary and there's no other way through. How can Australians possibly believe a word Mr Morrison says? Order. Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Some, sometimes, when I stand here and look opposite, I'm not sure whether I'm seeing a whole world of Nostradamuses across uh, across from me, uh, or people who just think that they have Order. the wonderful benefit of 2020 Order. hindsight. But, Mr. But, Mr. President, you know, a point, a point, a very obvious Order. point, Sorry, a very Senator. obvious Order. point, Order. a Senator very Birmingham. obvious point that was missing on my from left. Senator Gallagher's question Senator was any recognition of the reality of the existence of the Delta variant. 100 per cent, a 100 per cent increase in the transmissibility of COVID-19 is a factor in relation to the Delta variant. Having it changed the order. results in a 100 per cent increase in the potential Birmingham, rate of Senator transmission— Gallagher on a point of order. order. I can barely hear Senator Birmingham. I, and he does have a loud voice. Senator Gallagher on a point of order. Thank you. The Leader of the Government is misleading. I did, That's not a point I of did order. mention the Delta outbreak, Mr That's President. That's not a point of order, Senator it's Gallagher. It's misleading to order. say that. There's an opportunity to debate answers after question time. We, are, we have got senators operating remotely. I ask again for the courtesy of the Senate to allow them to hear it, because if I can't, they can't. Senator Birmingham. No, Mr. President, the fact is, the fact is, the circumstances we face now are quite different to the circumstances we faced as a country 12 months ago. At the time of the Victorian lockdown last Senator year, Senator Watt, order on a, order on my left, Senator Pratt, Senator Watt, your leader's on her feet. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. I would point out that this question does relate to comments made when the Delta variant um, the, was already in place was Senator in Wong, Sydney. Senator Wong, Senator you Wong, order, order. Senator Wong, please. It was a very broadly worded question. The minister is entirely in order in answering it in these terms. I am going to ask for silence. I do not want to have to stand or interrupt question time further. Senator Birmingham. Simple point, Mr. President, is when the facts and the evidence change, we have been willing to change with the facts and the changes in evidence. And those opposite would be the first to criticise us if we didn't. Order. Senator Patterson. Senator Pratt. Senator Wong. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reductions, Senator Selger. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and National Government is delivering a technology, not taxes, approach to reduce Australia's carbon emissions while also securing our energy needs and making electricity more affordable? The minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And, uh, our government is absolutely committed to a technology-led approach to reducing emissions and securing affordable and reliable energy for Australian households and business. Now, we know that those opposite believe that taxes are always the answer, but we don't agree. Uh, we have a different approach, and I'm pleased to advise the Senate that our approach is working. Now, I'm hearing from George again. It's hard to hear him though through the, through the mask, so I'll do my best to push on. Australia's emissions are now lower than in any year under the previous Labor government. And at the lowest level since 1990, we've reduced emissions uh, by 20 per cent on 2005 levels, and we're on track to meet and beat our 2030 commitments. Now, emissions in the NEM have fallen to their lowest level since records began, and our technology, not taxes, approach has seen a record 7 gig of new renewable capacity installed last year alone. Now, Australia now has the highest total amount of solar PV capacity per person in the world. Of course, we still have no idea what Labor's 2030 emissions target is. We just know that whatever the problem, taxes are always Labor's solution. It is in their DNA. So on this side, we understand uh, that to continue to drive down emissions uh, while securing our economy from the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to tap into the expertise of agencies we already have, like ARENA, to support Australian innovation. And that's why we've introduced updated ARENA regulations after the Labor Greens coalition uh, voted against investment in clean and low emissions technology. Now, we will enable ARENA to invest in the five priority low emissions technologies identified in the Technology Investment Roadmap. 
clean hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, long duration storage, green steel and aluminium and healthy soils. All things it seems that the Labor Party and the Greens are against and the 1,400 jobs uh, that would come with them. We have a very different approach Order. and it is on Senator stark Sussell, display when we vote on the these reasons. Expired. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on why it is so critical for Australian businesses and households that we pursue a technology and not taxes approach when it comes to meeting Australia's energy needs? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, thanks, Senator Patterson. We know that it's technology, not taxes, that will drive down emissions, while at the same time creating jobs and ensuring we have the affordable, reliable energy we need. And that's why we've introduced these new arena regulations to enable more investment in the technologies identified uh, in the investment roadmap, the technologies we need to ensure reliable and dispatchable power. Yet Labor and the Greens want to block these investments in clean energy technology and the jobs they will create. It's hard to comprehend, but it is happening. So perhaps it's time the Leader of the Opposition, instead of sneaking, the, sneaking into coal mines in Queensland, should take the advice of the member for Hunter, who last week said Labor should just back whatever the government puts on the table. To do otherwise is to suggest we are not genuinely committed to action on climate change. Well, the member for Hunter is right. The member for Hunter is right, and the leader of the opposition is wrong because Labor doesn't Order. support Senator technology Seselja, because they time simply for the answer want has expired. More. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline what measures the government is carrying out to deliver affordable, reliable, and more secure energy? And is he aware of any risks to this approach? Senator Seselja. Well, thank, thank you. Uh, and there are serious risks to our technology, not taxes, plan to deliver more affordable and reliable energy for all Australians, while at the same time reducing emissions. And most of them are over there. Now, by teaming up with the Greens to block Arena's expansion, Labor is saying no to investment in the same low emissions technologies they claim to support. They voted for higher emissions fewer jobs and less funding for Arena and apparently will do so again unless common sense prevails. The Labor Party doesn't know where they stand on technology, but we all know exactly where they stand on taxes. Taxes are Labor's track record. Now, the member for McMahon, of course, when he was in government, he increased the carbon tax. It wasn't high enough. He increased it. We all remember his housing tax, his car tax, his retiree tax. The choice is clear. There are only two ways to reduce emissions. And if it isn't technology, it's taxes. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my uh, question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture in Northern Australia, Senator McKenzie. In September 2018, the government launched the National Forest Industry Plan, a commitment to, uh, to Australia's timber industry and an investment in Australia's future. It included a commitment to, to plant a billion new plantation trees. Minister Littleproud said Australia will need to plant a billion new trees over the next decade to meet demands in 2050, particularly saw logs for building and construction. Now, is there an implementation program for this plan? How many uh, of the billion trees were supposed to be, have been planted by this point in time, by the, uh, June the 30th, and how many have actually been planted? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture in Northern Australia, Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank the Senator uh, for his question and for the notice he gave that allowed me to get um, the most up to date advice on this topic. And I'd like to thank uh, Senator Dunningham for that. I want to say um, how vital the forestry industry is. I'm from a timber town, Marysville, uh, in Victoria, and it underpins the lives and livelihoods of so many. Australians, whether it's in my own home state of Victoria, the Green Triangle, uh, in your home state of South Australia, or along that uh, western border, or the southwest slopes of New South Wales, or down to uh, the fantastic timber industry of Tasmania, uh, forest products are an integral part of so many rural economies. After all, timber is the ultimate renewable resource. Beautiful, natural, strong, and replantable. It surpasses none other not to mention to the benefit uh, of the environment regarding carbon sequestration. The Liberal National Government is committed to working with landholders, businesses, state and territory governments and industry to grow the forestry industry and the plant Australian plantation estate. 
We, unlike those on the other side, except uh, perhaps uh, Senator uh, Ciccone, uh, absolutely want to grow this industry, grow the number of people it employs, uh, grow uh, what we believe is a renewable and sustainable industry for us that is also good for the environment. We'll always listen to their views, and that's why we partner with them. It's important that we do acknowledge the issues we've faced. Timber sh supply shortages are affecting countries worldwide, order. and Australia um, is Senator no exception. McKenzie, I have Senator Patrick on a point of order. Senator Patrick? Rem on, on relevance, I did ask for the number of trees that were supposed to be, have been planted and the number of trees that have actually been planted. Uh, they were the points at the end of the question with a preamble. I'll listen carefully to the minister. Um, you reminded the minister of that part of the question. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you. Um, the issues that we're um, speaking about, about timber supply shortages, you mentioned how vital um, timber is uh, for construction. And as I travel around rural and regional Australia, um, timber shortages are actually becoming an impediment for uh, housing construction in some of those regional communities. And so we're no exception. There is a, a worldwide shortage of timber. These issues stem Order, from an Senator increase McKenzie, in demand for, for the timber answer construction. Has expired. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Thank you. I'm, I'm very surprised uh, you don't know the answer to this because you did ask the question on, uh, on notice, and it's only 2,800 hectares. That is about 2.8 million uh, trees that have been planted. That's less than 1 per cent of the target. What's the issue? What's the plan to move ahead? Why are you not coming anywhere near the objectives of this plan of a billion trees? Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, so it's also important to note that our forestry states are man estates are managed by state and territory governments. The Commonwealth does not manage a single tree in any productive forest, and we're working very, very hard, as I said, with state and territory governments, with industry, to expand our forestry um, estate. I understand uh, that in Tasmania, the most recent reports. The softwood estate expanded by 2,000 hectares, and in Tasmania there are an average of 1,100 trees per hectare. That equates to an expansion of approximately 2.2 million trees. In addition, I've been advised that there are currently two contractors working on over 900 hectares of plantation, meaning that almost another million trees are going into the ground, as I understand it. In New South Wales, um, where the bushfires were most significant, over 100,000 hectares, which equates to over 100 million trees, were lost during those fires. Last year, 4,500 hectares were Order, planted and another 7,000 hectares Time for the are currently expired. being— Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Uh, Minister, you mentioned uh, the shortage of, uh, so, uh, of a uh, uh, log in, uh, in your answer. Um, is it not in Australia's interest to prohibit the export of, uh, of, of trees in circumstances where our own mills are desperate to get log? Uh, is that something that is being considered by the government? Senator McKenzie. Thank you. And, and you're right. Um, demand is high. Supply is restrained for a whole raft of reasons, one of them being bushfires, other um, being logging uh, bans in certain jurisdictions of certain areas. But as a federal government, we'll always work with industry to help them grow, and that includes ensuring that we have as much in-country value as, po add as possible. And that means uh, we'll take our lead from them about what's best for the future. We want to keep and create uh, more timber jobs than the 52,000 Australians that are already employed in the sector. Um, I think when you look at export measures to prevent the export of timber, our approach is actually about expanding the domestic industry as home as quickly as possible in partnership with the states uh, and with industries. You know and I know um, that that means helping bushfire-affected sawmills upgrade and update their processing facilities through the recent $40 million bushfire program, meaning they could do more here in Australia rather than sending those Order, raw Senator products McKenzie. offshore. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham, and I note the answers uh, Senator Birmingham gave to Senator Hanson-Young's questions earlier. In an episode of Steve Bannon's War Room, Coalition Senator Canavan criticised the public health advice of governments including his own, stating that even if they released full public health advice, it would be a, quote, dog's breakfast. Senator Canavan has also repeatedly called to end the lockdowns on social media as recently as the last two days. 
Does Mr Morrison agree with Senator Canavan? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. Well, I've, uh, I've not uh, seen, I'm not sure I've actually even heard of the podcast that you're speaking of, uh, Senator Watt, uh, but in terms of at least the remarks as you characterise them, the answer is no. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. On the 18th of July, Coalition Senator Rennick shared and endorsed an article on Facebook challenging the TGA's approval of an unnamed COVID vaccine described as, and I quote, an experimental gene therapy vaccine with plummeting efficacy, significant short-term safety signals and unknown long-term side effects. Does Mr Morrison agree with Senator Rennick and will the government's code of practice on COVID disinformation apply to its own MPs and senators? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the government has complete confidence in the work of the TGA and backs it completely. Senator Watt, order. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Well, I'm glad Senator Birmingham backs the TGA more than he backs his own MPs. Mr George Christensen's Facebook yesterday received the fourth most interactions of all federal politicians, and he represents a region with one of the lowest vaccination rates in the country at only 10.2%. Mr Christensen regularly uses his Facebook to undermine the use of lockdowns and restrictions, saying they had actually caused deaths in Australia. How can Australians be expected to do the right thing when Mr Morrison's own members are encouraging them to ignore the Prime Minister's Order. own public Senator health Watt. advice? Senator Birmingham. Order. Thanks, Mr President. Well, Mr President, uh, it's, it's no secret. It's no secret that there are Order. some Australians. Order. Some Australians Sorry, who disagree order. with Sorry. lockdowns Senator or certain Watt, public Senator policy Rennick. measures that have been Senator taken Watt and during Rennick. the course of the pandemic. Uh, however, however, Mr President, it is clear that the government wants as many Australians as order. possible to get vaccinated. And in terms of Australians, I thank them for the fact that they are responding in record numbers to the request to get vaccinated. They are responding in record numbers with yesterday some 213,947 Australians Watt. turning out to have another dose of vaccine administered. Those, uh, those numbers have driven the total number of vaccine doses administered to more than 12.8 million across Australia. They've got us to the point where some 42 per cent of all eligible Australians over the age of 16 have had order. their first Senator dose. Wong on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. This goes to Mr Christensen. At what point are you going to actually deal with him? Senator Wong, the point of order. I, I, I'm not sure if that was a point of order, um, because the last part of the question was a very broad one, and I think the minister's got a lot of discretion in answering it and remaining directly relevant. Senator Birmingham is in order. Senator Birmingham, order. And Mr President, as we, uh, as we acknowledge those over 70s, of whom nearly 80 per cent have now received uh, the first dose of vaccine, Order. and we Senator encourage all Birmingham Australians to follow that lead of expired. our senior. Order. Senator Watt, if you ask a question, you should listen to the answer. Well, there were a lot of interjections, and I was struggling to hear Senator Birmingham during that. Senator Watt, please. Senator, Sen Senator Wong, there is a time for debate. My job is not to judge it, but to ensure senators can participate. Senator, Scar Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the Minister update the Senate on the government's support to the rollout of vaccines to combat COVID-19 in Australia's region, including in the Pacific? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Scar for his question. Australia is standing strongly with our partners in uh, the Pacific and in Southeast Asia in their response to COVID-19. We are delivering on the Prime Minister's commitment to the G7 to provide up to 20 million vaccines for our neighbours, including 15 million to the Pacific and Timor-Leste and 5 million to Southeast Asia. To date, we've delivered over 1 million vaccine doses to eight countries, to Papua New Guinea, to Timor-Leste, to Fiji, the Solomon Islands, Tuvalu, Samoa, Tonga and, most recently, to Vanuatu. Our contribution of Australian vaccines complements the $623 million we've committed to vaccine access, including end-to-end -end support for the Pacific and Southeast Asia. Our Pacific Flights program is sustaining air connectivity to the Pacific and Timor-Leste, ensuring those life-saving vaccines and medical equipment are delivered. 
in our closest neighbour, Papua New Guinea, we're strongly supporting the government's campaign to lift vaccination rates. We're partnering with churches, businesses and NGOs to promote vaccination positive messages. The ADF is providing vital logistic support to PNG's vaccination campaign in the Torres Strait border region. In Fiji, our regular supply of vaccines, ANZMAT teams, PPE and medical equipment has been vital to assist our partners in Fiji to address a very difficult Delta variant COVID-19 surge. I have been in regular contact with my counterparts on these matters. I met with Pacific Islands Forum Foreign Ministers last week. Uh, today I have met with ASEAN Foreign Ministers and spoken with Cook Islands Prime Minister Mark Brown Tuvalu Foreign Minister Simon Coffey. Our assistance through these vital partnerships is genuinely saving lives and genuinely helping to stem very, very lethal outbreaks. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise on the broader support Australia is providing to our region to strengthen health security? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Australia is also investing in our region's health systems, in health governance, in specialist clinical services and training. Last financial year, we provided $228 million for regional health programs in the Pacific. In Papua New Guinea, for example, we're working with local partners to provide high-quality integrated sexual and reproductive health, family planning and maternal and child health services, partnering with New Zealand and Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, to build health system capacity to increase routine immunisation coverage. Australia has supported the establishment of a new ASEAN centre for public health emergencies and emerging diseases, which was part of my discussions with ASEAN foreign ministers today, uh, which delayed my attendance in the chamber. Uh, Mr President, for that, my apologies and uh, apologies to colleagues. Our Pacific Medicines Testing Program is a foundational initiative within our Pacific Step Up. It boosts public safety through the testing of the quality and safety of medicines used in the Pacific by the Therapeutic Goods Administration. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. No need for the minister to apologise for engaging with our ASEAN friends. Uh, can the minister outline Australia's assistance to the region to transition from COVID-19 response to longer-term recovery? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. It's fair to say that our region faces an unprecedented economic shock from COVID-19. The Asian Development Bank has cut its growth forecasts for the Pacific from 1.4 per cent just in April of this year to 0.3 per cent. So Australia is implementing our $500 million package in new economic development and security measures to support Southeast Asia's recovery from COVID-19. We're delivering on our commitment through the Mekong Australia Partnership and our Partnerships for Infrastructure initiative. And our, COVID, and our Pacific COVID-19 response package is providing essential services, flight connectivity and increased social spending. In Fiji, we provided over $83 million last financial year in fiscal support, directly benefiting Fijians impacted by COVID-19. This complements the Fiji government's important poverty benefits scheme and disability allowance for women, for children for other vulnerable groups. These initiatives are key to supporting the region's resilience and recovery from COVID-19. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Regionalisation, Regional Communications and Regional Education and Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie. I refer to Senator McKenzie's statements this week defending her oversight of discretionary grants programs. The minister has previously told the Senate about the Community Sport Infrastructure Program that, and I quote, the Prime Minister did not have a role in authorising projects throughout the three rounds, and the final decision maker was me. Can the minister, minister explain how, on the eve of the last federal election, her approved project list was changed at the request of the Prime Minister's office without her knowledge? I'll call Senator McKenzie without reading out multiple titles. Senator McKenzie. <laughs> yes, you need a PhD to read it as well. Um, well, thank you, Senator Chisholm, for your um, question. I submitted a 6,000-word statement to the Senate inquiry into these matters. Indeed, I appeared in a once-in-120-year event of the Senate calling uh, one of its own members to appear to a committee to provide uh, answers to your questions, which I did happily because I respect the work of the Senate and the order. integral role Senator, it plays McKenzie, in our democracy. I have, Senator Wong on a point of order. Uh, uh, and I have risen 
at 1.32, and if the minister proceeds to answer the question, obviously my point of order will be withdrawn, but I didn't want her to sit down before I made this point of order. And I'm going to ask you if the minister uses that excuse to avoid any answer and question time to take advice on the clerk and to come back. It is not in order nor consistent with the standing orders, for a minister simply to say, I wrote a big statement and thereby avoid any further questions. I will take further advice on this. I always am happy to and to come back to senators individually or collectively. The question is in order because it refers the minister to a previous statement that is within the standing order. However, a minister, in my view, can refer to a previous statement in, a, in answering that without necessarily detailing what is in that statement. If I have any change to that advice, I will report it to the senators involved individually or to the chamber if it is, is of grave interest. Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And you know, I have never avoided answering those questions in those public forums uh, ad nauseum. So I actually have nothing further to add to my public commentary, including answering that specific Order. question Order. during the Senate inquiry uh, that Order. Senator Chisholm chaired. He had over an hour to ask me any question he liked on that day, in addition to the 6,000-word public statement. Uh, so I am very comfortable Order. with the management of that program. I am very comfortable with the exercise of ministerial discretion that saw more projects delivered to Labor seats than if I had of not exercised my ministerial discretion. More clubs right around the country uh, were able to avail themselves of a highly popular program that was oversubscribed to the tune of 13 times. Uh, those programs were helping local clubs to increase physical activity right around the country in a whole raft of sports. So um, I have publicly dealt with this through a whole raft of mechanisms that this chamber avails it of, of itself um, to provide accountability and transparency to the public on the spending of public monies. I stand by those public comments uh, and I have nothing further to add. Thank you. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. The minister has also told the Senate, and I quote, the Prime Minister's office was not responsible for altering the attachment to the Round 3 brief, because the brief was submitted to Sport Australia, albeit not in a timely manner, from my office. How can the Senate reconcile the Minister's claim that the Prime Minister had no role in sports rorts when his office was adding and deleting projects without her knowledge? Senator Mackenzie. Again, these questions have been asked and answered. I, prefer, I refer you to both the statement and the Hansard uh, on both these accounts. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Given the minister yesterday listed a number of grants programs in her new roles that she is now the decision maker for, will she ensure the Prime Minister's office does not repeat the previous practice of altering the minister's grant decisions? Senator Mackenzie. I have a raft of grant programs under my authority and discretion as is appropriate as a Minister for the Crown. I will actually undertake my role as a Minister for the Crown as a Senator uh, with personal integrity and intent and ensure that I fulfil my duties uh, in accordance with both the ministerial standards and the way I've uh, uh, conducted myself order. throughout Senator my career. Wong, uh, point of order. The, the, issue, the question didn't go to this minister's appropriateness, on which we all have very different views. It went to whether or not she was going to ensure the Prime Minister's office did not repeat their previous practice of altering her grant decisions. Um, you've restated the question. Um, the minister's been talking for 21 seconds. If the minister is limiting her comments, as I believe she is, to her administration of the programs, I can't go to the point of actually directing her how to answer a question. She is being directly relevant. There's an opportunity after question time, as I repeat, for debate of questions and answers. Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you. Uh, once again, I take full responsibility for all decisions made uh, as a minister both then and I'll continue to do so. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Mr President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Senator Payne. Sorry. Penny. Yep, Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, I thank the Senate for uh, the opportunity to make this uh, brief statement, and I seek leave to do so. Sorry, leave is granted. Sorry, I'll speak to the Deputy President. President, uh, Mr. President, and colleagues, 
When Australians first heard of the explosion at the port of Beirut, uh, it was an incomprehensible disaster. The mobile phone videos of the sudden explosion with its massive white shockwave were truly horrifying. The detonation was so large that it registered on the Global Detection Network of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organisation. More than 215 people died, more than 7,000 were injured and more than 300,000 were displaced because their very homes were completely lost. Lebanon has not recovered from its grief, nor from its damage. And that day also took the life of an Australian citizen, two-year-old Isaac Olers. Today, we remember Isaac, and we once more offer our deep and sincere condolences to his parents, Sarah and Craig, and their families in their immeasurable grief. Mr President, Australia once more reiterates our strong and unequivocal support for a full, credible and transparent investigation into the explosion and for those responsible to be held to account for acts of omission, commission or corruption. Tonight, Australia will participate in the third international conference to support the population of Lebanon, co-hosted by the President of France, His Excellency Emmanuel Macron, and the Secretary-General of the United Nations, His Excellency Antonio Guterres. A year after the explosion, Lebanon is facing a more complex crisis, a slide towards the collapse of Lebanon's political and socio-economic model. Already, according to the United Nations, one and a half million people can no longer afford their essential needs. Australia fully supports international efforts to assist with the Lebanon Reform, Recovery and Reconstruction Framework, known as 3RF, which aims to help Lebanon achieve three central goals in response to the Beirut port explosion. Firstly, a people-centred recovery that returns sustainable livelihoods. Second, the reconstruction of critical assets and infrastructure. And thirdly, the implementation of reform to help restore people's trust in government institutions by improving governance and accountability. Australia's assistance package to Lebanon of $15 million, channelled directly through international organisations and NGOs, has assisted Lebanon's direct needs and contributes to a range of additional imperatives, including supporting displaced Syrians and Palestinians now living in Lebanon. As we all know, Australia is home to around 230 citizens of Lebanese heritage, many of my friends in Sydney, part of this vibrant diaspora, and around 20,000 Australians are living in Lebanon. What happens in Lebanon affects us here, too. I know how deeply they felt the tragedy of the bomb blast. The Lebanese diaspora in Australia of all faiths, including Christian, Muslim, Druze and others, has been incredibly generous in its donations to international organisations, to NGOs and charities as a way to assist those in Lebanon, and I want to acknowledge this warmly. I've had many meetings with the Lebanese communities in Australia. I'm indebted to their tireless efforts, particularly those of Bishop Tarabay, Bishop Antoine Tarabay, his broad parish and his excellent advocacy for reform and accountability in Lebanon. I also wish to acknowledge the Ambassador to Lebanon, Her Excellency Rebecca Grindley, and all her staff, who suffered through the explosion themselves with their families, but returned immediately to work, despite what had happened to them, to the city they had made, in which they had made their home, to help Australians in need of consular assistance and to work with the Lebanese government and our international partners. Mr President, there is a great deal of work ahead of the international community and for the Lebanese people. If we are to avoid the tragedy of the Beirut explosion becoming an even greater tragedy for all of Lebanon. And Mr President, Australia will continue to play its part in helping Lebanon with humanitarian assistance, with meaningful reforms, with better governance and with genuine accountability. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted. I thank the Senate and I thank also the Minister for her positive response to my suggestion we mark this tragic anniversary in the Chamber today. And we join with her in the comments she's made. On this day one year ago, Australians were horrified by the images 
of the Beirut port explosion, an explosion more powerful than the one that destroyed the Chernobyl, Chernobyl reactor, killing over 200 people, wounding thousands more and wreaking untold damage across the city of Beirut. Tens of thousands were made homeless and the city remains scarred by this blast. Its reconstruction hampered further by, of course, the COVID pandemic and Lebanon's economic collapse. The young, youngest victim of the blast was an Australian, two-year-old Isaac Olus. And Isaac's mother, Sarah Copeland, describes her loving and affectionate son thriving in Beirut, already picking up Arabic and French to the delight of locals. And our thoughts today are with Sarah, her husband Craig, and their loved ones as they mourn again their loss. Isaac's portrait is memorialised alongside over 200 victims of the blast in downtown Beirut, and we will not forget them. The opposition also salutes the vital work of our embassy in Beirut throughout this crisis. Australian embassy staff were themselves injured in this blast, homes destroyed and their workplace damaged. But under the leadership of Ambassador Rebecca Grindley, they managed to navigate the chaos of the explosion's aftermath to ensure Australians in Beirut were accounted for and helped them get to safety. And we thank them for their work. This is a particularly difficult time for Lebanese communities in Australia, many of whom are locked down and unable to come together with friends and family. And of course, they remain unable to travel to their homeland to grieve with their loved ones and to help rebuild what was lost. We know that as a country, Lebanon has faced difficult times before, and now it has a challenging road ahead to rebuild its city, its economy, and the trust of its citizens in its political leaders to be transparent and accountable. And this is what the people of Lebanon demand, and it is what they deserve. Regrettably, 12 months on from the blast, the grief and losses felt by the people of Lebanon and Lebanese and communities in Australia have been compounded by the fact that those responsible have still not had to answer for their failures. This was a tragedy that should have been avoided, but warnings were not heeded, and Lebanon is still grappling with the consequences of this neglect. The victims of this terrible tragedy are still waiting for justice, and the absence of justice inhibits healing. Sarah Copeland is fighting for that justice, for a full investigation into how this tragedy could happen and to ensure it never happens again for all the victims of that day and for Isaac. So we reiterate our call on the Australian Government to support an independent, impartial and transparent investigation into the explosion. And we st stand with the people of Lebanon, with Lebanese communities in Australia and with the Olas Copeland family in their grief. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted. Uh, thank you. On behalf of the Australian Greens, I join with colleagues in this chamber a year on from the devastation of the Beirut explosion to mark that tragic event that took so many lives. One of the largest non-nuclear blasts ever known, it killed more than 200 people, wounded over 7,000 and caused horrific damage to the beautiful and vibrant city of Beirut. The blast was so devastating it was felt in Cyprus more than 200 kilometres away. The footage from the blast was so shocking to watch. An entire building destroyed, shockwaves spreading across the city. I cannot imagine what it was like to experience directly. In the aftermath of the destruction, the courage of the survivors was incredible and inspiring. People took to the streets, helping each other among the devastation and the chaos. They shifted rubble, cared for the wounded and did everything they could to look after each other. In the weeks following the blast, volunteers arrived from around the country and further afield, doing what they could wherever they could. We should particularly acknowledge the response of the Australian Lebanese community around Australia, even in Melbourne, which was locked down at the time. People responded with compassion and care sharing support with the survivors half a world away. While the courage of the community has been inspiring, a year later many people are still waiting for much-needed accountability and transparency over what actually went wrong. Our hearts go out to those who are mourning and who have not yet received answers, and we acknowledge the incredible grief and trauma that they feel. We particularly acknowledge the Australian 
family of two-year-old Isaac Olas, the youngest victim of the blast, and that family's ongoing struggle for justice. The Australian Greens support calls from many people and organisations for independent investigation conducted by or under the auspices of the United Nations Human Rights Council. The survivors and the victims deserve accountability. They deserve answers about why tonnes of a dangerous explosive chemical were stored unsafely for years. They deserve to know why nobody warned them of the danger. To those survivors who are still grieving, still mourning and still searching for answers, we share your grief at the tragic loss of life and we share your passion for justice and accountability. Thank the Senate. Thanks, Senators. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Pratt. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note this afternoon of answers given by government senators to the questions asked by Labor senators, and that is all questions asked by Labor senators. As the answers to, or non answers, I might say, given by government senators to questions asked by Labor senators today reveals, we have a massive lack of certainty in re relation to our path out of COVID. This is not due to uh, scientific uncertainty, as the government uh, has tried to argue in the past. It is due to their lack of transparency and accountability for the issues our nation confronts. Uh, only yesterday or the day before, we were hearing from the Prime Minister saying, oh, look, once we get to 80 per cent uh, of vaccination, then we will have a pathway out of lockdowns and an end to lockdowns. And now today we hear uh, that the government is finally prepared to mirror what the Doherty model itself shows, which is that, yes, we need high levels of vaccination, but they are not a pathway out of uncertainty of lockdowns. Absolutely, we must have a very high vaccination level in order to uh, minimise lockdowns. But as we see, the Doherty modelling itself, as well as modelling done by the Burnett Institute and many previous iterations uh, of coronavirus lockdowns, where we have known all along that there is a relationship between locking down and managing the spread of the virus, it's been apparent all along, and yet this government does not seem to have wanted to own up to that at all. We can see that, yes, we are in a race to get vaccinated in order to minimise disruption to the Australian community, but that that does not guarantee a pathway for us out of lockdowns, particularly at a 70 uh, per cent uh, immunisation uh, vaccination rate. If we see 70 per cent of the Australian population vaccinated, which we are way off, way, way off uh, achieving. If we then let it rip when COVID comes into our country, we will see thousands and thousands of deaths. Tragically, we have seen deaths in New South Wales in recent days, including of young people. We know we have to lift the vaccination rate of younger Australians and, in particular, also look regionally at the level of vaccination that's taking place. And again, in answers to questions asked by Labor senators today, the government refuses to be transparent about vaccination rates at a regional level. So how can we have an aspirational target of 70 per cent or 80 per cent to say, yes, it's going to give us clarity about how we manage lockdowns with some efficacy once we reach those vaccination rates. 
when this government refuses to disclose what the vaccination rates in different communities actually are. It is a complete lack of accountability and transparency. This government's given a contract to Accenture for software maintenance and support. They've paid out $6.6 .6 million. We're paying for Commonwealth data. There's a lucrative contract here. And yet this government will not tell us, region by region, how many Australians are vaccinated uh, in each region under their GP vaccination program. We've got better data from the states with their mass vaccination programs, and you can see from those programs and that transparency, for example, in Victoria, that there are regions like Gippsland which have a lower vaccination rate because they're not as close to uh, a large vaccination hub. But what you can also see there is that those very same regions have lower access to GPs and that it is therefore also more likely that they have a lower vaccination rate. And so here we see this Thank government you, refusing to, to— Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, it's great to be able to just free range across all these questions that the uh, Labor senators asked because, again, it, it will give us an opportunity to show just how wrong they are, as always. Um, where do we start? Well, let's start with the, the national plan to roll out. The government has set out, based off the clearest evidence possible by one of the most uh, reputable institutions in this country, if not in the world, the Doherty Institute, that we will phase out through this as our vaccinations go forward. And, it, and it's clear that um, it's built on the premise that if you get vaccinated, we can make lockdowns and border closures and restrictions a thing of the past, or at least reduce them or restrict them to local areas or to people who aren't vaccinated, for example. So this uniquely Australian plan is based on medical evidence outlined in the Doherty report and the economic modelling from Treasury. What seemed to ha happen on that side of the benches, and particularly in Labor states, is they'll look only at the health advice and ignore any economic advice. We certainly saw that in my home state last year in, in Victoria, where 130 days, um, now a cumulative six months of lockdown has wiped out thousands of businesses in my home state. And to hear the heartbreak of those people who call me every day saying how they lost their business. One of my favourite cafes is around the corner from me in St Kilda had a notice up on its, its door. My wife sent me the photo saying that they just couldn't cope any longer with that last lockdown. It knocked the legs out from them for the, the last time. They're not reopening after the lockdown. This is the tragedy that, that Labor won't see because they've never met a business that they, they, they um, don't hate. So this plan gives every Australian a goal to work towards to, uh, as a target, that, as a country that we can move towards. And then each state and territory must also reach their own targets. And I think the fear in, in most Australians' minds is once we've hit these targets, and these targets and this plan was agreed in national cabinet, are the states actually going to follow them? Now we've seen in the past, again last year in, in Victoria, that the, uh, the Andrews government, you know, agreed to things in national cabinet, and then walked out and did completely the opposite. It was woeful. And that's why you know, there's so much devastation in businesses, so many people are lonely, such high um, mental health rates in Victoria. And people are now triggered by the word lockdown in, in Victoria. We've had five. There's cases there today, and you know, I have no doubt that uh, the Chief Health Officer is whispering in Premier Andrew's ear, oh, why don't we, why don't we, uh, why don't we uh, go and um, do that? You want to talk about how many months of things? What about the six months that the Andrews government has locked down Victorians? I'll take the interjection all day, every day, Senator Pratt. 
Come on, bring it on. Well, I would love to debate you on this. Now, you know, if, are you allowed back into your state without quarantining? I don't think so. So keep up the interjections. I'll take them all the time. So, Madam Deputy President, the plan is clear. You know, phase A is where we are now, and we are seeing lockdowns. Phase B, when we hit 70 per cent of adults uh, age 16 plus fully vaccinated. We're making great progress towards this, uh, this um, target with uh, over a million doses a, a week going into the arms of Australians and more and those numbers growing each week as well. You know, the, uh, the stats show very clearly how you know, every million doses that are being uh, uh, dosed out to or given to uh, Australians is dropping. I think it's down to six days for every million last time I looked. Um, so we need to keep increasing these vaccination rates. And those opposite have done everything possible to try and stop people having confidence in the vaccine rollout. They've not got behind the AstraZeneca. They're trying to put thought bubbles out about $300 so people might hesitate and, and not get it so we don't hit those rates. Our national plan will work and those opposite need to get behind it and get behind Australians for once. Thank you, Senator Van, and uh, Senator Mariel Smith on remote. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I just want to comment briefly on the remarks made by Senator Van before me in this debate, taking note of questions by Labor senators, where he said that Labor has never met a business we don't hate. Completely absurd and offensive commentary from Senator Van, uh, given the nature of debate in this chamber today has been about economic support for individuals, about economic support for businesses. I know I personally have been supporting businesses and business owners through this time who have suffered tremendously because of these lockdowns, not just economically and financially, but in terms of their mental health, who are really, really struggling. And to suggest that I or other senators in this place hate businesses when we are currently trying to support them through something extremely tough and something your government has contributed to is horrifically offensive and disgusting. But to the matter at hand, the questions raised by Labor senators in Parliament in question time today that we're taking note of. Can we just look at the facts? Only 15 per cent of Australians are fully vaccinated. 15 per cent. So we know the order of vaccination we need to see to have some kind of roadmap or plan out of this is well above that. We're talking 70, 80 per cent in that, in that frame. We're at 15 per cent. 15 per cent. And Senator Colbeck couldn't even answer the specific questions that we had around the levels of vaccination in certain parts of Australia and in particular vulnerable parts of Australia. He says we're continuing to gather pace, the rollout's continuing to gather pace. Seriously, mate? Seriously? That's the best we've got? You can't answer specific questions about where we're at in the vaccine rollout when we know we need to get much, much higher. I think we need to see less back padding from this government, more arm jabbing. It's ridiculous. We need to get the vaccine rollout on track. We need jabs in arms. That is our ticket out of these lockdowns. These lockdowns which are causing enormous distress in my home state of South Australia and enormous distress, of course, in New South Wales, where they've been going on for weeks and weeks. And there are weeks and weeks at least ahead in the future for them there in New South Wales. Who knows what the future holds in Queensland? When we have a government, when this is going on, who just shrugs their shoulders and says, we'll be right, she'll be right, mate, it'll be OK, we'll get there. Well, Australians are sick of your complacency. Businesses are sick of your complacency. Australians are sick of your complacency and they're sick of your blame shifting. You had two jobs, the vaccine rollout and fixing the mess of quarantine. How are you doing on both of those? Less, back, less, less patting yourself on the back, please, and more jabs in arms. I think that would be a really, really good place to start. What's happened in South Australia recently, our week of lockdown, I know it was only a week and I acknowledge the states around Australia who are going through a lockdown much longer than that, but even one week of lockdown has tremendously difficult impacts on people in my home state in terms of their mental health and wellbeing, in terms of their social connectiveness, 
in terms of the impact on business and unemployment for people who can't work in the home and who don't have a job to go to if their business is shut down, if their workplace is shut down, not to mention the essential workers who do go to work every day to keep our economy moving, to keep us safe, to keep the essential services open during a lockdown at great risk, at great personal risk to themselves and to their families, many of whom who aren't vaccinated, many of whom haven't been eligible for a vaccination yet, who are working on our checkouts in our supermarkets, who are driving our buses and our trains, who are working in essential businesses and essential jobs, who are waiting for this vaccine rollout to ramp up to have the vaccinations available to be able to book in and have their jabs so they can be safe and protected at work. That's what they're waiting on this Commonwealth Government for. They're two pretty simple things. The vaccination rollout and, of course, fixing the mess of hotel quarantine, which is contributing to these outbreaks in the first place. Lockdowns are a necessary tool in combating the Delta variant. I understand that and appreciate that, and Australians do too. But they do expect the Commonwealth Government to be doing everything it can with all the policy levers it has available to it to minimise the impacts of this, to minimise the likelihood of future lockdowns and minimise the impact on the people who are living them and experiencing them. It's not about expecting you to have perfect 2020 vision in hindsight. It's about expecting you to respond to what's in front of you, to do the best by your fellow Australians, to use every lever in your arsenal to fight this and make it easier for those Australians doing it tough. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Brockman. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Well, I can't help but start by once again calling out the inane comment from senators opposite. They keep using it that the prime minister and the government only had two jobs. I mean, what nonsense is this? It shows a complete lack of understanding, a complete lack of insight in what it actually takes to govern this country, particularly through a pandemic. Now, we can go across the questions that were asked today, but I'm going to stay on the vaccine rollout because there are some key points that Australians do need to understand about the vaccine rollout, in particular how the vaccine rollout has ramped up significantly over the past few months. In March of this year, 770,000 vaccines. Uh, distributed into, into people. In April, 1.4 million. May, 2.1 million. June, 3.4 million. July, 4.5 million. We are regularly now hitting over a million doses of vaccine administered to Australians each and every week. In the last seven days, 1.2 million. Total doses administered so far, 12 point, uh, 12 and a half million I've got down here, but I think we're actually up to about 12.8 as of today. So every Australian who hear those figures knows that the vaccine rollout has ramped up significantly over the past few months, to a point now where in July, as I said, four and a half million doses delivered to Australians uh, across this country. Now, uh, do we need to see those rates continue? Absolutely. But those rates will mean that all those Australians who want a vaccine will be able to get one. 12.5 million doses administered, a million doses a week. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to realise that this will get the job done. Now, have there been setbacks? Absolutely. Uh, and, and the Prime Minister has been absolutely open about this. I myself was hit with one of the changes of advice from ATAGI. I was booked for my AstraZeneca vaccine. I'm going to reveal my age here, which is a bit sad. I don't like doing that. But I, I, know, I know. But nobody looks at the internet, Senator Wong. Um, so, um, uh, I, I was booked for an AstraZeneca vaccine, and, uh, and uh, that unfortunately uh, wasn't possible because of the change to TAGI rules um, uh, and, and I was rebooked for a, uh, a Pfizer vaccine which I've now had. Now in, in, in the long run I will actually be fully vaccinated 
with the Pfizer vaccine before I would have been with AstraZeneca due to the different times between the first and second doses of those two options. Now, they are both are very good vaccines, very efficacious, offer a lot of protection to the people of Australia. And as I have done before and as I will continue to do, I urge all, particularly my fellow West Australians, we are uh, uh, sadly a little bit behind on the leaderboard in terms of the rollout. We are a, a little bit behind in terms of the, uh, of the progress of the vaccination rollout in Western Australia. And I would urge all my West Australian fellow West Australian citizens to uh, get their names on those lists to register for their vaccination and uh, to enable uh, all of us as we move uh, through the roadmap over the next few months uh, to have uh, as much protection for ourselves, for our loved ones, for the communities in which we live as humanly possible. Um, we also have to remember, as we continue this vaccination rollout, that the path taken by the Australian government, with the absolute cooperation of the Australian people, has saved a, a large number of lives. Something like 30,000 lives saved by taking the path we have taken. Now, obviously, it's difficult in the current environment with the outbreak of Delta, and we are again facing these challenges. But I know that the Australian people will step up to the mark, uh, do what is required to be done over these next few difficult weeks and months ahead, and, above all, I know that they will register and they are registering for those vaccines that are available. Thank, Thank you, you. Senator Brockman. Uh, Senator Ciccone on remote. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, as I speak to you now, it's been more than 12 months on from the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic in Australia. Millions of Australians living under lockdown. And, and just to pick up a remark uh, by Senator Brockman, uh, we're not just a little bit behind, but in fact, Australia is 36 out of the 38 OECD nations. Um, and for the government to sort of just dismiss as if somehow we're doing okay, well, quite frankly, we're not. And if it wasn't for the opposition and others in the health profession putting pressure on the government, we'd still be dead last. Um, and in recent weeks, citizens right around the country have at all, at all or at some point uh, been confined to their homes in a very drastic attempt to stop the spread of this deadly virus. And it pains me as I talk today that locals, many locals in my community here in Victoria, to learn just how much these lockdowns have impacted upon their lives. Families separated, livelihoods hot, lost. But why? Why must it be this way? Why is it that now, over 12 months, that restrictions continue to be a feature of our daily life? As we look overseas, it is not hard to identify what at least part of the answer might be. Countries like the United Kingdom, Canada and Israel tower over Australia in the proportion of their populations that they've been vaccinated. In these countries, as in many others, a new COVID normal has been allowed to develop, one which is for most of the part free, free of lockdowns, curfews and other harsh measures which limit the freedom of their citizenry. There can be no doubt in that a key element of our pathway out of this mess is through vaccination. It's very simple. Sufficiently vaccinated Australians will help end the lockdowns, each inflicting billions of dollars of losses on businesses, both big and small. It will help end the border closures, the constantly cancelled holiday plans, and help us all get back to work. Australia's lagging vaccination rates are hardly a new phenomenon. They have been lagging since day one. Whether it's been insufficient supply, hesitation, or any other concern in between. More needs to be done. Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, uh, Madam Deputy President, this week Labor announced another element of its positive alternative plan to help Australia combat and recover from the coronavirus pandemic. It's these incentives that can help and indeed help play an important role in helping us all to get over vaccination rates where they need to be. And by no means is Labor alone in suggesting such measures. Offering incentives has been an important element of many other country plans to combat the pandemic in a positive manner. Sadly, 
those officers opposite have dismissed such measures out of hand. We're not making excuses for their own failings on vaccinations. That is, of course. Of course, this isn't the first time the Coalition has dismissed Labor's positive suggestions out of hand. Do we remember JobKeeper? The measure credited with saving countless jobs right around the country. Given the, the victory laps we've seen from the government, one could be forgiven for forgetting that this wasn't even their idea. And it's not just that it wasn't their idea, but that when Labor and those in the union movement first suggested it, those opposite also dismissed it completely out of hand. My hope is that the government will once again perform the same about face on this initiative. My hope is that instead of pointing the fingers at others for their own failings, that the coalition will see merit of this suggestion from Labor and implement it. If we are about to get where we need to be, it is imperative, imperative that we get jabs in arms. Any measure that gets us to that point should be entertained. To reject such measures simply because they came from Labor is irresponsible. I call on those in the government to stop the spin and start getting on with the job of keeping all Australians safe. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Giacconi. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Pratt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Madam Deputy President, I rise to take note of the answers given. Uh, to me uh, from uh, Senator uh, Birmingham representing the Prime Minister. And these questions were, of course, in relation to what the government is doing and what the Prime Minister is doing to stamp out misinformation and uh, lies, COVID lies, that are being spread by some members of his own team. Now, we heard uh, only a few days ago that YouTube have taken the extraordinary step of banning Sky News for a week because, in their view, Sky News breached their standards, that it was up to uh, YouTube to insist that facts and truth in relation to Sky News's broadcasts uh, need to be implemented rather than the lies and the myths and the conspiracy theories that are promoted by a number of members uh, who continue to uh, appear on Sky News and be promoted on that platform. Now, here's the question. If this information is dangerous enough to be stopped on the internet, then surely it's too dangerous to be on our television screens. But of course we know that Sky News broadcasts on their subscription service, but also on free-to-air television as well. So what is the government doing to step in and make sure that this dangerous misinformation, this undermining of our health response to COVID-19, putting people's lives at risk, is not getting a flogging on television? Where is our media regulator in all of this? The government's own media regulator sitting on its hands, doing nothing about it. And you wonder why. Well, they're taking their lead from the very top, the Prime Minister, who's doing nothing to sanction and to put, call out and to pull, put into line members on his own bench who have actively been undermining the work of doctors, of nurses, of our emergency service workers, of our essential workers, of the people who day in, day out are dealing with the realities of COVID spreading across this nation once again. And as millions of Australians today are in lockdown and millions more living with restrictions, we've just got a, a, a WA Premier who's just called a snap press conference over in the West. We're all <laughs> holding our breath, hoping that that's not bad news, but we all know it probably will be. This country is in a COVID crisis, and rather than holding whack jobs to account on his own side, the Prime Minister continues to turn a cheek. We've got George Christensen purporting and promoting and pushing COVID lies, 
undermining the good work of our health officials, undermining the, any success of the vaccine rollout. And we've got government senators like Senator Rennick doing the same thing. Senator Hanson, I, I'm just going, Hanson Young, please stop the clock. I'm going to ask you to withdraw the word that shouldn't be uttered here, where, specifically when it refers to a member or a senator, and that is the, the word lie. Spreading COVID lies. Um, Senator Hanson, I'm, I, I, we adopt, have traditionally adopted a very strict term on the use of the word lies. Um, it is a very slippery slope. I'm going to ask you to withdraw that. There are other words that can be used to convey the same meaning that we have not you traditionally had such a strict approach to. Well, um, Mr. President, I'll withdraw the word lie. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. However, the point I am making is that conspiracy theories, made up facts, self-appointed experts are undermining the government's own job from within. COVID terrorists, almost. Sabotaging the good work of our health experts. Now, billions of dollars has been spent out of the government coffers in the last 12 months, hundreds of billions of dollars spent to stop the spread of this virus, to help our community stay safe. And rather than helping, we've got members of Morrison's own team Can I, again, undermining and sabotaging. Senator Hanson Young, again, I'm just going to ask people to, re to maintain the level of debate by referring to people by their titles or their names. We don't refer to people simply by their surname in this place. Mr Morrison is sitting on his hands while members of his own team are running around sabotaging this country's health response, putting at risk the safety of every single Australian. He needs to be a leader and call them out. Order. The question is, the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion? Senator Dunningham. Um, Mr President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the hours of meeting for Thursday the 5th of August 2021. Leave granted. It is. Senator Dunningham. Uh, Mr President, I move that on Thursday the 5th of August 2021 the Senate meet after the ringing of the bells to enable senators to attend the Prime Minister's presentation of the annual report on progress in the closing the gap targets in the House of Representatives. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any other notices of motion? There being none, I shall proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? I'll call the clerk in that case. A postponement, a postponement notification has been lodged as follows from Senator Patrick for business of the Senate number one for today to the 9th of August. I remind senators that question may be put at the request of any senator. There being none, we shall move on to the discovery of formal business, and I'll just run through them in the order I have them. I understand business of the Senate matter number two will be debated, along and business of the Senate matter number three. So I'll move to business of the Senate matter number four in the name of Senator Green. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. Um, on behalf of Senator Green, I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number four be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunham. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the, this government is getting on with delivering primary care for all Australians. Since March 2020, we have invested $6.2 billion into the COVID primary care response and the, in the most recent budget. We invested $1.8 billion to further strengthen primary care. Medicare investment increases each year and bulk billing numbers are at an historic all-time high. Our stronger rural health strategy continues to give doctors more opportunities to train and practice in regional, rural and remote Australia, delivering 700 additional GPs and 700 additional nurses to the regions to date. Question is the motion moved by Senator Urquhart for Senator Green be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
I'm going to I'm going to lock the doors and ask people to use the rear advisors boxes if they need to and give the whips the time that they need. So stop the bells. Whips are happy. The question is the motion moved by Senator Urquhart, business of the Senate number four, be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell up the ayes, and Senator Smith, tell up the nose. The result of the division is ayes 17, noes 12. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. We will now go to government of the business matter number one. Senator Dunham, is that you? Thank you, Mr President. Um, I ask that government of business notice of motion number one be taken as formal. Any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunham. I move that the following bill be introduced a bill for an act to amend the law relating to counter terrorism and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dunningham. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read for a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to counter terrorism and for related purposes. Senator Dunningham. I table the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard's. Leave granted. It is. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to the 18th of October 2021. I'll now proceed to general business motions and commence with Senator McKim on behalf of Senator Seawitt. Uh, thank you, President. On behalf of Senator Seawitt, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1192 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. As advised by the Leader of the Government in the Senate immediately after question time yesterday, the modelling is all published and available on the PMC website. There are three particular documents available uh, on that website. Doherty Modelling Report for National Cabinet, 30 July 2021, Addendum to Doherty Modelling Report for National Cabinet, 30 July 2021, and Findings and Implications of the Doherty Institute COVID-19 Modelling Presentation. The question is the motion moved by uh, number 1192 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator McMahon, 1193. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 1193, proposing that introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator McMahon. I move that the following bill be introduced: a bill for an act to amend the Northern Territory Self-Government Act, 1978, and repeal the Euthanasia Laws Act, 1997, and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator McMahon. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities 
and be now read a first time. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. For an act to amend the Northern Territory Self-Government Act 1978 and repeal the Euthanasia Laws Act 1997 and for related purposes. Senator McMahon. I move that this bill now read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? It is. Senator McMahon. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? It is. Thank you, Senator McMahon. I'll now go to 1194 in the name of Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek uh, leave to withdraw that motion. Is leave granted? It is. I'll go to 1195 in the name of Senator Patrick. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I, I ask the general business notice of motion number 1195 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Patrick. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Leave is granted for one minute. Mr President, the Liberal National Government is committed to working with the states in a bipartisan manner to supporting the implementation of the plan through the recovery of water through the $1.33 billion off-farm efficiencies, uh, $234 million for community activity while ruling out further buybacks that cost jobs and hurt our regional base and communities. The question is the motion moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Patrick, 1196. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I ask that General Business Notice, notice of Motion number 1196 uh, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Patrick. I move the motion. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. The question is the motion moved by Senator Patrick, 1196, be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart to tell off the ayes. Senator Smith, tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 17, noes 13. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator McKim, uh, will you be moving the matter for Senator Rice? I am, thank you, President. On behalf of Senator Rice, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1197 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The Jakarta Centre for Law Enforcement Cooperation is an independent Indonesian institution operating under Indonesian law. Individual programs are sponsored by a variety of international partners, including the AFP and other Australian government agencies. This matter has been extensively examined during Senate estimates hearings, and with questions on notice answered in full, the government believes this motion only represents an unnecessary diversion of resources. Question is the motion moved. Oh, Senator Gallagher. Thank you. Could I seek leave to make a short statement? Leave is granted for one minute. Um, Labor will not be supporting this motion. We will always be a strong advocate for human rights internationally, and we remain concerned about ongoing reports of violence in West Papua. All sides must show restraint and engage in genuine dialogue. Labor reaffirms that Australians should not be directly or indirectly involved in perpetuating human rights abuses. There are valid questions to ask about this issue. Are, these are complex foreign and national security matters, and this motion goes beyond what we think is appropriate. Labor will continue to use the appropriate channels, such as estimates and briefings from the government on this matter. The question is the motion moved by Senator McKim for Senator Rice, 1197, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. I only heard one voice. The eyes have ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 1197 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator McKim teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 5, noes 26. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Gallagher, 1201. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1201 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Gallagher. Thank you. I move the motion. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Sorry, I meant to be somewhere else. Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 1201 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart tell the ayes and Senator Smith tell for the noes.
Result of the division is ayes 14, noes 13. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Gallagher, number 1202, in your name, the final matter. Oh, I don't know how we won that. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number 1202, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as a formal. Be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the following bill be introduced: a bill for an act to amend the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act 2013, and for related purposes. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. I present the bill and, and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Bill for an act to amend the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act 2013 and for related purposes. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? It is. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. And I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? It is. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. That concludes the discovery of formal business, so I'll let senators work their way around the chamber before we commence the MPI. Can I ask senators to take their seats or leave the chamber? I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 12 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Wong. Pursuant to Dear Mr President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The failure of the Prime Minister to deliver a speedy, effective rollout of COVID-19 vaccines and safe national quarantine, meaning that 10 million Australians begin the week yet again languishing in lockdown. Is the proposal supported? The proposal is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly. Senator Gallagher. Thank you very much, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Is that right? Um, thank you. And I welcome the opportunity to speak uh, today in the chamber about the Morrison government's failure to deliver the effective vaccine rollout and failure to deliver safe national quarantine, meaning that we do have millions of Australians, 10 million Australians, who are currently living under lockdown situations. And I think it's worth having uh, to go back and having a look at what happened right from the beginning of the vaccine rollout to answer the question, why has it been such a shambles and why has there been so much confusion around the public messaging and why has every target or commitment given by this government failed to be achieved or reached? And it starts right back at the beginning of the announcements around the vaccine uh, procurement strategy. When at the beginning of November, the Prime Minister told all of Australia that Australia is at the front of the queue. That is where this, uh, the, the misinformation and the commitments given but never reached started. This was the day that the Prime Minister announced a deal for 10 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine and 40 million from Novavax, saying that Australia was at the front of the queue for the mRNA vaccines. Of course, as now one of the issues with our low vaccination rates is 
the failure to have adequate supply of the uh, Pfizer vaccine, we know that being front of the queue was simply not true. The Prime Minister also said, we aren't putting all our eggs in one basket and we will continue to pursue further vaccines should our medical experts recommend them. And again, either the experts failed to provide the government with the advice that was actually needed by this country, or the Prime Minister chose to have a very reduced number of deals. When you look around other countries, they were, uh, they were signing up to six or seven, five, six or seven deals. The Australian government made an absolutely clear decision not to do that. The, the Prime Minister then committed to having four million Australians vaccinated by the end of March. He made this commitment in January 2021. Of course, we all know now this was never reached either. On the 31st of January, the Health Minister, Greg Hunt, says Australia will be fully vac vaccinated by October. He states that we aim to have the country 20 million adults vaccinated before the end of October. We now know, of course, that that won't happen either. On the 1st of February 2021, the Prime Minister made another promise that all Australians who want a vaccine will be vaccinated by October. But just a few days later, the failure to deliver on, on commitment started. On the 5th of February, the Health Secretary, Professor Murphy, said that it's more realistic that Australia will hit the 4 million um, vaccinated by early April rather than mid-March. So this was just a matter of a few weeks after the Prime Minister had given that commitment they were accepting that they weren't going to meet it. On the 15th of February, the Prime Minister sets a new target of 60,000 doses for February instead of the 80,000 he promised in January. On the 16th of February, the Health Minister announced that the aged care vaccination rollout will take approximately six weeks. Remember that? Still not done. Still not done. That was on the 16th of February. And here we are in August. And we know there's still aged care residents to be vaccinated with their second dose, and we know that the aged care workforce, the ones that are actually bringing the virus into aged care residential settings, uh, has, haven't been vaccinated. And we learnt just a couple of weeks ago that the home care workforce, nobody actually knows what's happening to them because there isn't a plan, because a decision was taken to not really pursue the home care workforce because they were too wound up with how they were failing to meet the residential aged care vaccination targets. On the 28th of February this year, the government's target of 60,000 doses by the end of February, we find out that only about half of those had been administered. So right from the get-go, every target set by this government has failed. And then on the 11th of March, just a mo month after the Prime Minister says everyone will be vaccinated, everyone who wants to be vaccinated will be fully vaccinated by October, Professor Murphy says again, he bells the cat, yet, well, we don't know whether we'll be able to achieve two shots by the end of October. On the 31st of March, the day that we were meant to hit the target of four million vaccinations by the end of March, the Prime Minister fails to meet the target he set himself by 3.4 million vaccinations. So where he promised 4 million, he delivered 600,000. A week later, what a surprise, there's a rollout recalibration. And, he, and the Prime Minister announces that after ATAGI advice, Pfizer will now be the preferred vaccine for under 50s. And what a surprise, there isn't enough. This is where the shortage of supply, because we failed to secure a deal with Pfizer that allowed for these, this sort of redundancy. On the 11th of April, the commitment to have all of aged care residents and workers and disability care residents fully vaccinated by Easter, that failed, that went. And somehow, a few months later, we find out that their decision had been taken to take disability residents out of that because they were prioritising aged care residents, which they didn't meet, and nobody told people working in the disability sector or people living with a disability themselves that that decision had been taken. 
On 12 April, the Prime Minister releases a video statement where he announces that Australia no longer has vaccination targets. What a surprise, considering that the targets the government had set themselves had been missed and had failed. We got promised 13 pop-up vaccine clinics to get aged care done and disability care services that would be opened by the end of May in New South Wales, but by July just three were listed on the Department of Health website. In May, the May ta vaccination target of six million vaccinated by May was failed. Then the next day, the 11th of May, the Treasurer states in his budget speech that every Australian who'd like to get two shots of that vaccine will be able to do so by the end of the year. Well, we know that didn't last a day before the Prime Minister overruled the Treasurer and made it clear that it's actually not government policy any longer to have a commitment that Australians will have access to two doses by the end of the year. Now the targets move to, well, we'll just hope that you'll have one dose or you'll be offered a vaccine by October. The Prime Minister says these aren't our assumptions any longer. They are not the policy settings. On 28 May, Australia reaches 3.9 million vaccinations, two months behind the original schedule, which predicted four million doses by the end of March. The 13 pop-up clinics that were promised are still, at the end of May, only three of them. In aged care, in June, the aged care minister acknowledges that he doesn't know how many people in the aged care workforce have been vaccinated and health officials say only 10 per cent of the workforce has been reached through in-house vaccination programs and at least 20 aged care facilities are to be visited as part of the aged care residents' vaccination rollout. This is in June. The vaccination rollout started in February and aged care residents, disability residents, workers in those areas, they were 1A. They were meant to be done in the first six weeks. On the 19th of June, we got a new term, horizons. That was to replace the word targets, we think. We haven't had an ad campaign. We've had um, strategies. We've had um, plans. We've had horizons. We've had targets. And now we've got a campaign plan being launched. It seems every time something goes wrong with the vaccine rollout, another document comes out, more phases, 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B. That's now phases A, B and C. And now we have the, mo the Doherty modelling announcing different arrangements that are being put in place. Is it any wonder people are confused about what's going on? There hasn't been an ad campaign to target people around the vaccination because we haven't had enough supply, because we didn't have enough deals, because decisions taken last year have turned out to, be, to fail the Australian people in terms of getting an efficient rollout, to getting it done properly and to making sure we're protecting vulnerable people. None of that, which should have guided the strategy, has actually been achieved today, some six months after the rollout started. Senator Davey. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, look, you know, uh, it's all well and good to be very negative in uh, what is uh, a negative in a very trying and difficult time. It's all well and good to, with hindsight, say that we should have had multiple vac vaccine deals with multiple vaccine companies who have not even put in an application to have their vaccinations approved for use in Australia yet. Um, it's all well and good to, to say that the Prime Minister has failed, but that is a very, very harsh judgment. Our government under the Prime Minister have spent the last 561 days working day and night with the health experts, listening to the health ex um, advice to try and deal with this pandemic. We were one of the first nations in the world to actually notify that the virus was, um, was a human pandemic potential. That was in January 2020, at the same time as we were dealing with devastating bushfires and trying very hard to keep our country and our morale up 
at that time, we were already listening to the health experts. We were already watching this pandemic, and we have continued to be working with the health experts ever since. We have worked hard, and our efforts, which initially had the full support of the Labor Party, um, are estimated to have saved over 30,000 lives. We've supported over 3 million Australians through JobKeeper while keeping Australia's economy on track, with over 1 million Australians getting back to work. We have invested more than 370 million now that is 659,000 per day since the pandemic began in support for COVID-19 research and development. As at the start of August, we've now got 5,000 GPs practicing, uh, practices playing a crucial role in administering the COVID vaccine rollout. And while, yes, I accept Senator Gallagher's um, accurate reflection that we missed a target, we didn't have 4 million people vaccinated by April. That is right. The Prime Minister has acknowledged this, and he has publicly apologised for um, missing the mark. But we have turned that round. We had met the four million mark by mid-June. We are now vaccinating a million people a day. And just in the last 28 days, um, we have administered over four million doses. So we're now doing four million doses a month, which has really turned it, turned it round. We've also got our pharmacies, our community pharmacies on board to start delivering or to deliver vaccinations. And I also want to acknowledge the work of the Royal Flying Doctor Service, who have been out and about in our most regional and remote communities and have administered 9,200 vaccine do doses across 88 remote communities, including uh, remote Indigenous communities. I also want to mention the important work our government is doing to support other countries, countries in the South Pacific, who are being crucified by this pandemic. We have sent over 153.6 million doses. Sorry, over 153 million doses have been distributed around the world to 137 countries, and we have helped our neighbours and friends in Papua New Guinea, Timor-Leste, Fiji and the Solomon Islands get their hands on crucial doses to help their populations, because we don't turn our back on our neighbour. This pandemic is immeasurable, but this motion goes to show how out of touch Labor is with the everyday Australian. There is so much health advice that is coming out uh, from those opposite that doesn't necessarily reflect the advice that the experts are giving us. Australians know that our government is behind them. We are working our hardest to ensure that we get through COVID and that our economy is in a position to be able to recover and respond. Thank you. Senator Seward. We can't hear Senator Seward. Do you want to log out and log back in? We can see you, Senator Seward, but we can't hear you. Do we have any advice from Hansard as to what she needs to do? Senator Seward, you need to log out and log back in. And we we will go proceed to Jenny, uh, Senator McAllister, if she is online. I am. Um, Senator McAllister. <coughs> Madam Acting, Dep Acting Deputy President, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Loud and clear. That's terrific. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, millions of Australians across the country are now in a COVID-19 lockdown because the Prime Minister has bundled the two jobs that were most important this year, rolling out the vaccine 
and fixing the nation's quarantine system. Let's be very clear about what is happening. Lockdowns are still happening because the Prime Minister didn't treat the rollout as a race. It was always a race. Uh, the rollout remains the most important job the government has, and they need to use every option that they have to speed it up because it is not going well. In the rollout race, Australia is coming 84th, 84th in the world. And as Malcolm Turnbull recently pointed out, and I quote him, it is a colossal failure. He went on to say, and I'll quote him again, it is the biggest failure of public administration that he can recall. And it costs a lot, estimated around $300 million a day. The economy is bleeding hundreds of millions of dollars a day and billions each week because Mr Morrison has not done his job. And it's a price being paid by Australian workers and by Australian small businesses for his incompetence. Now, I remember really well how difficult things were at the beginning of the pandemic for Chinese Australian businesses, particularly the restaurants. And at that time, I spoke with Chinese Australian representatives uh, in Burwood, down in Hurstville, about the challenges that they were facing at a time of real uncertainty and fear, but also of rising racism, let's be honest. So I have kept a track on how these communities and these businesses are going. And there was a story the other day about the restaurateur Vivian Chen, uh, who runs Yang's Dumpling Restaurant in Burwood. And she talked in the story about just how devastating it is to be back in lockdown in 2021. She pulled her business through the challenges in 2020 but this time it's really tough. And she said this, and I'll quote it. She said, this lockdown is proving very, very hard for us. Our business is more than 75% down compared to this time last year. And it's really bad now. There are virtually no customers. Yesterday I made $200, which isn't even enough to cover my employee costs. I really want to keep my staff because if they go, I won't have staff anymore when this lockdown is finished. She said that many of her friends had already closed their businesses, struggled during the previous lockdown, and this one is proving to be the last straw. She said they couldn't manage with their opening and their closing, opening and closing, so they've given up and closed permanently. It's these small businesses and the workers that they employ that are bearing the brunt of these lockdowns, and we owe it to them to fix it, to fix up the, the rollout and fix up the quarantine. Of course, it's possible to quantify the impact, the economic impact with a number. But we don't live in an economy, we live in a society. And although it's more difficult to quantify the impact on the lockdown, on the bonds between us, it doesn't make that impact any less real. And in Sydney, it seems likely that children will go for months without having a lesson in a classroom or being able to play with their friends. People won't be able to meet their newborn nieces and nephews and older Australians are increasingly isolated without contact with their loved ones. And we've lost the ability to do simple things like have a conversation with our neighbours. Our communities really are the sum of these genuine, sometimes casual human interactions and technologies like Zoom and Skype really don't substitute for them. None of this is an argument against lockdowns. Public health officials are rightly telling us that short and sharp lockdowns are amongst the best tools that we have right now to avoid a devastating spread of the Delta variant. But all of this is an argument for having fought tooth and nail previously, back when we had the space and the time to put in place the conditions that would have allowed us to avoid this. Every dollar that the Prime Minister saved by not ordering more and diverse range of vaccines back in 2020 is looking very expensive indeed. And every excuse that he provided for his refusal to establish a national quarantine facility looks very foolish indeed. Now, has there been any real reckoning with any of this? any sincere examination of performance. Not really. 
there's a continuing insistence that everything is going actually quite well. There's been little regret, much less sincere apology. Indeed, there's been deflection, blame shifting, the point where it's surely getting a little embarrassing for the Prime Minister's own team, because it's always someone else's fault. Headline after headline, press conference after press conference. It's not his fault. It's a targi. It's the Italians. It's the aged care workers who didn't get you know, themselves organised. It's somebody else's fault, but it's never his. And this week in a new low, the coalition is bizarrely trying to assert that it's the opposition's fault. Now, this is fanciful and just a little desperate, right? Labor has always supported the health advice, 100%. We support it about lockdowns. We support it about Pfizer. We support it about AstraZeneca. And any suggestion to the contrary is total nonsense. And unlike the Prime Minister, we have never sought to undermine the health advice, never attacked a target, never sought to influence their advice through waging some sort of public campaign. My letter, Mr Albanese, and our entire federal lab team have supported the science and supported the evidence around the pandemic. And that is a position that really can be distinguished from the behaviour of the Prime Minister and the people around him, especially, especially that group of backbenchers who have sought to gain political advantage by micro-targeting messages to the anti-lockdown crowd and the anti-vaccine crowd. This is... Oddly enough, a government that seems determined to behave like an opposition. It really is quite strange. They would rather point the finger, complain about external circumstances and actually take responsibility for delivering and for leading. Because what you need, what we need right now as a community is actually leadership. We need real leaders willing to step up and accept the heavy burden of leadership at a really difficult time. We need leaders to take decisions in the national interest. Australia is facing the biggest health crisis in a century. And if Scott Morrison, Mr Morrison and his team do not want the job of governing under those circumstances, they really should get out of the way. Labor does have a plan to beat COVID-19 to support our community through this pandemic. And it starts with treating the rollout like a race. We would bring the necessary urgency to this task if we were governing. We'd work to increase supply by talking closely with the vaccine companies, with our allies. We would vaccinate frontline workers by bringing the vaccine to them rather than putting the burden on them to organise their own arrangements. We wouldn't blame them, certainly, like the Morrison government has. And we build the capability to start manufacturing vaccines here. We recognise what is required to lead. And we recognise the imperative for leadership at this time. The Morrison government's failures have left millions of people in very, very difficult circumstances. And it is time that instead of deflecting blame and saying that it is someone else's fault, that they stood up and took responsibility for leading at this most difficult time. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Seward? Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, great. Please proceed. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, the Greens are supporting this MPI about the failure of the Prime Minister to deliver a speedy, effective rollout of COVID-19 vaccines and safe national quarantine meaning that 10 million Australians begin the week yet again in lockdown, languishing in lockdown. When it comes to getting out of COVID, the government had a number of key tasks. Vaccines and quarantine were key. Yet the Morrison government failed to secure enough vaccine or enough diversity of vaccines. They failed to provide clear messaging and advice and they failed to provide us with an evidence-based pathway out of this mess. I welcome the release of the modelling from the Doherty Institute that was used to inform the government's national plan to reopen Australia. But this only prompts more questions. For example, 
why weren't the Doherty Institute asked to model the impact of reopening our borders? Under phase C of the government's plan, caps on returned Australians would be abolished and international travel restrictions would be lifted. So many Australians have felt the heartbreak um, impact of border closures. For many people, life is on hold until our borders are open once more. Everyone knows, deserves to know when the government is planning on reopening borders and the associated risks involved. It's a huge shortcoming and I'm disappointed the government hasn't asked um, for this information. So many Australians are hanging out to see relatives and their loved ones. And so many Australians are hanging out to come home. The Doherty Institute also looked at what would happen if we had partial or optimal effectiveness of testing, tracing, isolation and quarantine. We do not have optimal contact tracing and quarantine arrangements in Australia. This is abundantly clear from the 27 breaches of hotel quarantine, which have sent us into so many lockdowns. So if our contact tracing and quarantine is only partially effective, the Doherty Institute predicts we will still continue to need lockdowns for 18 to 22% of the time once 70% of the population is vaccinated. The government is gambling with our future by refusing to include children in its vaccination target. Again, the Doherty Institute thinks that vaccinating children would only achieve modest reduction in transmission. Yet we know that children aged 0 to 19 account for more COVID cases in Australia than people aged 70 and over. Children can catch and transmit COVID, evident through the outbreaks in Queensland at the moment. Children can also catch COVID from their vaccinated parents. This is another reason why we need to understand exactly what the government asked the Doherty Institute to model. That is very unclear. While the government is asking, um, is making critical decisions about our way out of COVID, private consulting companies are continuing to make huge profits. Um, and, and yet we still have significant uh, troubles and mistakes made through the vaccine rollout. We have no idea about the qualities of the strategic planning they're supposed to have given, the advice and case studies they're supposed to have given, or whether they are even used in decision making. These are all confidential uh, reports. I'd just like to say on a personal note uh, and encourage people to get vaccinated. My mother and I have now had our second dose. We got vaccinated together, both being in 1B. Please. I urge Australians to get vaccinated. We need the government to come clean about what are their targets and when we will be able to Senator open our borders. Senator Seward, your time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I've made a habit now of uh, thanking the opposition for the opportunity to be able to speak uh, on matters of public importance that they bring before this chamber and uh, now is no different. Because when they're writing them, they must think that the wording is clever, they, that they'll get a few runs on the board today and that somehow they'll embarrass the government. Uh, but in reality, what they actually do is expose themselves. They give us the opportunity time after time to come in here and talk about their lack of policy and how they've managed to go through this whole pandemic without making a sing single meaningful contribution to the public debate. And they've come up here with these really clever campaign slogans about how we have two jobs, uh, much the same uh, with how this MPI is worded here today. Uh, they've put a lot of time into developing that little campaign. Uh, just think, uh, writing all those talking points, getting them out to all the MPs, putting them on social media, so that they can trot them out to anyone who will listen. They've taken months of preparation, months of saying the same thing over and over again, trying to get into people's minds, and this week they've managed to unwind it all. One policy announcement, and all of that effort, all of that effort was wasted. The Leader of the Opposition fronted the media and came out with his grand plan to get Australians vaccinated. Give them cash, he said, $300 to anyone everyone who gets the jab. Firstly, it's a massive insult to Australians, to the intelligence of Australians. And that's the whole debate. 
That, and that's a whole debate to have in and of itself. But most significantly, by making this announcement, Labor have finally come to the party and backed our vaccine plan. They have finally admitted that we actually are in a position to get between 70 to 80 per cent of Australians vaccinated by Christmas. Otherwise, they wouldn't be out there saying that we should be giving them $300, because they have confirmed what we already know on this side is that we have the supply of vaccines for every Australian who want one to have one by Christmas. And just like that, they have undermined months, months of their own scare campaigns. So why the $300? Because it's true there are many in our community that do have some reluctance. There's a lot of misinformation flying about, uh, about the vaccine strategy, and I must say that those opposite are actually doing little to deal with it. Because just like what they did with JobKeeper, they had to fight it every single step of the way. They had to try and undermine it, and when it wound down, uh, it was, they were saying that it was going to cause mass unemployment. They said the economic apocalypse would come. They claimed that it would come, but it never came. In fact, quite the opposite. The lowest unemployment rate in 10 years. Did we hear any retraction? Did we hear any admission that their predictions did not come true? Sadly, no. I wonder if I can be surprised by those opposite when we get to Christmas and we've achieved those targets set out by the Prime Minister that I know that Australians will step up to, <coughs> will those opposite acknowledge that their gloomy predictions were wrong? Will they bring themselves here to the Senate for an hour like we are with this MPI and acknowledge that you got it wrong and celebrate Australia's success? Or will they yet again bring to the Senate some other, some other political point score? Because just like they've, they have with every policy response uh, that we've put in this place, uh, that we've put in place to deal with the economic and health consequences of this pandemic, they either go too far, they don't go far enough, they say, it's too big or too small, or you name it, because they've brought up every single argument they can to undermine it. Yet here we are, having been able to deal with the response of the pandemic like no other nation in the world. You wouldn't want to be anywhere else. And this vaccine rollout will be no different. Already more than 12.5 million doses have been administered, and we're now hitting well over 1 million doses every week, over 200,000 a weekday. Day. A total of 4.5 million vaccinations were given in July, which is more than double, double the amount achieved in May when 2.1 million doses were administered. Sure, there have been issues. There have been issues of supply. We have resolved those issues. The Prime Minister, working with his leadership, have dealt with those problems. And uh, Not all the calls that we have made have gone out as we had hoped, but we have turned the corner. What they fail to understand is that every time a new campaign hits the airwaves, particularly in relation to the vaccine rollout, where we have hesitancy in the community, more and more people second-guess the efficacy of the program. They're doing nothing to underscore the efficacy of the program. They're undermining it every step of the way. They're turning what should be a medical conversation to a political one. And that should never be the case. And we're seeing it here with the substance of this MPI. And it's absolutely despicable. There have been setbacks. Of course there have. Never before has a nation had to deal with a, max, with a rollout and the scale that we're dealing with right now. But this is what Australian families are dealing with. But unlike those opposite, we're capable of wearing those setbacks. We're capable of owning them, correcting them and, importantly, moving on. The Prime Minister has done that. And we're on the home stretch. The next six months will be the defining moment, the definitive moment in our response. Every nation is racing to get people vaccinated. The world is opening up again. They won't be waiting for Australia. But we'll be ready for when that happens. We'll be ready because we're on track and we have an achievable time frame with the rate of vaccines that are occurring right now. 
with the pipeline of vaccines available, with the health staff that we have, fantastic health staff, GPs, pharmacists and infrastructure in place to get the job done. We know that we can do it. We know that Australians will step up. We know that Australians are stepping up to roll up their sleeves and are having that jab. This is a massive, massive national effort, unlike anything we've ever seen. That's a phrase that uh, you hear often. You hear it often, but it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. It requires everyone to get on board, to either have the vaccine either have the vaccine or be having conversations in the community with those that have concerns. And that's why I would say it's a great national effort. Labor just needs to join the team. Labor just needs to get in behind Australia, not seek to undermine it for some sort of political score, some sort of political point. Now I know many of the senators on that side of the chamber. That they're good people. They're good people. And I know that they're better than these cheap campaigns. There's a few, Senator Farrell. This isn't time for cheap political points. We're coming up to an election soon, and there will be plenty of time for that during the election campaign. Between now and Christmas, this is about getting behind Australia, supporting those that need to go and get the vaccine and supporting those that have got some hesitancy. We understand that. Now's the time to join us. Now's the time to join with Australians as they make the decision to come forward and get vaccinated. Every day that you're trying to make vaccines political, you're making those last few percentage points of people getting the vaccine that little bit harder to reach. Now, I expect you to disagree with what I've just said. I expect you to disagree with what I've just said, but you've got to step up. In Victoria, some of the statements of the Labor candidate for Higgins is something that no doubt ought to disappoint every single person in this room undermining the efficacy of the AstraZeneca vaccine. I won't, I won't even uh, repeat the things that have been said, because I don't want to give them any credence at all. Now, I'm not a doctor, that's a full disclaimer, but I have as much information available to me as anyone else in this place, and I can say that those statements that have been said are not grounded in fact, yet we have candidates for the Labor Party out there sprout, sprouting this stuff. But those are the sorts of views that we're hearing from your side of politics, views put to the Australians that they're deciding whether to come forward for a vaccine. The path for Australia is clear. Life after lockdowns, no restrictions, opening up the rest of the world again to the rest of the world again uh, and seeing Australians getting vaccinated. This is what we need to do. You should be dedicating yourselves to encourage people to do so, to get out and get vaccinated, rather than scoring cheap political points. You're better than that. You're better than that. Let's work together. Let's work together before Christmas so that we have even more reason to celebrate at Christmas than what we already have. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This matter of public importance raises five important questions. Can everyday Australians, while locked up under house arrest in Queensland, South Australia, New South Wales or Victoria, tell the difference between the Liberal Party response and the Labor Party response to COVID? I can't. Can truck drivers and workers who need to cross a border for their livelihood tell the difference between Labor's border closures and Liberal National's border closures? I can't. Can grieving Australians needing to travel to see a sick loved one or attend a funeral tell the difference between Labor states' callous restrictions and Liberal National states' callous restrictions? I can't. Are Labor Premiers standing up for small and medium businesses? No, they're not. Liberal and Labor Premiers are wreaking equal destruction of businesses, marriages and lives. On Senator O'Neill's question regarding the vaccination program, can everyday Australians who believe in my body, my choice, tell the difference between the threats, intimidation and coercion that Liberal Scott Morrison, Gladys <laughs> Berejiklian and Stephen Marshall use, and the threats, intimidation and coercion that Labor's Dan Andrews, Mark McGowan and Anastasia Palaszczuk use. I can't. Has the Prime Minister, has one state Premier, Liberal or Labor, stood up for the, every, for the rights of everyday Australians to manage COVID, not hide from it? No, they have not. Have you even asked Australians what the people want? No, you have not. Millions of Australians are currently under house arrest as a result of a COVID protocol that the Liberal National and Labor parties, acting in concert as one party, enthusiastically imposed on Australians. It's a protocol that says a sick person is sick until proven healthy. 
yet sick until proven healthy, is the same as guilty until proven innocent. Both represent a totalitarian mindset, a mindset to control that would have been soundly rejected at any other point in our history and should be rejected now. There's no difference between the Labor and Liberal National Party when it comes to COVID response. None. As in so many areas, Labor unites with the Liberal Nationals. Senator Ruckett. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. This motion captures the deep frustration and pain of the Australian people regarding the failure of the Prime Minister Morrison to deliver a speedy, effective rollout of COVID-19 vaccines and a safe national quarantine, meaning that 10 million Australians yet again are languishing in lockdown. In the last 24 hours, we've heard some outrageous statements by those opposite somehow trying to link Labor senators' concerns about this government's abject failure in these areas to the Olympic Games. Yesterday we heard Senator Hughes attempt to describe Labor as unpatriotic and unsupportive of Team Australia because we demand on behalf of the Australian people an efficient vaccine rollout that allows Australians to get on with their lives, to be safe and out of lockdown. We could describe Senator Hughes's awkward attempts to draw this connection as a double backflip with a sideways deflection. In fact, she flipped so many times we were concerned that she may stumble and lose her balance entirely. And today we heard Senator Chandler perform a magnificent long jump, long jump as, a, um, and as she sincerely explained that we must learn to be flexible and adapt. What a magnificent leap that was, and what an insult to the millions of Australians who have juggled homeschooling with working from home, the businesses that have built online stores, the cafes and restaurants that turned to takeaways, the churches, artists and community organisations who have rebuilt their congregations and audiences online, the teachers who switched to online classrooms almost overnight and health workers who have been so flexible with their working hours that they have not seen their families for days and worked to the point of exhaustion. The majority of Australians have done an amazing and courageous job to pivot and adapt to this pandemic. They do not need or deserve lectures from the Liberal Party senators on this subject. They deserve an efficient and effective vaccine program. They deserve world-class quarantine facilities, and they're tired of this rubbish from a government which has proven itself un utterly unable to show leadership. The Prime Minister is excellent at dodging the facts, gives a gold medal performance at avoiding the apology that he owes the country, and is truly gifted at coming last. Because for all Senator Hughes' sidesteps and deflections, we are coming last in the developed world when it comes to the vaccine rollout. And in my part of the world, northwest Tasmania, the data the government released this week shows that we are towards the tail end of the field. In the northwest, just 21.8 per cent of people aged over 15 having been fully vaccinated, 5 per cent behind Launceston and 3.5 per cent behind the capital Hobart. On first jabs, the situation is markedly worse. 9 uh, 9, a full 9 per cent behind Hobart. Many are struggling to access vaccinations. They still can't go to their pharmacy for a COVID jab, and despite workplace pro uh, programs for flu vaccinations, they can't get a COVID vaccine at work. Their local community vaccination hub is closed. In my part of the world, it's going to be open again in mid-August mid for three weeks to deliver dose two only. We were contacted by a Devonport woman who recently, with her family, has been trying to get vaccinated. The family includes a support worker with many vulnerable clients. Their local vaccination hub had been closed down. They rely on their local chemist for the flu vaccine and assumed that they'd be able to be vaccinated there. But no, that wasn't the case. And meanwhile, Australians hear from overseas that countries like Germany, Hungary and France are so advanced with their vaccine programs that they will be offering booster shots by September. Booster shops in, shots in Europe when only 21 per cent of people on the northwest coast have had two jabs. It is a race and we are coming last. 
In fact, we've been lapped. Despite its backflips and twists, Australians know how badly the Morrison government has botched hotel quarantine and vaccinations. And I'm sure that the government senators will continue channelling their inner Olympians and desperately twisting their language for the remainder of this sitting fortnight. We need to be talking about a single, simple message to the Australian people, not the mixed messages and blaming that we're hearing from the Morrison government. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President, and embracing uh, the sporting analogies that suit the moment uh, with the Tokyo Olympics underway. We've heard lots about long jumps and leaps, but we haven't heard anything about policy belly flops. But Australians following this at home have clearly seen one this week with the Labor Party's latest cheap political stunt that ultimately uh, highlights the fact that they have nothing positive to say about the president and are embarrassingly silent on a plan for Australia's recovery. Every single person on the government benches in this place has been honest, from the Prime Minister down, that our response to the pandemic hasn't been perfect. It has had wrinkles and speed bumps. But that's what, I guess, dealing with a global pandemic, a once-in-a-century global pandemic is, when you are, in fact, trying to run a country. We have, however, in the face of the biggest health crisis since uh, the Spanish flu pandemic and the biggest economic calamity, arguably since the Great Depression, shown great resilience and adaptability. And we have turned a corner with a plan to return Australia to a post-COVID normal. The PM himself has taken responsibility for the early setbacks in that vaccination program. And let's not forget that the Italians uh, prohibiting the release of 3.8 million doses of AstraZeneca in February was a significant setback completely outside the control of this government. But it was, in fact, the decision of the Morrison government in August last year to ensure that we had a sovereign vaccine manufacturing capability in this country that enabled us to overcome that. Our progress to date isn't the disaster that Labor would represent. There was no plan at any time that had Australia fully vaccinated by today. So those opposite tend to forget that even at the beginning of the pandemic, the Morrison government acted quickly and decisively on key decisions to protect lives and livelihoods. Not only those things I just mentioned, but also being the first nation to close its borders to the world, declaring COVID-19 to be a pandemic more than two weeks before the World Health Organisation did so. That early action was effective and it gave us time, and now it's being used against us for cheap political stunts by the Labor Party. They're trying to take away from the the Australian success. It's not the government success. This is a, a success that is shared by all Australians in protecting lives to this point of the pandemic and upholding their livelihoods through economic security. By undermining that response, those opposite are doing a disservice to the Australian people as much as they are to themselves. Because of those early actions the Morrison government took, Australia, through the appropriate health authorities, put the vaccines through a normal approval process. This wasn't an emergency approval process that had to be rushed as bodies piled up in the streets. And that's the cold, hard reality of the countries that those opposite point to now as winning this race. Australia did not find itself in that very, very difficult situation because of the leadership that this government took in the early phases of the pandemic. We don't hear much from those opposite about that, but the reality is that there are more Australians who are still with us today than would have otherwise been the case without those very important decisions taken by this government. We have acknowledged that the vaccine rollout has had a slow start, and compared to those countries who have had that, that much greater death rate, I guess there is something to compare. But when you understand that our vaccination rate now at some 1.2 million shots into arms every week and accelerating. We are well on the way to returning to a post-COVID normal. So those opposite can claim that this is a failure of the Prime Minister, that this is a failure of this government. 
But when you look at the cold, hard facts and cut through the labour spin, the policy belly flops, this is what you find. 200,000 vaccines daily, 1.2 million vaccines being administered weekly now as supply increases that will continue to rise. Almost 80 per cent of those aged over 70 are protected with a first dose, and over 42 per cent have received a second dose. If we take the over 50s, more than two-thirds are protected with a first dose, and 27 per cent have received a second dose. So more than four in ten Australians aged over 16 are protected with a first dose. Some 20 per cent, or one in five, have already received a second dose. So when those opposite bleat about the slip from an end of October to a, an end of the year slip in the timeline, let's not forget that an eight-week delay, accounting for the imperfect information, as well as operating in a once-in-a-century pandemic, arguably is actually a great success on the part of the Australian people to overcome adversity, to thrive on the challenges that this pandemic represents and to look forward to the future with that inherently Australian optimism. The vaccination program continues to exponentially in increase because we're not resting on our laurels. Much as our economic success uh, doesn't stop, this is a government that has recently announced an extra 85 million Pfizer vaccines, the majority of which will be uh, delivered in the next 12 months. That is not a failure, and I think most Australians agree, because they can see that those opposite are fear-mongering and they're playing political games to the detriment of all Australians. So, not content with cheap politics, this week they decided to adopt the typical Labor fashion of throwing money at the solution. So, having learnt nothing from cash for clunkers, pink bats, school hawks and checks to dead people last time they sat on the government benches, this time they decided to try and bribe Australians with their own money to do what they are doing in overwhelming numbers every day. That shows that they've learned nothing from their past failures in government. They've learned nothing from eight years on the opposition benches, and they've not only offended those Australians that continue to do the right thing, but they have again demonstrated why they are unfit to sit on the government benches. They're still stuck in that ideological fantasy land where government spending from the magic money tree is the fix-all solution. On the other hand, as I've outlined today, this is a coalition government that has consistently protected lives and livelihoods, acted early, acted decisively, been pragmatic, non-ideological, followed the health advice and delivered excellent outcomes for Australians by keeping their lives protected and keeping their livelihoods intact. We have acknowledged that JobKeeper and JobSeeker um, allowed the Australian economy to survive what would have otherwise been an economic calamity. The lack of realistic solutions and inconsistency from those on the other benches is astounding. My colleague Senator O'Sullivan was very right to point out that there were predictions from those on the Labor side that the end of JobKeeper would cause the economy to fall off a cliff. Instead, we saw unemployment with a four in front of it, more Australians in work than there were at the start of the pandemic, and in fact near record participation rates, particularly for females in the Australian workforce. In one breath, they criticise us for uh, preventing international arrivals and leaving Australians stranded overseas, and then in the other, they're having a go at hotel quarantine, which was a consensus decision taken by the National Cabinet to ensure that the, the maximum number of returning Australians could be accommodated in the context of the health advice. That shows that they've got nothing to say that's productive. They're willing to throw any truth overboard in the pursuit of their cheap politics, and that is why the Morrison government can be trusted to steer this nation out of the pandemic but those opposite cannot. Thank you. Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, Acting Deputy President, I'd like to pay my respects to those Australians around the country today uh, who are doing it tough because of the pandemic. And I'd like to acknowledge that this is a particularly difficult time for, for many Australians. Um, and I would also like to apologise, uh, if the Prime Minister won't, on behalf of this government for their policy failure in the last 12 months. 
Um, Australians are not only having to arm themselves against the anxiety of being in a pandemic and potentially getting the virus, uh, they're not only having to arm themselves against uh, repeated lockdowns, loss of individual freedoms, uh, the depression that goes with the significant changes they're seeing in their life, uh, the loss of income, uh, the loss of work. Um, they're also having to arm themselves uh, against the incompetence and stupidity of this government, against the U-turns, the backflips, the excuses, the policy failures and the lies. It's no wonder, with the mixed information that's been out there, the conflicting information, some of it still being peddled by coalition backbenchers, that Australians are confused and angry and anxious. And it's no wonder that they're lashing out and they're protesting. It's no wonder some are vulnerable to misinformation in this time of fake news. And it's no wonder that many won't listen to the facts and the science, considering what has happened in this place in the last decade and how often this government and coalition senators have turned their back on the science of things like climate change. Why should people listen to it on COVID when the government is actually a climate-denying government? It's no wonder that Australians are trying to get their lives back on track and we have to do everything we can to help them. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. The vaccine rollout is a shambles, and I'm not going to repeat all of the debate that's taken place in the chamber today. I just want to really zoom in on one pending aspect of the rollout failure. Last Thursday, I got my second COVID jab. On Monday, I downloaded my COVID uh, vaccination uh, certificate from Services Australia's website. Now, within 15 minutes of doing so, I had managed to generate a forgery. So our vac vaccination certificate has no security features whatsoever. Photoshop defeated it. Now, we're not using vaccine certificates yet, but their use is inevitable, whether you like the vaccine, whether you don't, whether you've had it or you haven't. The moment that vaccination certificates are connected to health measures, there will be value in forgery. We have seen this in Europe. We have seen this in uh, the United States. And one of the problems is if you have got a false vaccination certificate and the health measures are relying on uh, its validity, it will endanger public health. Why would you design a vaccination certificate with no security against forge forgery? There are certainly uh, available technical solutions. It's just typical of what's been happening so far in this embarrassing failure. Basically, the PM keeps turning up to the recovery dance party late and realising that he's left his dance shoes at home. He's doing it repeatedly. He's got to change. Thank you, Senator Patrick. And the time for the discussion has expired. We now move on to consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. Does any senator wish to make a contribution? Not by the look of it. So we'll move on to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator Ecker. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. Uh, at the request of the Chair of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bill, Senator Polly, I present Scrutiny Digest 11 of 2021. Thank you. Senator McGrath. At the request of the Chair of the Standing Committee, the scrutiny of delegated legislation, Senator Peregrine Wells, I present delegated legislation monitor 11 of 2021, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. Uh, the motion is that the Senate should take note uh, of the report. Those of that opinion say aye. Yes, uh, oh, Senator Brockman. Sorry, sir, Senator Firivanti Wells, you wish to speak to this report? Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you, Senator Brockman. I appreciate. 
I appreciate this opportunity to speak to the tabling of the scrutiny of Delegated Legislation Committee's Delegated Legislation Monitor 11 of 2021. In Monitor 11 of 2021, the committee has drawn particular attention to Australia's Foreign Relations State and Territory Arrangements Rules 2020. These rules relate to the Foreign Arrangements Scheme, which commenced on 10 December 2020. As senators would be aware, the purpose of the scheme is to ensure that arrangements between state or territory governments and foreign entities do not adversely affect Australia's foreign relations and are not inconsistent with Australia's foreign policy. The scheme provides for states and territories and their entities to notify or seek approval from the Minister for Foreign Affairs if they propose to negotiate or enter or have entered a foreign arrangement. These rules, however, provide that certain arrangements are exempt from the notification and approval requirements of the scheme. The committee is concerned that the instrument therefore deals with significant matters that go to the scope of the scheme as a whole. This concern is heightened by the fact that a number of concepts within the rules appear to have a wide interpretation. For example, the rules provide that foreign arrangements solely dealing with minor administrative or logistical matters are exempt from the scheme. However, the scope of this exemption is unclear. The committee considered that the scope of the regulatory schemes should be clearly defined and to be set out on the face of the primary legislation. Where significant details as to the scope of a scheme are nevertheless included in delegated legislation, the committee considers that such matters should be subject to regular parliamentary scrutiny. In this instance, the rules are subject to a regular 10-year sunsetting period, which significantly limits the ability of this chamber to scrutinise the instrument. The committee has been engaging with the minister in relation to these substantive concerns since March this year. Last week, the minister advised that the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade had sought the advice of the Attorney General's Department in relation to the sunsetting regime set out in the Legislation Act. The Attorney General's Department suggested that the default 10-year sunset period set out in the Legislation Act should be maintained unless there are clear policy reasons justifying a shorter sunset period. The minister advised at the committee that, in her view, there are insufficient clear policy reasons to justify a shorter sunsetting period for the rules. The minister also reiterated her previous advice that the rules will be subject to regular review to ensure that it reflects the intention of the Act and supports the effective administration of the scheme. Further, the minister assured the committee that the three-year statutory review of the Act will ensure timely and appropriate parliamentary scrutiny of the rules. Nonetheless, the committee remains concerned that the instrument deals with significant matters that go to the scope of the foreign arrangement scheme as a whole, and that it appears that it is intended to remain in force for 10 years. The committee considers that in the system of representative and responsible government established by the Constitution, there are often important scrutiny reasons for providing for shorter sunsetting of instruments made by the executive under legislative power delegated by the parliament. Therefore, the committee does not agree that it is always a good legislative practice to apply the default sunsetting period of 10 years unless there are clear policy reasons to justify a shorter sunsetting period. Indeed, the committee regularly scrutinises instruments which include self-repeal provisions. It is the committee's view that a five-year duration is the most appropriate mechanism for ensuring timely parliamentary scrutiny of the measures set out in these rules. The committee's scrutiny concerns are heightened in relation to this particular instrument, given that this matter was discussed in detail with the department at a public hearing of the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Committee's inquiry into the enabling bill. Further senators will recall that in the last sitting period, the Senate resolved to amend Standing Order 23 to reinforce the committee's scrutiny principles regarding delegated legislation which amends or modifies the operation of primary legislation. The committee therefore intends to rigorously pursue this type of scrutiny concern in accordance with the mandate provided by the Senate. The committee gave a notice of motion to disallow the rules on 11 May 2021, 
as a precautionary measure to allow additional time for the committee to correspond with the minister and to seek a resolution to the committee's scrutiny concerns. This has not yet happened. The committee has therefore resolved to retain its disallowance notice until a satisfactory response to our concerns is received. In this regard, I note that this matter needs to be resolved urgently as the Senate must consider the disallowance notice by Wednesday next week, or the instrument will be deemed to have been disallowed under subsection 42.2 of the Legislation Act. The committee looks forward to receiving the minister's response to its views set out in the monitor as a matter of urgency. With these comments, I commend the committee's delegated legislation monitor 11 of 2021 to the Senate. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Firavanti Wells. Do you wish the motion to be put or do you wish to seek leave to continue your remarks? Uh, the motion can be put. Thank you. Those, uh, the motion has moved by Senator McGrath. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I present the report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity on its examination of the annual report of the Integrity Commissioner for 2019 to 2020, together with the Hansard record of proceedings and additional information. And I move that the Senate take note of the report. Mr Acting Deputy President, on behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity, I present the committee's report on its examination of the annual report of the Integrity Commissioner 2019 to 2020. The committee thanks the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity, which I'll refer to as ACLI, for a, for a very comprehensive annual report. The committee is satisfied that ACLI performed well against its performance criteria for the 2019 to 2020 reporting period. Overall, ACLI delivered positive investigative and operational results for the year, despite facing several challenges, including the COVID-19 pandemic. The committee commends ACLI for concluding 93 investigations, the second highest number of investigations finalised in a reporting year. The annual report highlighted that as a result of ACLI investigations, five individuals were prosecuted in 2019 to 20, including three former Law Enforcement Integrity Commission Act agencies employees. In addition, the Visa Integrity Task Force formally concluded. The committee commends the Joint Agency Task Force for its success in relation to visas, including the investigation of 31 corruption issues in visa processing and identifying a significant number of vulnerabilities relating to visa fraud. The annual report demonstrated that ACLI is focused on ensuring its workload is appropriately managed and that it is focused on investigating matters of serious and systemic corruption. At the end of 2019 to 20, ACLI was investigating 75 corruption matters, a sizeable reduction from previous reporting periods. Furthermore, the Integrity Commissioner, Ms Jala Hinchcliffe, provided three final investigation reports to the Attorney-General as ACLI continues to reduce its backlog of final investigation reports. The Law Enforcement Integrity Commissioner Act 2006, the LEIC Act, or LEAK Act, as I'll refer to it in these remarks, requires agencies within ACLI's jurisdiction to notify potential corruption matters. ACLI also receives referrals of potential corruption issues from other sources. ACLI must first assess, first assess the potential corruption issues and determine how best to manage them. It is apparent from the annual report that ACLI is committed to reducing the time taken to complete these initial assessments to ensure serious and systemic corruption matters are prioritised. And that, Mr Acting Deputy President, is demonstrated by the adoption of a new target for the 2019-20 reporting period. The committee applauds ACLI for adopting a stretch target to complete 90 per cent of assessments within 30 days of receipt. So I just want to repeat that again because this is a very important point. ACLI is now seeking to complete 90 per cent of those initial assessments from the point in time when it gets that initial referral within 30 days of receipt. The previous target, the previous target prior to the 2019-20 year was a target of completing only 75 assessments within 90 days. So the target has actually become far more aggressive to complete 90 per cent of assessments within 30 days 
as opposed to 75 per cent within 90 days. The number of referrals to be assessed has increased and the time period for those referrals to be assessed has decreased. Now, in that context, which is extraordinarily important, Ackley reported that for the 2019 to 20 year it did not reach this ambitious target it achieved of achieving it actually achieved 75 per cent of assessments in 30 days and 98 per cent of assessments within 90 days. So again that has to be seen in the context where the previous target was to complete 75 per cent of assessments within 90 days for the 2019 to 20 year. 75 per cent of assessments were actually completed in 30 days and also 98 per cent of assessments were completed within 90 days as opposed to the previous target of completing 75 per cent of assessments in 30 days. So whilst the annual report for 2019 to 2020 indicates that the performance metric was not met, the performance was actually quite satisfactory and it needs to be considered in that context. Extremely important. Ackley worked closely with LEIC Act agencies throughout the year to support their investigations and corruption prevention activities. A total of 117 Law Enforcement Integrity Commission Act agency investigations were completed by the end of the reporting period, a significant improvement from previous years. The committee notes that Ackley revised its corporate plan and performance criteria during the reporting year and that it will report against the new performance measures in its upcoming annual report. The committee looks forward to reviewing Ackley's results against the new framework. I would like to thank the Integrity Commissioner, Ms Jala Hinchcliffe, and all of the staff at Ackley for their ongoing good work addressing corrupt conduct within Australia's Commonwealth law enforcement agencies. I would also like to thank all committee members for their contributions to the examination. In particular, I'd also like to mention, Mr Acting Deputy President, how pleased I was earlier today to see Senator Billick, uh, who is uh, Deputy Chair of my, committee, of my committee, actually make a contribution to a debate earlier in the day. And that was, uh, that was quite heartwarming to see you, Senator Billick, um, albeit on the video screen. If I can, uh, through you, Deputy President, say that um, Mr Tony's, Tony Zappia MP has, uh, has certainly stepped up to the plate as uh, the senior member from the opposition on the committee, and I've enjoyed working with him in, in his absence, but in your absence. But he is no replacement for you, Senator Billick. So I look forward to uh, to your speedy return to this place. Thank you, Senator Scar. Uh, whip, government whip. Yes. Uh, sorry, sorry, government whip. Take a seat for a moment. Uh, the question before the chair is that the motion uh, moved by Senator Scar be agreed to. Those that are opinions say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, whip, please. Senator Davis. Thank you. On behalf of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, I present the committee's fourth report of 2021. Thank you. Okay. Are there any ministerial statements? No ministerial statements. Uh, any changes to committee memberships? Okay. Uh, any messages? The president has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Financial Sector Reform Hain Royal Commission Response Better Advice Bill 2021 for concurrence. Minister. Uh, I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So uh, that question is before the chair. Um, so th th the bill be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to financial services and for related purposes. Minister. Acting Deputy President, I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Uh, leave leave is, is, is granted. Uh, Minister. I move that the debate now be adjourned. Uh, the question before the chair is that debate be adjourned. Do those of that opinion say aye? Those who can say no, the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the resumption of the debate be an order of the, um, be an order of the day for a later hour. Okay. Those of that opinion say aye. Those who can say no, the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Okay. Our clerk.
Uh, business of the Senate. <clears throat> business of the Senate. Notice of motion number two. Standing the name of the Leader of the Greens, Senator Waters, a reference to Financial and Public Administration Legislation Committee relating to the Ministerial Suitability Commission of Inquiry Bill 2021. Senator McKim, or you have the call. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I move uh, business of the Senate notice of motion number two, standing in the name of Senator Waters, and indicate that I believe Senator Waters is standing by remotely and seeking the call. Okay. Senator Waters, you have the call. Thanks very much, Acting uh, Deputy President. I'll just check that you can hear me. We okay. can hear you, Senator Waters. Great news. Thank you very much. Um, I rise to debate whether my private member's bill to set up a commission of inquiry into whether Mr Christian Porter is fit to remain a Minister of the Crown, given the rape allegations against him, should be referred to the Finance and Public Administration Committee for consideration, a process that bills normally go through, but not this bill. Back in June, uh, anyone who's listening might remember that I kept trying to progress this bill, uh, this bill to seek a pathway to justice for Kate Thornton and to uphold uh, standards for our parliament's ministry. And on multiple occasions, the government blocked me from reading the bill a second time, which is unprecedented. I kept trying and the warnings from the Senate president kept escalating. So here today, I'm again trying to seek for my bill, which has been properly introduced, to follow the normal process of being subject to a Senate inquiry, which of course will then make a recommendation whether or not the bill should be supported. Uh, so we'll see if uh, the government with their backers in One Nation uh, again vote to stop this. But let's face it, this is not the first time the government has shut down efforts to investigate their actions uh, or their members. This government can't manage a vaccine rollout, but they sure can manage a protection racket. This bill does one thing. It would establish an independent process to determine whether Mr Christian Porter is a fit and proper person to hold a ministerial position, to sit at that head table when decisions are made in this country, to have a say on this government's position on sexual harassment reforms or responses to the Foster Review uh, or indeed the Human Rights Commission's uh, review into the safety of parliamentary workplaces, or on whether we should have a code of conduct for politicians. Mr Porter has been the subject of very serious allegations, allegations of rape. He has strenuously denied those allegations and sued the National Broadcaster for reporting on them. Those proceedings were discontinued and Mr Porter fought hard to have the evidence submitted to the court uh, kept hidden from the public. The evidence that was revealed through that case raises serious questions about Minister Porter's suitability. You would think that a Prime Minister wouldn't want such questions hanging over the head of any of his ministers. You would think that uh, an innocent person would welcome an investigation to clear their name. And yet the Prime Minister seems completely disinterested in getting answers to these questions. He hasn't read the dossier of allegations sent to him many months ago. He obviously hasn't had a chat with his wife, Jenny, about what the moral thing to do is either. Instead, the Prime Minister has repeatedly tried to move on from this issue, and he evidently thought a belated ministerial reshuffle would fix it. Imagine underestimating the women of Australia that much that you think that moving an alleged rapist sideways into a different ministry would address the concerns that at least half the population have about sexual assault. The Prime Minister's response reeks of male privilege and it fundamentally misjudges the anger and the injustice that women feel about continued rates, sexual assault, harassment, discrimination and just plain sexism. If the Prime Minister can ignore that in Parliament House, then it says to women everywhere that their experiences are not valid, are not important, and are not to be believed. Because the Prime Minister doesn't believe that Minister Porter raped uh, Kate Thornton, he asked Minister Porter, who denied it, and that's enough for the Prime Minister. He just takes his mate's word for it. He didn't read the dossier of allegations. He didn't ask for or order any form of independent inquiry. He didn't even consider whether Minister Porter might have been in breach of the Prime Minister's own ministerial standards. Instead, he appointed Mr Porter to a fresh ministry, and this week he promoted him. 
Minister Porter is now the acting leader of the government in the House. His old job. Just like harassers everywhere, they're still in their jobs, while survivors are the ones who leave their jobs or are pushed out, or worse, as in Kate's case, are so let down by the justice system that they give up. There is no justice for women survivors anywhere, while rape allegations are allowed to persist against a Commonwealth Minister of the Crown without any avenue for those allegations to be resolved. And that is the case here. With the defamation case documents not being released and with Kate having ended her life tragically, there are no avenues remaining to inquire into the accusations. The Australian Federal Police and the New South Wales Police have confirmed that no further investigation is possible. The only avenue is for the Prime Minister to call an inquiry. And since he won't or hasn't yet, that's what this bill would do. It would set up an independent inquiry into whether Minister Porter is fit to remain a minister given the unresolved rape allegations against him. The Prime Minister's statement of ministerial standards requires ministers to, and I quote, act at all times to the highest possible standards of probity, end quote. Now, those standards are not worth the paper that they're written on because there are multiple incidents where the Prime Minister is not enforcing them. The Prime Minister failed to take action to inquire into the allegations um, and to inquire into whether Minister Porter is deserving of a ministerial position. The Prime Minister has declared Mr Porter an innocent man based on his assurances alone. And despite the tens of thousands of women and their allies who rallied in March demanding an independent inquiry, amongst other things, this week, the Prime Minister promoted Mr Porter back to the position of Leader of the House, uh, acting at least. Women do not trust this Prime Minister, and nor should they. The Prime Minister doesn't believe women. He's sending us back to the 1950s and is in dangerous denial about the epidemic of sexual assault and violence against women. The courageous Australian of the Year, Grace Tame, gave voice to the disgust felt by women around the country in an opinion piece in the newspapers today, and I'm going to quote from it now. Ms Tame says, Prime Minister Scott Morrison has just overseen Christian Porter's assuming of the role of acting leader of the House of Representatives. Amid a burgeoning, preeminent mass awakening to the endemic issue of sexual abuse, this decision marks a proverbial slap in the face of our entire nation. Goes on to say, and I quote, outside of parliament, positions of public trust are governed by codes of conduct that stipulate one must be a fit and proper person in order to occupy them, such as in the case of doctors who are bound by the Hippocratic Oath. Furthermore, their adequacy, both in terms of knowledge and ethics, is repeatedly challenged and updated through mandated continuing professional development. In parliament, however, no such requirements exist. It is the Prime Minister who sets the standards and maintains them by appointing Cabinet Ministers at his or her discretion. Given the seriousness of the allegations against Mr Porter, the bare minimum test of his fitness to hold ministerial office would be an independent inquiry. How damning it is that the government has refused to allow for one. Bill Ms Tame's words, if the Prime Minister's recent rhetoric about wanting to support assault survivors and protect women's safety was indeed true, he would surely go to any lengths possible to ensure that there was not an accused rapist amongst his own staff. Clearly, it has been nothing but lip service. His actions speak volumes that drown out every word. And now not only has Mr Porter been permitted to remain in office, he has been temporarily elevated. His are circumstances steeped in the protective privileges of a patriarchal parliament. There is no way this decision was accidental. It is a deliberate, it, it is a transparently deliberate, definitive statement that reeks of abuse of power and a blatant disregard of the people. End quote. As Ms. Tame says so powerfully, without an independent and rigorous inquiry, serious and unresolved allegations hang over the head of a sitting minister and they damage the confidence of Australian people in this government, but more importantly, in this institution of government, the parliament. This bill is not seeking a predetermined outcome. It is not a witch hunt as the folk in One Nation who regularly defend and vote with the government have characterised it. 
It does not ignore Mr Porter's strenuous denial of the allegation. Instead, it recognises that an independent, credible examination of Mr Porter's suitability is necessary to restore public faith in the accountability and integrity of Parliament and the functioning of Australia's democracy. Referring the bill to the Finance and Public Administration Committee will allow any concerns about the independence, the operation or the confidentiality of the Commission of Inquiry to be discussed and, if necessary, addressed through amendments to the bill. This year has repeatedly challenged the government to take women's safety seriously, to listen to survivors. Ms Tame's opinion piece reflects on, with, on what Mr Porter, resuming leader in the House uh, role this week, says to survivors and what message it sends to perpetrators. She concludes, and I quote, my heart breaks at the thought of survivors still living in silence, looking to our leaders for hope, end quote. We need to provide some hope that this parliament will take women's safety seriously. It will not just sweep serious accusations under the carpet, but it will ensure that allegations are tested and that those wielding power in this country are deserving of that privilege. I urge the Senate to refer this bill to the committee for consideration. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Walters. Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I think it's very important for all of us who are going to be voting on this uh, motion shortly to understand exactly what the motion is. It doesn't seek to support a bill. It doesn't seek to support any aspect of a bill. What it seeks to do is simply refer a bill to a committee for inquiry and report, something that we do each and every day in this chamber. It is entirely normal for this chamber to refer bills for investigation uh, to uh, refer them to committees for investigation so that different parties, different senators can make a decision uh, as to how they intend to vote. Um, so that is why Labor uh, feels entirely comfortable voting for this motion, because we are comfortable with the idea that such a bill uh, should be referred to a committee. Uh, and it is strange indeed uh, that the government is not willing to even refer this bill for examination. Now, it won't be until we have an inquiry into this bill uh, that all issues associated with it can be properly explored. It may be uh, that the bill turns out to be a very good idea uh, and is supported by a wide range of stakeholders. Equally, it may be that the bill is a very bad idea uh, and that, or that there potentially there's some good in it, but amendments may be necessary. But we don't actually get, have the opportunity to know that until uh, the Senate does its job, performs its usual function by investigating and considering the bill and hearing from all stakeholders as to its pros and cons. Um, so this motion does not require the Liberal Party, the National Party or any senator in this chamber to take a position on the Ministerial Suitability Commission of Inquiry Bill. Um, all this motion requires is for a Senate committee to do what Senate committees do all the time, and that is to look at a piece of legislation. So the question must be asked, if the government is intending to oppose this motion, what are they so afraid of? Why are they so afraid of even having the Senate or Senate committees consider uh, whether we should put in place legislation for a new suitability commission governing the responsibilities and conduct of ministers. What is the Liberal Party so afraid of? What is the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, so afraid of? And it can only be that they are concerned about what such a commission would find in relation to the activities of serving government ministers, in particular the former Attorney-General and now Minister for Industry, Mr Porter. Uh, because, as we know, the allegations of serious criminal conduct that have been made and still hang over the head of the former Attorney General and now Minister for Industry, Mr Porter, are about as serious as allegations can get. Um, Labor's position on this has been, on, on Mr Porter has been clear for some time. 
Uh, in light of the seriousness of the allegations made against Mr Porter, an independent inquiry must be held to investigate these matters and to ensure that the Australian people have confidence in Mr Porter's fitness for ministerial office. Now, in contrast, what we've seen from the my Prime Minister all along throughout this scandal uh, is a very clear position, and that is that the Prime Minister will do anything and say anything, no matter how ridiculous, uh, to avoid setting up any such independent inquiry. Uh, and it's continuing now by government senators intending to vote against this motion, which would merely empower a Senate committee to review whether a ministerial suitability commission of inquiry is a good idea or not. Who can forget the Prime Minister's utterly absurd assertion that an inquiry into Mr Porter's fitness for ministerial office would undermine the rule of law? It simply wouldn't. The, the suggestion is utterly ridiculous. Mr Morrison eventually abandoned that line of defence and changed tack uh, well, I, I'll take the interjection from Senator Scar. I am a lawyer. I am a lawyer, Did Senator Scar, and I have a very good understanding of what the rule of law is. And I know that you do as well, Senator Scar. And I know that if you were actually able to make an independent decision rather than being Through bound by your party, you would also have supported an independent inquiry into Mr. Porter. And you, on, would, so and you would most order, certainly, everybody. and, you, and Senator order. Scar would most certainly, order on my right. Senator order. Scar would most certainly support, as, and Senator Scar in his short time in the Senate has demonstrated that he is a strong supporter of the Senate's committee, Senate committee system, and I commend him for that. And if Senator Scar and all of his colleagues in the Liberal Party were genuinely exercising their own independent thought, then they would be supporting this motion, which, as I say, simply proposes to refer a bill to a Senate committee for investigation. I know Senator Kaskar has only just entered the chamber, and I don't make any reflection on him for that. But what I was saying before Senator Scar entered the chamber was that all this motion does is refer a bill, is proposed to refer a bill to a Senate committee for consideration. Exactly the kind of thing that Senator Scar, Senator Smith, Senator Davies, Senator Hume, even yourself, Mr. Acting Deputy President, uh, and I vote to do on a regular basis. Um, so the Mr. Mr. Morrison uh, eventually abandoned his utterly ridiculous argument that an independent inquiry into Mr. Porter's fitness for ministerial office would undermine the rule of law. He changed tack by trying to hide behind Mr. Porter's private defamation action against the ABC. Mr. Morrison tried to argue uh, that a private defamation action launched by Mr. Porter amounted to an independent inquiry into uh, the allegations against him. Now, I know that Senator Scar realises that that is also utterly absurd. It is nonsense to argue that a private defamation action amounts to an independent inquiry into allegations, but that is the argument that the Prime Minister made. Uh, so it was similarly ridiculous. A private defamation action is no substitute for a proper inquiry in, into Mr Porter's fitness for office. But even if it were, Mr Porter, of course, has now abandoned the case against the ABC before any evidence was heard or any witnesses were questioned or cross-examined. Um, so that is the kind of, uh, of inquiry that satisfies the Prime Minister, a private defamation action which is abandoned before it goes to trial in the very early stages of those proceedings. And of course now we've seen Mr Porter take the extremely unusual step of trying to keep secret the ABC's defence. So if Mr Porter has his way, we will never see the nature of the allegations or the, or the investigations or the defence that the ABC have prepared, which, detail, which no doubt details the evidentiary background it has for the allegations that were made in, uh, in uh, certain programs that the ABC aired. So, I mean, the Prime Minister is fast running out of excuses for why an independent investigation should not be held into the allegations against Mr Porter. And I suppose we're all wondering what the next excuse from the Prime Minister will be. Will he now hide behind the South Australian coroner and argue that that's an independent investigation into what are extremely serious allegations against his former Attorney-General and now Minister for Industry, Mr Porter? Now, 
Labor in no way prejudges the allegations against Mr Porter. Not at any time has, to my knowledge, a Labor me member of parliament or, sen or senator uh, concluded that these allegations are correct. Uh, of course, when allegations of this nature are made, what should occur is that they be properly investigated before conclusions are drawn. But that is exactly the kind of independent inquiry that the Prime Minister and his government have blocked every step of the way ever since these allegations were aired. What Labor, uh, Labor's position is that we simply believe that it is untenable for Mr Porter to continue to sit at the Cabinet table as a minister while such serious allegations against him remain untested and unresolved. And I might add, uh, it, it is simply astonishing that in an environment where any reasonable observer would think uh, that Mr Porter should not remain in the Cabinet while these allegations are unresolved, the Prime Minister has now taken the extraordinary step of actually giving Mr Porter a promotion, has actually appointed Mr Porter uh, as the acting leader of the House in the parliament. Um, and as, a, and as uh, Grace Tame, the current Australian of the Year, observed in her column today, the, the position of leader of the House is a position of great power. Uh, and unfortunately, in this government's hands, it has been used repeatedly to suppress debate and to suppress an examination of the truth. So that is a fairly ironic, sadly ironic, situation for the Prime Minister and Mr Porter to find themselves in now, when in a situation where they have gone to great lengths to suppress any independent examination of the allegations against Mr Porter, they have now appointed him to a position in the, in the House of Representatives, with no doubt, which no doubt gets a nice little pay rise with it as well, but a position that is, has been used repeatedly by, the, by this government to suppress debate and to suppress the examin examination of government conduct in the House of Representatives. It just shows again that this Prime Minister is utterly tone deaf when it comes to these sorts of allegations. He is utterly tone deaf when it comes to the cultural problems within his party about how women are treated uh, by promoting someone like Mr Porter to this kind of position at this point in time when these sort of allegations continue to hang over Mr Porter's head. It is, it is important to note that the New South Wales Police did not carry out an investigation into the allegations against Mr Porter due to the tragic death by suicide of the woman making the allegations before she was able to make a formal statement to the police. This means that, contrary to claims made by the Prime Minister, these allegations have never properly been investigated, uh, let alone tested in a criminal hearing before a court. There has been no completed investigation by New South Wales Police and no investigation at all by the Federal Police. With the tragic death of the woman who made the allegation, uh, it is now very unlikely that the police will ever investigate the very serious allegations she made against Mr Porter. As Prime Minister, it is up to Mr Morrison to enforce his statement of ministerial standards. However, despite months of trying to avoid this responsibility, it is still not too late for Mr Morrison to take the steps required to demonstrate to the Australian people that Mr Porter is a fit and proper person to hold ministerial office. The way that this should occur is for the Prime Minister to establish the independent inquiry into the allegations that, against Mr Porter that Labor has been calling for for months. In the absence of a police investigation and a possible criminal trial, uh, such an independent inquiry, conducted at arm's length from the Morrison government, provides the best means for the allegations against Mr Porter to be tested, for Mr Porter to have the opportunity to clear his name and for the Australian people to have confidence in Mr Porter's fitness to continue to hold ministerial office. Given that the Prime Minister is up until now refusing to establish such an inquiry, the least we can do is ask the Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee to inquire into this bill, a bill that would be redundant if the Prime Minister simply did his job and acted like a leader. So, in closing, I again implore government senators to really reflect on the position that they're taking on this bill, uh, on this motion. This is not a debate about whether the bill should be supported or not. Frankly, Labor hasn't made up our mind yet about whether we would support such a bill uh, if it does get uh, put before the Parliament. That is the purpose of this inquiry. That is, the, that, is the, that, is the, that is the position that is a common position for parties to take prior to an inquiry to not prejudge whether a bill should be supported or not, but simply to have an inquiry to help inform a position that is then taken. 
Even, I haven't been here that, this, that long myself, but I know that I've participated in numerous Senate inquiries, the point of which has been to inform Labor's position as to whether we would support such a bill. And, and Senator Scar, Senator Davey, Senator Hume, Senator Smith have done the same thing. Um, and, and, and again, I might commend each of those senators for at times put, suggesting amendments to their own government's legislation, uh, which they have uh, put forward on the basis of evidence that they have heard at Senate committee hearings. That is exactly what is being sought here. It, all, all that is being proposed is that this bill be referred to a Senate committee for consideration, to listen to stakeholders, to decide whether we should support it or not, to decide whether amendments should be moved or not. But unfortunately, this government, under the leadership of this Prime Minister, is yet again blocking the power of the Senate and the power of the, of the parliament to inquire into a simple piece of legislation. We know why they're doing it, because they are intent on maintaining this cover-up of the activities and the allegations of, against Mr Porter. It is a disgraceful abuse of the parliament. Um, the, the government and its senators should support this motion. They should support the right of the Senate to consider this bill. And If they don't do so, they are just engaging in the ongoing cover-up that this government has adopted in relation to the allegations against Mr Porter from day one. So the, the question before the, the chair is business of the Senate number two in the name of Senator Waters, moved by Senator McKim. Those of, of that opinion say aye. aye. Those aye. against say no. Aye. I think the, the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bell for four minutes, please.
Stop the bells. The question is that business of the Senate notice of motion number three in the name of Senator Waters be agreed to. Oh, senators to take their seats. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, Senator Carr. The noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell the ayes and Senator Davey tell for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 14, noes 17. The matter is resolved in the negative. I understand Senator Smith has a matter to raise. Senator Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I think there might be uh, another business of the Senate matter number three in Senator Waters' name, but oh, sorry, after but, yeah. that I do have a matter that I'd yeah. like to That was my fault. Mention. I erroneously yep. referred to that as number three that we just dealt with. I should have uh, referred to it as number two, but I think everyone understood what I was referring to given the debate. Senator McKim. Uh, yes, thank you very much, President. Uh, I move business of the Senate notice of motion number three, standing in the name of Senator Waters. So am, am I, are we speaking to that motion? Senator Waters is seeking okay. the call remotely. Right. Senator Waters. Senator Thank Waters you, has President. the call. Hello there. Just checking you can hear me fine, President. Yes, all good, Senator Waters. Thank you very much. Um, now, here we are again on uh, disallowing the arena uh, regulation. Actually, the uh, chamber balled up in the previous sitting week. So we've just disallowed this and now the government is right back here again. The moral of the story is don't get in the way of the Morrison government and a bucket of public money for their gas donors. Since the Senate disallowed the regulation last month, the government has taken no effort to negotiate with anyone on what new arena funding programs might look like. If they had done that, we might not be in this position today. Uh, we've pared back the disallowance to only stop the low emissions fund that would shovel money at gas companies, um, who are in fact the future employer of many coalition MPs in this building. Uh, and those gas companies are the very same companies that also donate uh, more money to the Liberals. I think, Senator Waters, we've lost communication. S Senator Mc Senator McKim, uh, yes, while I, Senator Waters is dialing back in, are you able to take the, the call, please? I am. I, uh, I am. Uh, if the Senate would just bear with me um, for a moment, um, I'll. Uh, I've just had a message uh, for colleagues from Senator Waters. She's just trying to reboot now, but Senator McKim, um, uh, uh, Senator Brown is able to speak. If that would, uh, would assist I, I'm you, I'm okay. Uh, well, is Senator Brown going to make a contribution anyway. Oh, well, in that case, um, Chair, just to facilitate okay. the business of the Senate, thank you. happy Thanks, to Senator see you. Senator Brown, thank you. 
you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the disallowance of Section 7 of these arena re regulations. The Labor, Labor has moved the same disallowance, and we will be supporting this motion. Labor is proud to have created the Australian Renewable Energy Agency arena in 2012 to help support the technologies that are building our future energy system and creating jobs for the future. We invested $2.5 billion in ARENA in 2012, and those opposite have consistently tried to abolish, gut and undermine the integrity of ARENA for eight years. Labor supports the sections of the regulations relating to the 2020 budget measures for programs improving freight and industrial efficiency, regional microgrids and future fuels. These revised regulations include new safeguards on the implementation of those budget measures. This is an omission that Labor and the Senate were right to disallow the original, original regulations. However, Section 7 of these regulations and attempting to force the Renewable Energy Agency to fund non-renewables is just the latest in a series of moves by those opposite to undermine the integrity of Australia's climate institutions established by Labor and to circumvent the parliament by attempting to change laws via regulation. The object of the ARENA Act 2011 is to, and I quote, improve the competitiveness of renewable energy technologies and increase the supply of renewable energy in Australia, end quote. Now, experts say that funding other technologies would be inconsistent with the object of the Act, Mr Acting Deputy President, and would likely be subject to legal ch challenge. Unlike the Greens, who are ideologically are ideological about technologies like CCS, Labor supports any new energy technologies where they stack up scientifically and commercially. But deserving non-renewable technologies should be supported in other ways and not allowed to dilute ARENA's funding and expertise. For example, if the government had wanted to support CCS technologies, it should have abolished it shouldn't have had shouldn't have abolished the CCS flagships program and cut half a billion dollars of funding. We note that the concerns about the potential illegality of going beyond the Act via the regulation was even shared by the Minister's party room colleague, who chairs the Liberal-led Standing Committee for the uh, Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation. We also note that the Minister had to remake these regulations after a humiliating defeat in the Senate just two months ago of the original regulations. Labor created ARENA in 2012, and we will always protect it. We will protect it from those from uh, becoming Mr Angus Taylor's slush fund, because it is doing an incredible job. Because it has main maintained its integrity, it has been able to provide jobs for Australians, Australians and deliver returns on investments for taxpayers. Returns on, on taxpayer investment is not the first thing that comes to mind when Minister Taylor has an idea. For every one dollar invested by ARENA, the economy sees three dollars leveraged. We want to ensure that the high rate of return continues, and we will be supporting this disallowance. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I thank uh, Senator Brown for um, being prepared to make her contribution, although I do uh, disassociate the Greens with her remarks about the Australian Greens. Um, the point that Senator Waters um, was making uh, was that uh, the Greens have pared back this disallowance to only stop the low emissions fund that would shovel money at gas companies who are the future employer of many coalition MPs in this building. Now, these gas companies are the very same companies that donate more to the LNP and the Liberals and the Nationals in political donations than they actually contribute to the Australian people in tax. But today, the Senate can stop that flow of money again. Now, if the government had tried to negotiate with anyone, they would know that the Greens are fine with ARENA getting new money to spend on transforming industry, electric vehicles, freight and regional microgrids. And that is why we are not seeking to disallow those specific measures in this regulation. The final key objection to the previous regulation is still present in section 7 of this latest executive order, namely that this regulation appears to be ultra vires, that is, beyond the legal power 
of the minister to enact. The new regulation, interestingly, goes to great lengths to make the case as to why the government thinks it is lawful, which itself is extremely revealing. But of course, ultimately, it is the courts, not the minister, that will determine whether it would survive or not. Renewable, the word renewable, is in the name of ARENA. The Act is limited to investments in renewable technologies, not polluting sources like gas, even if they are miraculously low emissions, which anyone who has been paying attention knows they are not. They are most certainly 100 per cent not renewable. And as Senator Waters said in her last contribution, a regulation cannot operate on subject matter that is beyond the scope of the Parent Act. This is ultra virus, beyond the capacity of the minister to enact. The government is so desperate to give public money to their gas donors that they are willing to break the law to do it. The Parliamentary Library has advised that this appears to be beyond legal power, and even the Scrutiny of Bills Committee, which the government has the numbers on, said the same thing. Again, I repeat, if this disallowance fails, the regulation will end up in the legal system. Hopefully the Senate strikes it down and saves everyone the time and the money. We can prevent what One Nation loved to describe as a lawyer's picnic. We can prevent that by a vote here, colleagues, in the Senate this evening. ARENA is a massive success story for this country. ARENA is the kind of thing that happens when you put the Greens into the balance of power with a Labor government in the House of Representatives. Greens in balance of power in the House of Representatives and in the Senate delivered the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. They delivered ARENA for this company. They delivered a world-leading price on carbon before Tony Abbott came along and tore it apart. We can do this again, colleagues, if the Australian people vote the Greens in a balance of power, we can make the next government act more strongly and more quickly on things like climate change. And as a result of what happened last time, the Greens were in balance of power in the House. We've seen the cost of solar in this country driven down through ARENA's solar auctions. We've seen ARENA fund research and jobs for how Australia is going to succeed in this world where there is no place for coal, oil and gas. But the greatest indicator of ARENA's importance and success is the unrel unrelenting attacks this government has thrown to them. And uh, on behalf of the Greens, I thank the Australian Labor Party and the, the crossbenchers who we have worked with constructively and respectfully to try to save the original intent of ARENA, that is to support genuinely renewable energy in this country. I genuinely hope today and I offer on behalf of the Australian Greens our desire that this Senate will support this motion so the government does not succeed in weakening this critical public agency which is so important as we see the climate that sustains all life on this planet breaking down around us as we speak here in the chamber tonight. I urge the Senate to support this disallowance. Oh, thank you, Senator McKim. I'm just going to check Senator Walters. You've appeared back on screen. Do you wish to continue your contribution? Uh, Acting Deputy President Senator McKim was able to do that on my behalf, which I'm very grateful for. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Minister. 
Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The government is committed to supporting the future of jobs in our resources and manufacturing sectors while driving down our emissions. If successful, this disallowance will prohibit millions in funding for carbon capture and storage, which is essential technology for reducing carbon emissions in manufacturing and heavy industry. CCS is an accepted technology that is being invested in by the Biden administration, the UK, the EU, Japan, Singapore, Canada and Korea as part of their plans to reach net zero emissions. The IEA have said that CCS is essential to meeting climate goals. If successful, this disallowance will abandon jobs in our resources, energy and manufacturing sectors. Thank you, Minister. The question before the chair is business of the Senate uh, number three. In the name of Senator Waters, moved by uh, Senator McKim. Those um, who, who agree with the disallowance say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think that the no's have it. Division required. Ring the bell for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is the business of the Senate matter number three in the name of Senator Waters be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell off the ayes, Senator Davey tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 15, noes 15. The matter is resolved in the negative, as it is tied. Senator Smith. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. Earlier in the afternoon, the Senate was dealing with the notice of motion. 1201 in Senator Gallagher's office, and the government whip at the time, which was myself, made an error in the counting and pairing of the government's position. I have consulted with other whips around the chamber, and with, uh, with leave of the chamber, I was hoping we might be able to recommit that vote. I'm sure, given the extensive pairing arrangements, that is understandable, and leave is granted. Senator Urquhart. I was going to ask Senator Smith for an explanation, but I think he's given that, so we are happy to grant leave. Senator Patrick? Just for clarification, which um, uh, notice of motion was it? It was the order for production of documents with respect to the commuter. <laughs> Urban, Urban, with respect to the Urban Congestion Fund in the name of Senator. Senator, Senator McKim. President, just to indicate that the Australian Greens would be happy for this to be recommitted. On that basis, I will just go back. I will, I will re-put the uh, motion, and it is number 1201, if I'm correct, Senator Smith. So the question is that motion, with the leave of the Senate, we're recommitting this. The question is that motion number 1201, the name of Senator Gallagher, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. The eyes have it, the nose have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that we recommit motion number 1201. The ayes will pass to the right of the oh, sorry, the question is that 1201 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell if the ayes and Senator Davy tell if the noes. The result of the division is ayes 15, noes 15. It's being tied. The matter is therefore resolved in the negative. Thanks, Senators. We shall now be returning to government business. I call the clerk. Government business orders of the day. Treasury Laws Amendment COVID-19 Economic Response No. 2 Bill 2021. Resumption of second reading debate and the amendment moved by Senator Gallagher. I'll just allow Senators to exit the chamber because I believe we're going to Senator Rice remotely and noise can be a bit difficult with the remote system. Senator Rice. Thanks, President. I want to start this speech by acknowledging all those who have had the most horrific last 18 months, who have lost loved ones, who have long-term illnesses, who are supporting families and friends with long-term illnesses. There are people who have lost employment, who have lost their homes, who can't afford to pay the rent. People who have juggled working from home with homeschooling, who have suffered anxiety and depression from social isolation. People who have been locked down for weeks, and my heart goes out for everybody in Greater Sydney at the moment and those locked down in Brisbane. I know as a Melbourneian what you are going through. People who are separated from families, who haven't seen loved ones for over two years, who have missed saying goodbye to parents, who have missed funerals. People struggling with mental illness for whom the anxiety and the depression and the stresses of just keeping your head above water have been overwhelming. And elderly people and people with disabilities who have had their world shrink around them, who have felt locked down in their homes for most of the last year and a half, who have had friends no longer able to visit. My mother, who lives at home by herself at the age of 89, she says she and her friends just feel as if you know, the world is telling them not to go out. And then we've got young people who are missing out on the rituals of coming of age, missing out on blossoming relationships, missing out on being on campus at uni, missing out on travelling to the big smoke of leaving home, doing that big overseas trip on their own or with friends. And then there are the people who have had to go out to work during this pandemic despite the risks, the health professionals, the logistics workers, the childcare workers, the school teachers, and the Uber drivers bringing the rest of us our home deliveries. And then the people who have been told that they should be in isolation, but they have, have to. They have taken the risk to go out and earn some money because there has been nothing else for them to do. Otherwise, it's no food on the table, no money to pay the rent. I mean, we can admonish them and say, oh, you're breaking the law and it's no good for the health of our community and it's helping the pandemic to take off. But what would you do if it's a choice between going out and earning a quid or being homeless and on the streets with your family? Of course, the Greens are supporting this bill that is before us for CV. It will provide support to many of these people, but it's not enough. This bill will still leave people living in poverty, still struggling on job seeker of $43 a day. It will leave people with skyrocketing rents and no mortgage freezes. And rather than the minimum handouts that the government feels it can get away with, we should see job seeker doubled again to a livable income of at least $80 a, a, a day as it was last year. We should see job keeper reintroduced. Instead, and this is a choice, we have got the government 
giving minimum support and at the same time is giving tax cuts, billions and billions of dollars in tax cuts to their rich mates. This is a choice and this government is choosing to be spending money to be supporting their rich mates rather than giving the rest of the community the support it needs to get through this pandemic. And we need to see the federal government pull its finger out and fix the botched vaccination rollout and invest in federally run, fit for purpose quarantine facilities so that Australians can come home and be reunited with their families. There are still tens of thousands of Australians who are stranded overseas who have been let down by Prime Minister Morrison. They are facing incredibly challenging situations around the world and they can't come home. Some are running short of money with no support networks. All they want to do is to come home to Australia, but they can't. Some are facing acute health crises and incredible mental health strains. Some of them just want to see loved ones, dying parents, new family members, people they want to care for and support here in Australia, but they can't. And why? Because Prime Minister Morrison has let them down. They can't even return to their own country. It's important that we note that this is a basic human right to return to your own country. Amnesty International summarised that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights say that everyone has the right to return home to their country and shall never be deprived of the right to enter their country. And the problem is that the government has introduced a cap on how many people can return to Australia each week. The cap was introduced so that there were enough facilities in Australia for returnees to isolate. The answer is simple. By increasing the capacity to allow people to isolate, you can increase or even remove the cap and get people home. In February of this year, Adam Bant and I wrote to the Prime Minister. We wrote about the devastating stories we have heard and the awful situation that people are facing in countries around the world. And as part of that, we called upon the Commonwealth to fund and to build more quarantine capacity. Our joint letter said, Prime Minister, to address this crisis, we need more quarantine places. We welcome the steps taken by state governments to provide more places, but the Commonwealth must do more. When he wrote back, the Prime Minister's letter said, the government is doing everything it can to help Australians who have faced difficulty returning, especially those who are the most vulnerable. Of course, we now know that this was not true. Imagine writing in February of 2021 that the government is doing everything it can to help Australians who are stranded overseas. The audacity of telling the Australian public that in fact, the Prime Minister has failed comprehensively on the two jobs that would have made a difference. In June this year, the Australian government proposed three new quarantine facilities. A year and a half into this pandemic, and the Liberal Party finally started work on a plan. Not that they finished developing the quarantine facilities, not that they started taking extra people into these facilities. No, they just put out a statement that they had a plan. Like so much, of Prime Minister Morrison's government, the spin is loud and blustery, but when it comes to meaningful action, it is too little and too late. My office has heard from Australians around the world who are stranded overseas, and every day my staff members are working to support these people. We've tried as much as we can to elevate their voices so that we can make sure that the most vulnerable are getting the support they need. But it's incredibly hard when there's a quarantine bottleneck because Prime Minister Morrison has refused to act. We've heard from and continue to hear from daily people who are unable to enter Australia despite being crucial carers for elderly family members in Australia. People who are in incredibly vulnerable situations with really significant strains on their mental health. People who plan to return, wrapped up their jobs, only to have a flight cancellation, throw out their plans, leaving them incredibly vulnerable. Why are there so many people who clearly meet the criteria for compassionate and compelling circumstances, 
unable to return to Australia. Australia owes a basic duty of care to its citizens, and that includes protecting their basic human rights, including the right to return to Australia. More quarantine facilities could have made that happen, but instead they have been stymied by failure from our Prime Minister on quarantine facilities. So to all those people stranded around the world, desperately trying to return to Australia, we see you, we hear you, we will keep working to make your voices heard in the Australian Parliament and to get you home as soon as we can. Today, when we are debating this bill of support for some people, a le level of support to help Australians get through this pandemic, we think of those people who are stranded overseas and what is not happening to get them home. But I also want to particularly mention the many people who are not Australian citizens who have also been unable to return to Australia. Many have worked here for years and they have family here. But callous cruelty that the Liberal Party shows to so many people, they have been left in limbo for months, and in some cases more than a year. And the failure of Prime Minister Morrison's approach to building Commonwealth quarantine facilities shows up in relation to the many people who clearly qualify the, for the priority migration skilled occupation list, who've had their, their applications denied. And it sh also shows in the incredibly harsh conditions that have been placed on people in India compared to the lesser restrictions placed on people traveling from other countries. We need genuine action from our government to build the quarantine facilities that should have been finished years, months ago so that those around the world who are so desperate to return to Australia and be reunited with family can do so. And as we talk about the impacts of COVID-19, it's important that Australia actually looks beyond the borders, beyond our borders, and do everything we can for our regional neighbours. Here is another big gap in the government's response to COVID. And because other countries around the world are facing much bigger challenges than we are. I particularly want to mention the impact of young people in the Pacific of COVID-19. I met with some wonderful young folk from Oak Tree yesterday who told me about the complex issues faced by young people in our region, where 50% of the global population is under the age of 30. Nine out of 10 people live in countries classified as developing. And that the Indo-Pacific is experiencing a youth bulge where there are 1.7 billion young people under the age of 25. And those young people are facing an increasing set of really complex challenges. Many face unemployment or work in insecure or informal employment. And that's before we start talking about the compounding impacts of the pandemic and the climate emergency that we face. And we know, of course, that young people, because of that work in insecure employment, can be at risk in, in some more risk in some ways to exposure to COVID-19. And beyond that, the lockdowns have impacted their incomes, their ability to access education and their mental health. And so many of these people have had their schooling massively disrupted through the pandemic. And they're having to cope with COVID ripping through their communities, killing thousands of people and infecting millions with vastly inadequate health facilities and limited access to vaccines. So we call upon the Australian government. There are steps forward that the Greens are supporting in this bill, but it is not enough. There is so much more that needs to be done. We call on the government to be taking more meaningful action, in particular to be supporting young people across the Indo-Pacific. And that should include significantly increasing our aid budget to much higher levels. That would ensure that we are providing the development assistance to countries across the region and providing support to young people who have been impacted by this pandemic. And it's not just in their interest, it's also in our interest as Australia to be supporting people across the region, to be supporting the well-being of people across the region, to be supporting these countries, to be dealing with the pandemic and, and not to be fermenting unrest in their countries. So the Australian government should be providing much more support for COVAX, which we've called for repeatedly for months now to ensure that vaccines are available as widely as possible. And it must also take action to advocate for the TRIPS waiver so that vaccines can be produced at lower prices and to be more readily available. In this bill, 
provides a small level of the help and support needed in Australia. But locally here and globally, the Australian government can do more and it must. We are here facing a global pandemic. There are choices to be made. And the choices that need to be made are ones that support the community to say this is where resources are needed. We should not be talking about more support for the big end of town, for billionaires, for massive tax cuts, putting billions more dollars in the pockets of the already extraordinarily well off. We should not be talking about about handing out subsidies to our fossil fuel industries who do not need them. We should not be having rots providing um, facilities that aren't required, that are being made, political decisions that are being made purely on the basis of politics. What we should be having is a government that looks at what the needs of the community are, sees that there is a need there and can take action. The government, this bill is a small start, it's a little bit of what we could be doing, but so much more is needed. And I urge this government to take that action so we can be building a healthy and prosperous and sustainable Australia. Thank you. Thank you. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak as a senator for the great state of New South Wales, six weeks now in lockdown. And I want to put on um, the record some of the challenges that are facing businesses who desperately need, desperately need assistance. Today I received correspondence from a company that describes itself uh, as a 63-year-old commercial construction business headquartered in Albury, with additional offices in Orange and Ulladulla. It's a very significant employer. They talk about the construction industry, how that's been shut down. And all of this goes to the government's failure to do those two critical jobs of government, to plan a proper form of quarantine that wouldn't leak on at least 28 occasions and to provide proper vaccination. <laughs> companies like Zauna and companies right across the Central Coast that suffered uh, in last year's lockdown a 45 per cent loss of revenue over two weeks uh, have faced now in this lockdown, in the first two weeks of the lockdown in New South Wales, a 20, um, sorry, a 23 per cent loss last year and 48 per cent after two months. Now they're down 45 per cent in this year alone. So the impact on business is absolutely enormous. In Sydney right now, there are 286 people who are in hospital. We've had 17 deaths. And I just want to put on record how distressing it is as a mother of three 20-somethings to think about what the family of the 20-year-old young person who died in New South Wales is going through now, how entirely preventable this illness could be if there was access to the vaccines, if the government had acted. We're discussing in this particular piece of legislation a response to the economic impact but the economic impact is not separate from our lives. It's not sep separate from the illness. It's not separate from the mental health challenges. It's not separate from the identity issues that people are struggling with. In the LGAs of Campbelltown, Blacktown, Canterbury, Bankstown, Cumberland, Fairfield, George's River, Liverpool and Parramatta, huge numbers of Australians who have ABNs, who are hardworking tradies, blue-collar workers who cannot work from home, are stuck in their homes and many of them are facing challenges of being unable to feed their families. They are looking to this Liberal National Party government to respond to their challenges. And the government has come forward with you know, a few different plans that carved out businesses, put some back in, uh, said it was you couldn't do anything, couldn't help you if you didn't spend your first your ten thousand dollars in the bank, then they waived that. They've, there's so many changes. And for so many people who are from a non-English speaking background or if literacy is not their strong suit but they're great workers, they are struggling to understand not only the health orders and directions that keep changing, but struggling to participate in the scheme that the government's constructed. There is some money. It's coming through, but it's not working in the way that we need it to work and not in a timely way. I also want to just quickly indicate that critical to getting the messages out in these eight LGAs in total lockdown in, in Sydney are the churches. 
and the faith leaders from all of the faiths. And they are out there trying to do their best to support the people in their community. They're offering spiritual nourishment, mental health support, and they're providing physical support through charities that are associated with them. And I just want people to know that while the government here has provided some financial support, at the same time, they are trying to put through regulations with regard to charities and the, commissions, uh, the not for profit Commission's amendment that is actually going to massively limit and impact all of the communities of faith who practice charitable works in our community. The government are there saying, we want your help going to communities of faith, and at the same time as they're doing that, they are actually constructing regulation that will massively limit what great Australian charities attached to so many religions are doing in the community. That, again, is an indication of what the government says and what it does, how all the things that it says it's doing don't match up with actually what it does. So I warn people in communities of faith to protect those communities, to stand up and say to the government, we need to look after one another right now. Don't attack our faith community. Don't attack the charities that we desperately need in the middle of this enormous crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, now into 2021, that is doing such damage to families, communities and businesses right across this country, but particularly those people from New South Wales in Campbelltown, Blacktown, Canterbury, Bankstown, Cumberland, Fairfield, Georges River, Liverpool and Parramatta, and of course on the central coast, the Blue Mountains and Shell Harbour down around Wollongong, where they're so captured by the chaos of a failure of government by the Liberal National Party in New South Wales in concert with this federal government. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm speaking from my home in lockdown as Greater Sydney has entered its sixth week of lockdown. Millions of people are under stay-at-home orders as the virus circulates in our community. Tragically, people are dying because vaccinations haven't been provided, even to essential workers who have to leave home and are expected to stoically put their health and that of their families at risk. It was heartbreaking to hear today of the death of 27-year-old Adi Alaskar, who collapsed in his Warwick farm unit. And my deep, deepest condolences go to his wife, family and friends, and those of others who have passed due to COVID-19. It has also been weeks of anguish for people unable to see loved ones and under immense financial and health stress. And all of this could have been avoided if the Morrison government had just done their job. Our vaccination rates are very low compared to other OECD countries, thanks to the completely botched up rollout by the Prime Minister and his government, that we simply cannot expect to return to any semblance of normal life anytime soon, unless we change course immediately and drastically. I do really want to thank people, especially people in Southwest and Western Sydney, who have turned up in droves to get te tested and to get vaccinated. We have seen some of the highest numbers of tests ever conducted, and the rates of first doses of vaccinations are going up. And this is despite the lack of testing facilities and the misinformation about vaccines spread and cultivated by politicians. This government has time and again failed to acknowledge the depth of the economic hardship that comes with COVID lockdowns. We know that millions of people, especially those left behind by this government, have had to endure this pandemic in poverty. And they are being pushed further into poverty with these repeated lockdowns. Yet, we have another Band-Aid bill in front of us. This is pretty appalling and shameful for a country as rich as Australia, where billionaires and the wealthiest are accumulating wealth because the Liberals and disappointingly Labour are handing them more and more while everyone else has less and less. It's now four times that you have attempted to replace JobKeeper with something else, which has always been inferior. Instead of simply reintroducing JobKeeper and the coronavirus supplement, here we are again with the government trying to come up with yet another version of payments, trying to do the bare minimum it can get away with. And we will not let you get away with this. 
millions of casual workers, our higher education sector, our artists and small businesses, construction workers, people in insecure work are suffering. We need JobKeeper 2.0, where millions of casuals and others on temporary visas are not left behind. People doing it tough need economic certainty and economic security. We need much faster vaccinations so people can move forward with their lives. Raise the rate and bring that job seeker above the poverty line so people can live with some sort of security in these incredibly difficult times. The government has completely failed the vaccine rollout and is now failing its responsibility to, pro to provide relief for the immense economic hardship that people are facing, especially in my home state of New South Wales and Greater Sydney, where we are still in hard lockdowns and life has come to a standstill. We support this bill, but it isn't enough. Surely you too, even with your neoliberal hats permanently on, can see the deep inequalities that have been starkly exposed and heightened by the pandemic. Indeed, some of the measures initiated by the Morrison government last year, such as free childcare, moratoriums on evictions and rent rises, and raising the rate of income support above the poverty line, were a tacit acknowledgement of the failures of a system built on profit-making and privatization. We know what needs to be done. Income support that includes all workers, raising the rate of job seeker above the poverty line, expanding the public service sector across the board, making essential services like health and education universal and free. And we need to head towards a society which has the well-being and welfare of all people at heart. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Hanson Young. Madam Acting uh, Deputy President, I rise today to uh, support uh, the comments and contributions made by my uh, Greens colleagues in relation to this and pay tribute to uh, Senator Faruqi there, who um, has so eloquently spoken about the realities uh, facing people right now in Sydney in lockdown. I'm sorry you're not here with us, Senator Faruqi, um, but thank you for representing your constituents. As, good, as well as you can um, from there at home. And to all of um, uh, our friends and loved ones in New South Wales and in Greater Sydney right now, um, and those in Queensland, um, as a South Australian, uh, I am, um, I'm really sorry we're continuing to have to go through this. And I'm really sorry that um, for those in industries that have been hardest hit by the pandemic, the arts industry, the entertainment industry, hospitality, tourism, that government support has really waned throughout this pandemic over the last 12 to 18 months. For so long, uh, arts and entertainment workers, for example, were left out in the cold. They got nothing until months and months later. And then, when the government prematurely stopped JobKeeper well before there was any horizon for arts and entertainment workers, I, I might, um, Madam Acting Deputy President, I'm speaking about the hardship of people in lockdown, those who have lost their jobs, and all I can hear is Senator Van mouthing off aggressively. So I just want to make that clear to everybody listening that this is what this senator thinks of your hardship. Senator, senator Van, could please continue, Senator. Hanson Thank Young. you, Madam Acting Deputy President. For those who have not been able to have access to enough government support to get them through what has been a torrid and awful time, who have lost jobs, who have lost work, many of whom who have lost hope of really ever being able to go back into a sector like arts or entertainment. Many of the tourism operators who are just pulling their hair out, wondering when and why their industry never got a specific support package. I'm glad that we're seeing support on the table now uh, for an 
a number of people and organisations, businesses, workers uh, who are currently in lockdown in Sydney and in Queensland, but there are so many more who still have nothing. And it's time for the government to really understand and acknowledge that unless we inject proper support, particularly into the arts, the entertainment, the tourism sector, we are going to lose an entire generation of artists, of creatives, of workers in those sectors. And it's, you know, they're sectors that are intertwined. They rely on each other, and they've had such a massive blow. JobKeeper should never have been ripped away from those industries and those workers in the first place. They need industry-specific support, and those workers need support as well. Tourism operators and artists in South Australia or in WA or in Victoria or in Tasmania right now or in the Northern Territory, they may not be in lockdown, <laughs> but their, their business has been destroyed. There is no work. People can't travel. We're all, being, we're all working together hard to defeat this virus, to keep our community protected, to keep our community healthy. We're in this together, except that some people, if you work in those industries, well, they've kind of been left out in the cold. I urge the, the, the Prime Minister and his government to reconsider the support that they, and the level of support that they are offering those in the industry's hardest hit. The construction industry and you know, the, the, under the Home Builder program got an uncapped program. Hundreds of millions of dollars has been spent keeping that industry afloat and giving, putting money into the pockets of workers and businesses. But the arts and the entertainment industry, they got nothing like that. A small, capped program that was oversubscribed and then everybody was kicked off JobKeeper. So there is a long way to go in relation to helping people deal with this. And without any proper vaccine rollout, without fixing hotel quarantine, this is going to continue for some time. And we've got members within the Prime Minister's own government actively undermining the vaccine rollout and the health response. What message does that send to workers who have lost their jobs, whether it's in the last week, the last fortnight or over the last 18 months? I mean, I think it's incredibly selfish for members in this place or the other. We haven't lost our jobs. We haven't taken a pay cut as politicians. I think it's incredibly selfish for, for members in this place or the other to, to advocate dangerous positions that undermine the very response that every other Australian is being asked to take in order to get through this, despite losing so many people losing their jobs or losing hours, losing money, businesses closing. So when Mr George Christensen tells people not to go and get vaccinated, what does that say? to the tourism operator in Queensland whose business is now dead in the water, or the artist who's struggling to get the next gig. No idea when that will happen. Or the mum who's doing as many shifts as she, as she can at the local cafe to make sure she can afford the uniforms and the school camps. George Christensen, Mr Christensen and Senator Rennick for that matter, Craig Kelly, Mr Kelly, Alan Jones, Sky News, they're all making it much harder for these people to get back up on their feet. 
It's insulting. Anyway, I'm glad we're seeing some more support being put on the table, but it's far short of what is needed. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, you know, I've, I've been listening this afternoon and I've heard some phrases thrown around, band-aid solution, bring back job keeper. You know, and those opposite, those sitting at home on the screens, sitting to my right, I mean, they just don't get it. This is a pandemic like no one has ever seen before. It's a one in a hundred year event. The Morrison government has continued to be focused on lives and livelihoods. This means we don't look to a set and forget how we roll out financial assistance to business and individuals as the pandemic has changed, as we've seen situations evolve. And you know, I, I, want to, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this persistent call for JobKeeper to be returned. Now, we heard from those officers when JobKeeper entered Lasco that the world was going to end, that we were going to fall off an economic cliff. And we saw that that just didn't happen. And in fact, we saw more Australians in work than pre-pandemic conditions. So this call for JobKeeper, you would think by now they might have figured out that they got it wrong then. And so they've got it wrong again now. And I want to draw attention to uh, Mr Paul Waterson's comments uh, when he's been discussing the assistance that's been given to his business, Australian Venue Company, or AVC. Uh, they own a number of hospitality venues, particularly pubs, across Australia. And he's actually said that what the Morrison government is proposing now to assist workers with direct payments to workers from the Commonwealth, as opposed to a JobKeeper program which was administered by a business, is that it's all the best parts of JobKeeper with improvements. And the improvements include those workers on visas that previously didn't qualify. And so they now are able to access some assistance. The other part of what's being looked at now is because this isn't a national lockdown, this isn't happening the same in every state across the country. And you know, I'm a, I'm a senator from New South Wales and I know how tough it is for everybody at home around Sydney uh, and Greater Sydney at the moment. But AVC and its pubs that are shut at the moment wouldn't have actually been able to access JobKeeper because whilst their venues are shut in Sydney and uh, a lot are shut in South Australia and, and Queensland, they're not shut in the other states. So therefore the group's revenue would not have been seen to decline enough to allow them access to the previous JobKeeper payment. So by looking at modifying things, you know, being a bit adaptable, looking at how we can change, make things better, learn, move forward, continue to develop. What we've actually done now is allowed a system that's impacting, uh, that's going to provide assistance to those individuals that are impacted, not look at businesses that may be national groups. So whilst ABC has around 2,000 of its 5,400 employees that have been stood down, they're maintaining significant contact with them because, again, this is one of the, the claims that JobKeeper was allowing bosses to stay connected to their employees. Well, what a lot of businesses discovered, particularly in the post-lockdown economic bounce that we seem to, to see happen quite regularly, was that a lot of businesses were struggling to find workers. So businesses are doing everything that they can to remain connected to their staff. So if you look at a company like ABC, one of those most you know, impacted areas when it comes to hospitality, pubs, you know, no vertical imbibing, all those sorts of things that went on, square limit limitations, uh, all of those sorts of um, impacts that we're having across this industry, what they're doing is looking at training for their staff, remaining connected to them, keeping training programs going, because they know this will end, things will change things will open back up again. 
They want to make sure that they've still got access to those staff, that they're still connected to them, but perhaps they've even taken the opportunity to grow their staff, to develop their skills and look at ways that they'll be best served to open up as quickly as possible when they can. So they're keeping that connection with their staff. Other initiatives that, that you know, admittedly this is a larger organisation, but they have offered staff an incentive that if they remain employed with the group through to January, because obviously in pubs and hospitality we see a little, you know, it can be quite a transient workforce, it tends to be quite a young workforce, that they're topping up their pay to 80 per cent of what it normally would be if they're, they're currently not earning as much money and receiving as much money as they normally do. But if they're still with the company by January, at the end of January, which of course hopefully we're all back open again and can enjoy particularly the fabulous Sydney summer, uh, but that once these venues you know, reopen up and these staff go back to work and if they stay until the end of January, they don't have to pay the money back. So the businesses are continuing to invest in their staff as best as they can, connecting with their staff and making sure that those employee and employer connections are remaining strong. But, you know, as I said at the beginning, this is about focusing on lives and livelihoods. And by playing politics, I mean, we talk about the vaccine and the vaccine rollout and people, on, particularly on the opposite side, calling out about the vaccine rollout. Well, it's the vaccine hesitancy that half of you lot have been responsible for that are causing the problems. And you consistently, consistently cling to this. And you know, you've got chief health officers in states, and I know our friend in Queensland up there, I mean, that abomination. You know, the comments that she makes are just out of control. No wonder vaccine hesitancy in Queensland is at the highest across the country. I mean, what an embarrassment. The fact that you know, the Premier wants to promote this woman, I mean, maybe we should get her up there as soon as possible so she can stop giving health advice, because I can tell you that's not a strong suit. But you know, this is where we're seeing the vaccine hesitancy come in. People are vaccine shopping. The best vaccine you can get is the one that's available. Go and get it. Get your arm out and get the jab. And there are plenty of options to do it. And in fact, Senator Pratt, Senator Order. Pratt, if you're struggling Order. to find a vaccine, Order. I've actually developed on my website, I've put together a COVID page Order. and it's got both state and federal booking systems. And it's actually got some information, like actual information, not not Ms York's or Dr York's Order. interpretation. It's got actual information from real scientists who've got some experience Order. in haematology, understand how viruses and, and vaccines work. And that, you know, we've put the information together for them so people can go to my website, you know, have a look, Senator Pratt, hollyhughes.com.au. We've got all the booking systems there. And the booking systems Order. include the GP rollout. And outrageously, I mean, I know this guy must be at such a blow to you because you consistently need to talk things down. I can't imagine how much the Olympics are disappointing you at the moment that we're just going so well. The fact you'd have to cheer Australia on at any point might kill you. But, you know, if you go to my website, you can have a look at all the booking systems. And I can show you, you know, I'm happy to walk you through it because a couple of them there actually cover WA. And you can go on there and have a look and see where the GPs are. I mean, Jimmy Reese could give Ms. Uh, Premier McGowan's press conferences, shut the borders. I mean, that's all we ever get from Premier McGowan. The fact that his national cabinet walks out, agrees with the Prime Minister and then says we're going to do it on our own terms, it's a disgrace, absolute disgrace. And this sort of contribution to the conversation, if it doesn't stop, this is a national conversation and these premiers need to start putting this, them and their CHOs back in their boxes. Stop Order. spreading vaccine hesitation. Start encouraging people to get it. Go and make it easier for people to go and get into that. Get Order. into the lockdown. You guys will lock down when someone sneezes. I mean, it's just insanity. It's embarrassing having lived in WA for a while. I mean, guys, just secede already if that's what you think. But you know, Order. you know, this vaccine hesitation, picking a vaccine. I still want to know if everyone can tell me who had their flu shot this year, what brand it was. Anyone know? I went to p and a couple of years ago, couldn't tell you what brand any of those vaccines were. You know, but got a flu vax, got a Pfizer, you know, got an AstraZeneca. Depend what you want, but it's all there and available. And you guys just can't stand it. You cannot bear that we've now hit 12 million, do 12 million doses. You can't stand that yesterday was a record day of doses of over 200,000. You guys should be ashamed of yourself. Get on Team Australia. 
Get out there and encourage constituents. Go and encourage people to have their vaccine shots. Go and show them. I'll send you a link, Senator Pratt. You can check out the vaccination booking systems. And do you know the great thing about them? What we've seen when we've recommended people to them, they've actually been able to get a vaccine within two days, sometimes faster. But you know, I digress because we were, we're talking about not only the vaccine hesitation, but how good it is now for people to be able to go and access these vaccines when they're not shopping around. They're not shopping around and listening to, you know, Dr. York of all people. Just just have Nick Coatesworth on. At least he knows what he's talking about. Guy's got a bit of, you know, got some sort of comprehension of what's going to be involved in this process. But you know, here we are. But so what this government's focused on is actually providing benefits and financial assistance to individuals. So when we want to talk about the times, you know, I just said we can get a vaccination within a couple of days. One of the things that we've learned since we've introduced this new scheme for people to get assistance, sometimes the money's in their bank within 40 minutes. You know, by cutting out that visit that we were going through, you know, Order. going straight into their bank account within 40 minutes. I mean, can you imagine this sort over, over the other side? They wouldn't have a system up that you could have it in the bank by 40 minutes. I mean, you know, and then, I mean, can I just, just pop this in? Because I do think it's gold this week with the 300 buck cash incentive. I mean, that's like a cash for clunkers. Off we go again. Let's get the pink bats and the school halls happening, shall we? The cash splash, the cashes, the checks to dead people. Here we go again in there, in the way they want to address this. But, but you know, I mean, it's hilarious because we hear from those opposite, bring back JobKeeper. We need JobKeeper. Bring it back, bring it back, bring it back. And then we get, particularly Senator Chisholm and a couple of the others like to get up and have a bit of a whinge and they're a bit upset because Harvey Norman accessed JobKeeper. Oh, 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 guess what? The Australia Club accessed JobKeeper, heaven forbid. They need to pay it back. But don't worry about the 300 bucks. Let's give it to Gina Reinhardt. I'm pretty sure Katie Page and uh, you know they'd all love their 300 bucks. So let's just splash that cash around for absolutely no burn, you know no targeting. Just chuck it out there, see how we go. But no, 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 no. These guys, no consistency, no real comprehension of how things work, of how people actually want support and real support and support delivered to them in a timely fashion. And I reckon in anyone's book, 40 minutes from the being on Centrelink into your bank account is a pretty good effort. But you know, you won't hear a word over there. Talk it all down. Negative, negative, negative. Let's talk about the graphs, the fact that we're at the bottom, the bottom of the death tally, my oh, friends. Yeah. The bottom of the death tally. But we won't ever say that. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. We won't acknowledge the, the lower end, you know, bottom of the death tally. Order. But you know, here we are again. I mean, these guys obviously they didn't pay much attention in maths class because they don't understand how to read these graphs or what's happening in them or what they actually mean or, you know, it's just you know they just want to chuck the cash out wherever they can to whoever doesn't need it for whatever they can think of. But you know, one of the best vac vaccine hesitancy people that, that I love this. It's because you know the opposition leader, in his bid to make a point of difference from the member for Maribyrn on, who's out there cheering the AstraZeneca on, love Mr. Shorten's uh, photos of him getting his AstraZeneca and out there at every media opportunity. Every media opportunity, he's banging that leadership drum. All those ambitions coming back through. But you know there he is supporting AstraZeneca, supporting Order. Australians, wanting them to get the jab. And what does Mr Albanese do? What does the opposition leader do? Races out, races out as soon as possible Senator to Brown. find an anti-vax campaigner. Some Order. woman who, I mean, by the way, her tweet today was just gold. If anyone hasn't seen it, go have a look. It's a cracker. You know, he is out of time. He is out of ideas. And we, I don't think she was supposed to be as a, as a newly in, uh, endorsed Senator uh, Labor Hughes, candidate. Your time has expired. It being 7.20 p.m., I propose that the Senate now adjourn and Senator Davey. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, the Guardian is today reporting that international charity Oxfam has warned that reforestation or afforestation as a mechanism to tackle climate change risks global food security and will drive up food prices, in, particularly in developing nations. The report Tightening the net, net zero climate targets and the implications for land and food equity, says planting even a fraction 
of the area needed to offset global greenhouse gas emissions would encroach on land needed to grow crops to feed a growing population. According to Nafkoti Dani, and I apologise if I've mispronounced that, the Climate Policy Lead at Oxfam, it is difficult to tell how much land would be required for offsets as governments have not been transparent in how they will meet net zero targets. This is the point. This is the point that the nationals have been trying to make. We need to understand how we're going to achieve net zero without unintended consequences. We need to understand the methodology of the accounting. We've already seen in Australia agricultural land locked up as native vegetation tracks to meet emissions reduction targets. Meanwhile, this ignores the crucial role that Australian agriculture and forestry can play in helping us as a nation to sequester carbon and reduce emissions. The Oxfam analysis found nature-based solutions that focused on managed forestry, agroforestry, pasture and soil management and croplands are better options to allow people to both produce food while sequestering carbon. When we talk climate change in agriculture, we must acknowledge the hard lifting that our farmers have and are doing. The meat industry has done extensive research on reducing emissions from livestock by changing diets. The pork industry has world-leading examples of methane to power conversion. Every commodity is looking at ways to do their bit. And so too our forestry industry should be applauded rather than lambasted. Today, the taxpayer-funded New South Wales Environmental Defenders Office have announced they're taking the forestry industry in New South Wales to court to argue against regional forestry agreements. It is well known that trees absorb carbon, particularly in the earlier growth phases. By harvesting that timber, you capture that carbon. By using that timber for wood products, furniture, timber housing frames and the like, you capture that carbon forever. The alternative to plant a tree and walk away doesn't give you the opportunity to replant, regenerate and restart the cycle. Planting trees and walking away only captures carbon to a point. The trees absorb during their younger years, plateau later in life and then later still start to release carbon. And the land is locked up for good and it doesn't produce anything that helps humankind in the, so far as food and fibre. The Australian forest industry has over 125 million hectares under plantation at the moment. That makes us the world's seventh largest forested nation. But only 78,000 hectares, or 0.06 per cent, is harvested for timber production in any one year. That leaves the rest of it all there absorbing carbon. But instead of celebrating this sustainable green industry, the Greens and others want to curtail it, just like they do with our agriculture. Regarding the EDO uh, case in New South Wales, the federal court has already sensibly rejected similar claims in Tasmania and Victoria. But these constant legal challenges, this environmental lawfare, is costing the industry billions diverting attention away from having them improve practices and increase sustainability. We have to stop this lawfare. We've got to stop branding our farmers and foresters as environmental vandals and embrace the vital role they will play in both helping us meet our emissions reduction targets and feeding our nation and the world. We need to give our businesses and farmers longer-term certainty. Uh, we need to back our industries, back the families that work in forestry, back our farmers and back our communities. Thank you. Senator Brown. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to address the need for urgent support for small Australian production companies in our screen industry. I'm referring especially to those involved in children's television production. Despite proposing an harmonised Australian screen content quota, the government has not introduced an Australian local content obligation for streaming services, four years after the government's Australian and children's screen content review. 
In June, the Morrison Liberal government even tried to pass legislation which would have halved the 10 per cent Australian content expenditure requirement for subscription TV services like Foxtel. That cut to screen content requirements was criticised by the Senate Environment and Communications Committee, including by the government's own senators on the committee. Fortunately, that part of the bill was killed off by a Labor amendment in the Senate. This all highlights the Morrison Liberal government's woeful record on supporting Australian screen content. That track record involves watering down children's content, sub-quotas, for free-to-air broadcasters. Blue Rocket Productions is an international children's content powerhouse, but a small production co company based in my home state of Tasmania. It is a multi-award winning animation studio. Blue Rocket has been in business for 22 years, sending quality local children's content across the country and around the whole world. They have created 23 children's TV series and a feature film. Blue Rocket describes the decision to cut children's content sub-quotas as, and I quote, in September 2020, the federal government cancelled the Australian children's quotas for the commercial free-to-air broadcaster, saving them 0.745 per cent of their Australian production expenditure, putting thousands of people out of work and jeopardising dozens of production companies." End quote. Without sub-quotas for children's content for free-to-air television, the Morrison Liberal government wrongly assumes commercial interests will pick up the pieces. This will not happen, as they well know, because their own media reform green paper tells them, and again I quote, due to Australia's small market, this content can be financially risky to produce, with costs often not able to be recouped in the domestic market, end quote. So there it is. Our broadcasters cannot but cannot be relied on to produce enough quality local screen content without a compulsory sub-quota being in place. The sub-quota support is what help, helps make our children's television the international and local success it is. My Tasmanian colleagues and I met, have met with David Gurney from Blue Rocket and other stakeholders to discuss, discuss the impact the removal of the sub-quota is having. Earlier this year, Mr Gurney also discussed his concern with the Mercury newspaper, and at the time he said the pandemic, pandemic has had an impact, but the decision of the Morrison Liberal government has had a greater impact. A series Blue Rocket has been preparing for four years has been abandoned as a direct result of the sub-quotas cut. Blue Rocket, after 22 successful years, is suddenly down from 40 to seven employees. To again directly quote David Gurney, I think that Blue Rocket, along with about 30 other independent children's production companies, has been placed in a very precarious position by the federal government, extraordinary at a time when, when employment is so desperately needed in Australia." End quote. Nick, who was 44 and has worked for Blue Rocket for 23 years, had this to say. Removing the quotas has cut my family off at the knees and placed us all under significant financial stress. I don't know if we'll recover from it. These are real people. These are real jobs. This is a short-sighted and completely unnecessary decision by the Morrison Liberal government. As I was saying, Blue Rocket has gone from 40 employees down to seven. Today, I have been informed Blue Rocket has dropped to one employee. That's Mr G Gurney himself. Today, I've also been informed this successful business, Blue Rocket, will close in a matter of weeks. The Morrison Liberal government has undermined an otherwise successful industry for no good. I will finish by again quoting Mr Gurney. Our ch kids' production sector has flatlined with thousands of people out of work and many companies put in severe jeopardy thanks to the government's ill-informed Ill and poorly considered reforms. Has the federal government got a crack in its motherboard? Seriously, this is simply appalling and beyond disappointing. Mr President, I call on the government to recognise and acknowledge the impact their short-sighted decision-making is having on our creative industries and the hard-working individuals employed by them. I implore them to do something to save this industry. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, I rise tonight to speak about uh, child support. Now, child support is always a difficult topic. Uh, normally involves uh, parents uh, and uh, children, uh, and you know, whatever answer you get out of the child support system, uh, you know, these are people 
or parents who perhaps can't agree exactly on uh, on an approach moving forward to make su make sure children are, su are supported. Um, whatever is determined by the, the the child support agency, my experience is no one's uh, no one's ever happy, whether it's the mother or the father, um, and that's because. Uh, there is emotion involved, and there's different perspectives involved. And the child support agency does a, a, a useful job in at least trying to find some point at which there's not too much disagreement or too much unhappiness, and that the, the children are looked after. Now, the way in which child support is calculated, uh, in uh, most circumstances, there are. Uh, certain circumstances where, as I uh, said before, some parents just agree on a particular amount uh, that is paid uh, be between the, the two parents. Others um, have special circumstances and there are special processes, but the bulk of Australians uh, have what's called the, the, sort of the child support formula applied to them. And that formula basically involves considering uh, the income of the father, the income of the mother, um, and uh, the number of children, and how much time each of the parents spend caring for the children. It's uh, uh, basically a formula. You put the numbers in, and it pops out and says uh, one of the parents has to pay this, and the other parent has to pay that, uh, and and therefore uh, you know, it's, there'll be some uh, difference that uh, that's paid. Uh, and it might end up with uh, a father uh, paying. Uh, a mother, or vice versa, and look, it is fair to say, 90% of uh, child support uh, payees are, are, are women. Uh, but um, we, we should try and keep the gender out of this because you know, it's about parents. Now, one of the difficulties is uh, I said to you that uh, I've, I've indicated that the formula involves under, an understanding of the salaries on both sides. How does, how does the child support agency get those salaries? They rely on tax returns from the mother and the father. And uh, unfortunately, we've got a situation in Australia where parents are not lodging their tax returns. Now, it's actually unlawful to not lodge a tax return, and so you might be surprised to find out, maybe not so much this year uh, where we've experienced uh, COVID, but uh, of child support um, uh, clients. 213,000 haven't lodged their tax return within uh, the year. Uh, 101,000 uh, are two years uh, late. Uh, there's uh, another 152,000 that are somewhere between three and five years late, and there's 130,000 that are six to ten years late. Now, what that means, parents not lodging their tax returns means the formula is wrong. The amount that, that is being paid by one parent to the other to support children is wrong. First, we've got to make sure the tax office enforces the law, that people are made to lodge their tax returns on time so we get the correct answer. But some people may well be gaming the system. They get a job. They get, they get a pay rise, they get a promotion, and over time their salary builds up and they don't lodge their tax returns. And the child support agency just increments their salary uh, in accordance with CPI. And uh, you might have a, uh, a large uh, salary earner who uh, ends up paying far less child support than what uh, is uh, proper. And we need to remedy that. And I've asked on several occasions, and I have been uh, talking to, to Senator Rustin, but we need to provide or put in place a punitive measure that if people don't want to comply with the law and lodge their tax ref uh, returns and they are uh, child support uh, payees, or, um, and, and uh, the same goes for people on, on, that are receiving money because their salary affects the outcome, then we've got to have a punitive uh, uh, remedy Maybe we have to pay twice as much child support or three times as much child support, but we cannot have the situation continuing as, as it stands because children are missing out on proper support. Senator Green, remotely. Thank you, Mr. President.
Um, I'm very pleased to be joining the Senate tonight um, from Cairns. Unfortunately, though, we are facing our own Delta outbreak. This week, millions of Queenslanders are in lockdown in southeast Queensland from the Gold Coast, Brisbane and the Sunshine Coast. Many people in regional Queensland are also isolating at home. And in Cairns, we have families across the region who are isolating at home and getting tested to prevent the spread of the Delta strain. We have one confirmed case in Cairns as of today, a maritime pilot who tested positive even though he was fully vaccinated. And as a result, a number of local locations are now listed as exposure sites. It is very important for us to keep Cairns COVID free. 10% of the Cairns population is Indigenous. Cairns is also the gateway to the Cape and the Torres Strait. An outbreak in those communities would be catastrophic. We simply cannot risk it. And as senators are fully aware, Cairns and far north Queensland have been absolutely smashed economically by COVID-19. An outbreak of the Delta variant here in far north Queensland would be the final straw for so many of our businesses. Australians have been plunged into uncertainty and disruption because of a leaky quarantine system and a slow vaccine rollout. Scott Morrison had two jobs this year, a speedy, effective rollout of the vaccine and quarantine. He has failed both and now far north Queenslanders are paying the price. Australia has seen 27 leaks from hotel quarantine, numerous lockdowns across the country, separated by loved ones, and yet it's still not clear what it will take to get Scott Morrison to step up and get the job done. This is a Prime Minister who refuses to take responsibility. He said that it wasn't a race, but it has always been a race for people living in far north Queensland and remote far north Queensland up through the Cape and the Torres Strait. It has always been a race for us to get this right. But unfortunately, in the Cairns region, only 21% of people aged over 15 have been fully vaccinated. And now we face the dire consequences of a Delta strain outbreak in a community that cannot afford it. Lockdowns have been made necessary by Scott Morrison's failure on vaccines and quarantine, and they are costing the economy around $300 million each day. The economy is bleeding hundreds of millions of dollars each week because Scott Morrison hasn't done his job. This is the price that Australian workers and small businesses are paying for his incompetence. And there are no businesses that know this better than people living in far north Queensland. They know this because throughout this pandemic, they have been hit over and over again by the economic impacts of lockdowns. This is what local business leaders are saying, and this is what they are pleading for, more support from the Morrison government. Patricia O'Neill from the Cairns Chamber of Commerce said, we are hearing tourism operators are losing between $3 million and $5 million a day. We have retailers reporting not a single transaction on their cash registers a day. Darren Barber from Wolf Lane Distillery said, we know this uncertainty is damaging to business confidence. CEO of SkyRail, a tourism attraction here in Cairns, Ken Chapman said, we are now in the depths of the situation we had 12 months ago, but 12 months ago we had JobKeeper. And Mark Olson from TTNQ said this only yesterday, without visitation or without wage support, we will lose businesses. We won't lose them for one week or two weeks. We will lose them forever. Unfortunately, what we know about this uh, government, about Scott Morrison, is he does not take responsibility. He doesn't take responsibility for his stuff ups. And now far north Queenslanders are paying the price. There is no economic support for these businesses and these workers from the Morrison government. There is no wage subsidy. There is no economic support because although they're not in a lockdown right now, they are locked out of the revenue that tourists bring to our town. Far North Queensland has been through it all this year, all last year. They are on their knees and this government, this government is letting them down. It is a disgrace and the government needs to step up and do better.
Senator Faruqi remotely. Thank you, Mr. President. Another week marking homelessness and another week marking lack of action by the government to reduce homelessness. People wait for over a decade to access public housing in some parts of Australia, while hundreds of thousands of people seek help from homelessness services each year. The last census showed us that over 100,000 people were without a home on any given night. We are now approaching another census and the homelessness and housing crisis has just been growing. We know women and children are disproportionately impacted by the lack of safe and secure housing. Older women have been the fastest growing group of people experiencing homelessness. The COVID-19 pandemic has further deepened this crisis with many thousands of women and children being forced to choose between returning to violent partners or becoming homeless. A recent report by the Everybody's Home Campaign and Equity Economics revealed as many as 7,700 women a year were returning to violent partners and now 9,120 women were being forced into homelessness because of a chronic shortage of affordable housing. What a terrifying choice these women are faced with. And all because government after government has not only refused to build more social housing, but has also continued to defund essential crisis services. Migrants and refugees are vastly overrepresented amongst people who are homeless. At least 15% of people who were homeless on the last census night were those who arrived in Australia in the previous five years and face this disadvantage disproportionately. The Center for Multicultural Youth in Victoria estimated that young people from refugee backgrounds are six to 10 times more likely to be at risk of homelessness than Australian born young people. These are damning statistics. Millions of people are being robbed of housing security and housing affordability. And this is nothing less than intergenerational theft. House prices have gone up over 20% in the past year alone in Sydney with house prices rising a thousand dollars a day at the moment. Canberra and Hobart are in a similar situation of 20% um, house prices rising by 20%. And over 10% in all major cities in Australia has been the rise in house prices. The median house price in Sydney is now over $1.4 million and it's over $1 million in Melbourne. This is not an accident. This is a deliberate policy, policy choice by the government. Tax breaks like negative gearing and capital gains tax discount have landed us in this mess. These generous breaks work for wealthy investors and property speculators, making it easier for someone to buy their fifth investment property than someone to buy their first home to live in. Yet shamefully, we have now seen the Labour Party backtracking on its commitment to reform these tax breaks. Not too long ago, Labour were calling out negative gearing and the CGT discount as tax subsidies that benefit the wealthiest Australians. So what exactly has changed? It's a cowardly and pathetic backflip. House prices and rents are skyrocketing and Labour is throwing fuel on the fire. There is now clear bipartisan consensus on entrenching housing inequality for generations. And this is a betrayal of young people in particular who have been locked out of secure housing due to these very policies that have turned an essential need such as housing into a game of market speculation. People are suffering and bearing the brunt of an unfair system caught in the cycle of disadvantage. And it is not good enough to pass the buck on housing to states and territories. The federal government has a clear responsibility to ensure people rights to shelter and safety are assured. And the Greens will establish a federal housing trust to build 1 million public and social homes across Australia over 20 years. This is the scale of the bill required to obliterate housing waiting lists and reduce homelessness. Public housing shouldn't be just a safety net, but an alternative to private rental or home ownership. We must wind back the tax rules that have turned housing into a speculator's game. The government needs to urgently and significantly increase baseline funding for homelessness services to ensure that no one is turned away. The housing system exists as it does by design. Well, it's time to change that design so homes are not commodities and speculative assets, but a place to live in. Everyone deserves a safe and a secure home. We can and we must do better. Senator McCarthy remotely. 
Just, I'll get you to start again, Senator McCarthy. We've had a good run on this system, but we can't hear you at the moment. I'll ask you to start again. I'm afraid we are not hearing you. Uh, no, I'm afraid Senator McCarthy, the gremlins have hit again. Um, Can you hear me, Senator McCarthy? It's Marine. When it's happened to me last time, I just logged out and logged back in. So maybe try that. If you could... How, how quick is the login and log out process? If you, oh, oh, we nearly got something. My apologies, Senator McCarthy. We had a fraction of sound then. Unless someone wants to give a quick couple of minutes to allow Senator McCarthy to log in and out again, um, I'm afraid. Someone, uh, Senator Dunningham, will, if, if you want to log in and out again, Senator McCarthy, Senator Dunningham has been kind enough to have a few minutes to allow you to do so. Perhaps as well, Mr. Thank, President. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. And while Senator McCarthy is able to uh, look, it is going to be great. One that is completely unprompted and has no notes written for it at all, and in fact, no thought put into it. So it is therefore coming from the heart, and it is just about how fantastic. Uh, I, I, I want to spend tonight uh, uh, paying tribute to the Guthrie government in Tasmania for their handling of the COVID pandemic. Because uh, just today we found out that uh, we have achieved 50 per cent of the population to receive their first dose of the uh, vaccination, which is a great thing because it is something that is being managed uh, in Tasmania quite well by that government, I have to say. And so I want to put on record my. Uh, Congratulations to that government, but more importantly to the people of Tasmania, those who have volunteered uh, to go out and roll up their sleeves and have the jab to protect other Tasmanians. And I wonder if we're going to get oh, some I think noise. We've got some sound. We do. So, just in conclusion, Mr. President, I just want to say how great it is in Tasmania to have Peter Gutman in charge, because if it were anything else, we'd be in dire straits. Although I see she's gone again. Oh no, she's up. That's great. Excellent. Well, look. Uh, what a wonderful Thank you. night it is. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. Thank you, Senator Dunian. That was very kind of you. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. President. Seven refugees remain in detention in a Darwin Airport hotel 522 days after they were taken there under Medivax legislation. Now, that's 18 months in detention since February last year. And prior to that, seven years on Nauru. A total of 2,937 days in Australian detention. It is a national shame, Mr. President. Recently, when I visited the two families in the Darwin detention area, I spoke to them through a fence while they sat some five metres away and yelled their stories in desperation. It's entirely unclear why these families remain in detention in Darwin while other Medivac refugees have been released. They have been granted genuine refugee status by UNHCR and deemed not to be a threat to the community when they were allowed into the country under the Medivac legislation. And the treatment they were brought here to receive, by all accounts, has not been given. And they continue to have to wait, confused, desperate, mentally exhausted and unwell to learn of their fate. I was ashamed, Mr. President, to see that our country would treat people in such a way. And let me tell you a little bit about them. Ulf Sunar, her husband, Mushtaba, and her son, Benham, are from Iran. Benham was 16 when he first came to Australia and was put in immigration detention. He's now 24, having spent a large part of his life on Nauru. This family have been accepted for resettlement in the US but are waiting on final health checks, which they need to fly to Sydney for. They're now facing delays due to COVID lockdowns in Sydney, and they do not know when they will get there. I asked the question though, why does this health check have to be done down there? Why can it not be done here in Darwin? None of this has been explained to them. As I spoke to them, Ufsana held a sign that said, I can't breathe, we aren't safe. 
She told me they are killing us slowly. She said, why not just kill me now? Instead, they want us to suffer. The second family, Mr. President, is Yaakov, his wife Malake and their adult children, Abbas and Hajar, both in their 30s, also from Iran. Abbas recently shared the following story on his Facebook page, which I'll read to you. And this is his words. Listen up, I have a story to tell you. My name is Abbas and I'm 34 years old. I'm just like any man my age on most accounts. I like to spend time with my family and friends, watch movies and go to the gym. I would love to spend a summer in Paris to learn more about philosophy, poetry and politics. I also enjoy Russian literature and South American music and dance. Unfortunately, my life is different to most other 34 year old men because I've had almost nine years stolen from me. As an Arabic man, I had to leave my country. It was forbidden for us to celebrate our culture or even learn our language. If we were caught doing this, we were brutally punished and abused by the government. My sister and I grew up living in fear and shame. When I was 25 years old, my parents, older sister and I came to Australia seeking refuge and safety. We look forward to a beautiful future where we did not have to hide our culture. The Australian government was not what we expected. They did not offer a safety, refuge, or even a slither of compassion. Instead, they sent us to a tiny island in Tanzania. My family spent seven years on Nauru, and we were kept behind fences and treated like animals. Mr. President, the kindness and compassion that is so desperately needed in these circumstances must be shown to these two families. I urge the Senate, I urge the Australian Parliament to look at the seven, seven people here in the Dala Detention Centre and not turn your backs on them. There is considerable community concern in Darwin about how the Morrison government is treating these families and the community are ready to welcome these families. I thank Dasan, the Darwin Asylum Seeker Support and Advocacy Network and all those involved with coordinating daily vigils there have now been 183 days of vigils outside the hotel. I call on the Morrison government to release these families into the community while they await finalisation of resettlement visas to other countries. It's just the right thing to do. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. The Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again tomorrow at the ringing of the bells after the presentation of the closing of the gap statement in the other place.